The devil has been watching me. This has been going on for months now. I've told my parents, teachers, even some people from church, but no one believes me. My best friend Sarah avoids me now, and I just don't know what to do anymore. What started as a fun little game has become something that's constantly haunting me. I can barely sleep because someone, something, has been watching me wherever I go. A few months ago, it was a Friday night, Sarah slept over at my place to do some homework and catch up. We've been friends since middle school, we were like sisters, and we were neighbors too, so you couldn't find us separate. When we went into high school, we had separate classes, but we still found time to hang out. After we finished our schoolwork, we concluded the night with a movie. We usually did some rom-coms, but that night, we decided on a horror movie. Do you think that stuff really works? Sarah blurted out. What are you talking about? Ouija boards. Do you think you can actually talk to something? To be honest, I'm a scaredy cat. I was already afraid of the movie, so her talking about that made me more anxious. Um, yeah, probably. I wouldn't want to try, I said nervously. Come on, Maddie, let's try it out, Sarah said excitedly. No, no way. Look at this movie. I'm not calling bad spirits over. Ugh, you're no fun, she joked. We finished the movie, and she ended up sleeping over. It was at some point in the middle of the night where I felt a hand on my shoulder. It startled me, and right when I was about to scream, a hand went over my mouth. It was Sarah. She started giggling and slowly moved her hand away. What the heck, Sarah? I shouted in a whisper. Relax, she giggled. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. What's going on? What time is it? It's almost 3 a.m. I couldn't fall asleep, so I got on my phone and did some research, she whispered. Oh my god, go to bed. I couldn't believe her. I started to turn over to go back to sleep, but she stopped me. Wait, please. It'll be so fun, I swear, she pleaded. What do you want? Please let me sleep. She pushed her phone towards my face. Its light blinded me for a moment. I winced a bit, but after a moment, my eyes focused on the results of her search. Sarah was looking up Ouija boards and how to make one. I wasn't sure which to feel first, fear or frustration with her waking me up. I insisted that she go back to bed, and while she complained and begged, my resolve to go back to sleep unwavered. The rest of the weekend was uneventful, and when the next Friday came, Sarah was waiting for me at my locker. She insisted that we go hang out at her place that night. It's been a while, so I agreed. We got on the bus, and at our stop, we went straight to her house. When we got inside, her dad was on the phone in the kitchen. He saw us and mouthed hello. Sarah's dad is really kind. He was a banker or something, and her mom is a nurse. After Sarah and I became friends, our parents became close as well, so I considered her parents my family. I ran to her room, and she shut the door behind her. You won't believe what I got my hands on, she said mischievously. My heart sank as she removed a box from her closet. It was a Ouija board. How in the world did you get that? She grinned. I begged my dad to get me one. You guys are monsters, I said in disbelief. Mwahaha, you can't escape, she laughed. My house is right over there. I can just leave. She gave me a tight hug. No, please. It'll be so much fun. Come on, she pleaded. After a moment, I gave in. Let's finish up our schoolwork first. After we finished our homework, Sarah's dad called us over for some pizza. He asked us what we were up to that night, and Sarah told him about using the Ouija board. He laughed as he told us not to get too loud. He grabbed a couple of slices of pizza and retreated into his office close to Sarah's room. Sarah rushed us through our dinner, and she insisted that we stayed up until 1 a.m. to start the ritual. 
We passed the time with YouTube videos. It put me slightly at ease until the appointed time came. I couldn't believe we were actually doing something so stupid. Sarah cleared some space on the floor and opened the board. The board wasn't like a plastic one you'd see at stores nowadays. It looked like an antique. It was wooden with dark brown edges. The inside was a light yellow accent with faded black lettering. Honestly, it was quite beautiful. Sarah pulled out some candles and placed them onto her desk. She turned off her bedroom light and the flickering flames dimly lit the room. She placed a wooden triangle onto the board. Its round glass center reflected the light of the candles. Sarah could hardly contain her excitement as she placed her hands onto the planchette, hurrying me to do the same. I placed my hands onto it. It was oddly cold. Now one of us should ask the questions, she said. You should do it. What? I shouted. Shh, you'll wake up my dad, she asked. Come on, it'll be more fun if you do it. I don't even know what to freaking ask. Just ask it whatever, she laughed. I didn't want to go along with her plans, but she went through all this trouble to set this up. She was so determined to do this, and I felt a bit bad if I denied her fun. So I agreed to questions. We took the planchette underneath our hands and began to move it in circles on the board. The sound of it sliding across the wood echoed throughout the room. We slid the planchette onto the center of the board, and I took a deep breath. Hello? Is there anyone here with us? I asked, my heart starting to race. Nothing happened for a few seconds. Right when I felt a bit at ease, the planchette began to move, sliding towards yes. I looked at Sarah, and she was grinning from ear to ear, her eyes transfixed onto the board. Please stop joking, Sarah, I whispered, but her gaze was stuck onto the planchette. Uh, are you a ghost? I asked warily. Sarah snickered at the question, and the planchette slid over towards no. My heart began to beat so fast. What do you mean, no? What are you? The planchette started to feel like it was burning cold onto my fingertips. Then I felt it move again. It started to move towards D, E, V, I. Before it could finish, I screamed and shuffled backwards away from the board. Sarah was laughing so hard at my terror. What the heck, Sarah? Why would you scare me like that? I shouted. She laughed for a bit and her face got serious. Come on, Maddie, stop joking around. I'm not joking. I wasn't doing that. Her face became deadpan. I wasn't moving it. I thought you were. Sarah's dad knocked on the door. Are you girls okay in there? We looked at each other for a moment and shook ourselves. Yeah, Dad, we just scared ourselves using that board, Sarah laughed. A long sigh could be heard from beyond the door. Well, all right then. Try to go to bed. It's getting late. Yes, sir, we both replied. We turned on the lights and blew out the candles. Sarah was putting up the Ouija board, but she had a look of worry on her face. What's wrong? I asked. Sarah looked at me, and she seemed reluctant in saying it. We didn't say goodbye. I was confused at what she said. What? You're not supposed to remove your hands until you say goodbye to the spirit. They say we open a portal by using the board, and saying goodbye closes it, she said. I've had enough, Sarah. Please, let's just go to sleep now, I pleaded. So we put up everything and turned in for bed. We both shared her bed and tried to go to sleep, but what she said unsettled me. Sarah's bed was in a corner close to her desk and a window, and as she slept towards the wall, I was on the outside. I pulled the blanket over my face and hoped the sound of Sarah's breathing would lull me to sleep, but I couldn't get tonight's event out of my head. There was no way we were talking to something. There was no way it was the devil. 
This was all just a prank that Sarah was pulling on me. I closed my eyes and tried my hardest to go to sleep, but that was when I heard something coming from outside Sarah's window. It was the sound of heavy footsteps walking towards us, leaves and grass crunching underneath them. I was terrified. I was just imagining things. The Ouija board was just putting crazy thoughts in my head. I closed my eyes tightly and then I heard it. Heavy breathing right outside of the window. I didn't know what else to do. The breathing was so deep and haggard, but it was definitely real. I slowly removed the blanket from my face and peered out of the corner of my eyes towards the window. My heart sank as I saw something through the cracks of her blinds. Someone or something was outside of the window looking at us. Looking at me. For a moment, I swear we made eye contact and I heard a low breath shudder. The eyes, I'll never forget those eyes. They were dark and sullen, but the way they curved, it looked like they took delight in seeing me squirm. Underneath those evil eyes, I saw illuminated by faint moonlight, a toothy grin. Its teeth parted open and a tongue came out to lick its cracked lips. A low, hushed laugh broke the silence, followed by a strange noise. Click, click, click. That's when I let out a blood-curdling scream with all my might. Sarah jumped up and shouted, What's going on? she screamed. The devil. The devil is outside your window, I told her. My throat ached from the scream. She looked at me and shouted, Dad! Dad! A moment later, Sarah's dad flung open the door and looked at us. We were absolutely terrified. I explained to him what was going on, and he opened the window blinds and peered out. Give me a minute, he reassured us, and ran out of the bedroom. We heard the sound of the front door open. A few minutes passed and he returned. He was covered in sweat and he was out of breath. He said he ran around the house and looked at the streets and didn't see anything. You said you saw someone outside, he asked. I looked at him for a moment. I didn't want to sound crazy and tell him that I saw the devil outside. I'm not sure. I just saw someone looking in from the window, I told him. Hey, why don't we sleep on the couch tonight, Sarah suggested. We spent the rest of the night on the couch. I tried to sleep, but the memory of those eyes kept me awake. Every time I tried to go back to sleep, I could hear that laugh echo through my skull. The way it licked its lips made my skin crawl. The following morning, Sarah's mom came home and made us breakfast. She worked the night shift as a nurse, but she loved having me over. Sarah's dad brought up what happened last night, and her mom chastised us for playing such a stupid game. After breakfast, I gathered my things to go home, Sarah was worried about me, but maybe her mom was right and it was just in my head. As I left their home and walked towards mine, I thought I heard that low laugh again. When I got home, my parents asked the usual. Did I have fun? How were the parents doing? The normal small talk. I went to my room and crashed onto my bed. It unsettled me a bit because I had my room set up similarly to Sarah's, and I looked towards the window. I jumped and pressed my back to the wall. I saw a set of dark eyes looking through the window at me. I ran towards the window and fully opened the blinds, but no one, nothing, was there. My mom came rushing in to check on me. I was out of breath, sweating, but I assured her that I was just tired. This went on for a couple days, into weeks. Every night I made sure that our windows were shut tight. My dad thought I was being paranoid. I told them what I was seeing, but they brushed it aside as some delusion. I even told Sarah that almost every time I looked out the window, I would see the devil looking at me, smiling at me. She also tried to brush it off like I was trying to scare her. But I was the one that was afraid. I could barely sleep. The devil was out to get me. Every night I would see him and hear that damn noise. Click, click, click. No one believed me. I wasn't sure what to do. 
My mom thought I was trying to set the house on fire when I started burning sage at my home. Why did I agree to do the fucking Ouija board? Last Saturday. Last Saturday is what broke me. My parents asked me to stay home and watch the house while they went out with Sarah's mom because she had an off day. Sarah was feeling sick, so she couldn't come over, but they told me her dad would be home. They assured me if anything happened to call them, but if there's an emergency, call Sarah's dad. When the night came, I was so nervous, it felt like those eyes were everywhere. I was on the couch in the living room. I turned on a rom-com to put my mind at ease. The sound of the comedic dialogue was fading into the background, into a muffle, as I curled into a ball and looked around me. It was around 8 p.m. when I decided to check the windows for the hundredth time. Living room windows locked. I peered out and was met with darkness. The small window in the kitchen locked. My parents' bedroom window locked. My mom's office room window locked. We had a large sliding glass door to the backyard, unlocked. I peered out and saw a dark shape standing there in the darkness. I freaked out. I struggled to lock the sliding door and ran when I heard the lock click. I ran to my bedroom, but I turned to see the shape on the sliding door. Its face was pressed against the glass, and those eyes reveled in my horror. Bile began to raise from my gut as a tongue began to lick the glass. Tears filled my eyes. The devil was so close, but I couldn't make out any features. It was just dark and looming. I ran into my bedroom and slammed the door. I darted towards my desk where my phone was charging. I fumbled it a bit, but when I almost caught it, my phone fell to the floor. Something was banging on my window. So hard, I was surprised the glass didn't shatter. I picked up my phone and called my dad. Hello, my dad answered. Dad? Daddy? Please, come home. Someone's outside and they're trying to get in, I yelled. What? Baby? I can barely hear you. Someone's there? Here, let me call Sarah's dad. The line went dead. My heart was racing and then the banging on the glass stopped. That was the moment my heart sank. I heard a noise. A familiar noise. Bzzz. 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 the sound of a phone vibrating. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Oh, hey, John. What'd you say? The voice was low and whispering. Yeah, no problem. Just give me a minute. I'll call you back. I slowly walked towards the window. I couldn't believe it, but I had to see. In the cracks of the blinds, I saw him, Sarah's dad, standing outside my window. He looked in my direction, but I don't think he could see me. I saw him grin, then lick his lips and started to walk away. A minute later, I heard a banging from the front door. I ran towards it and looked through the peephole. Sarah's dad was beyond the door. His eye was peering through the peephole, too. Madison, open the door, he said in a sing-songy voice. Your dad wants me to check on you. Let me see that pretty face. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want to open the door. Come on, sweetie. Let me take a good look at you, he sneered. He began to beat on the door. He started to shout, Let me see you, sweetie. I ran. I ran back to my phone, and I did the only rational thing. I called the police. 911, what is your emergency? A soothing voice answered. The devil. The devil is outside. The, the devil is my friend's dad. A few minutes later, the police came by. I heard Sarah's dad talking to them. I don't know what's going on. My neighbor just called me to check on their daughter because she is alone and I think she's going crazy. Someone call the ambulance. She's probably on drugs or something, he told the police. When I opened the door, I told the officers what was going on, but they didn't believe me. My parents rushed home, and they couldn't believe what was happening. They thought I snapped. Sarah was sick. She weakly walked out, and she asked me what was going on, but all I could say was that her dad was the devil, and that he's been watching me. 
She looked at me, confused, concerned, weirded out. The police didn't go further into it. My parents were embarrassed at my accusation. Sarah's mom was angry with me, and Sarah, she stopped talking to me. It's been a while since that day, and everyone thinks I'm crazy. Everyone calls me the devil girl and keeps their distance from me. Sarah stopped talking to me, and my parents were so ashamed that they insisted on us moving. We're packing up our things now, and I just wanted to tell someone. Hopefully someone will believe. I looked out the window and saw something taped to the glass. I ran out and saw that it was an envelope on my window. I opened the envelope and saw dark and blurry pictures of me through my window. I looked around frantically and I saw him, the devil, Sarah's dad, staring at me through his own window. He waved at me and I saw a little note behind one of the photos. I'll see you again, sweetie. I used to sleep under my bed as a kid. Around the summer of 1994, my dad and I moved from our cozy home in Tennessee to Louisiana. My mother had passed away earlier the past year. My dad thought it would be good to start fresh somewhere, so he got a new job and put me into a new school. Though I wasn't thrilled about leaving my friends and family behind, it was really for the best. We didn't take the loss very well, but we tried to move on with our lives, for her. My dad tried to support us. I know it must have been hard being a single parent to a 10-year-old daughter, but he really tried. He was hit so hard financially that we had to sell everything. He mourned so deeply he couldn't go to work and eventually lost his job. I tried to be there for my dad, but he never made it seem like things were that bad. He still tried to give me everything while he at the bare minimum. A couple of months later, my dad's cousin had offered him work at a shipyard in Louisiana, and the rest was history. We packed up what little we had and made our way towards a new beginning. We stayed with his cousin for a month or so until my dad finally found a place that he could afford, which I was so thankful for. I loved my dad's family, but his cousin had four boys and it was just so crowded. I was so excited for us to have our own space together, just me and him. I would be lying if I didn't say I was just a bit disappointed. It was nothing like our old home, but beggars can't be choosers. It was in the middle of nowhere, a small two-bedroom, one-bathroom shack with faded white paint on old wood with broken maroon shutters on cracked windows. Our new home was surrounded by dead grass. Our only neighbors were acres away, and the town was almost a 45-minute drive away. My dad guaranteed that this place was a steal, though. I wondered who would have wanted to steal this in the first place. Before entering our new home, my dad insisted on covering my eyes. He giggled as he yelled surprise as our footsteps creaked onto the wooden flooring. It was quite a surprise indeed. Before us was an old floral patterned couch in front of a dusty television set. In the corner, a dirty kitchen and a small hallway leading to two bedrooms and a bathroom. It wasn't perfect, but again, I was mostly excited to be there with my dad. There wasn't much to explore, so I unpacked my things into my new bedroom. My feet sank into the musty beige carpet as I entered the bedroom. It was odd to me that there was still furniture here. In my room, there was a small black dresser vanity, a brown door to an empty closet with a metal chain hanging down from a light fixture, and a tall brown wooded framed bed. After unpacking a bit, I climbed onto the bed. It was white sheets with dark red blankets. My body sunk into the mattress. It was surprisingly comfy as the fatigue from another move washed over me. I rolled around onto the other side of the bed. I was caught off guard by a deep dip that was on the right side of the mattress that was near the window. I jumped off and ran my hands over the bed. It was completely flat. My dad shouted from the kitchen to call me over for dinner, breaking me from my confusion. 
The rest of the night went along normally. We had our dinner, cleaned up, talked a bit, remembered mom, and got ready for bed. I asked my dad where all the furniture came from, and he told me that everything was left by the people before us. He raved at how everything was in such good condition, he couldn't part with any of it. That night, it was so hard for me to sleep. The room was incredibly cold, and I shivered under the blanket. At some point, I eventually fell asleep, but awoke curled into a ball near the end of the bed towards the door. I shuffled backwards from my position until my back touched something solid. I was completely frozen at this point. I didn't know who or what my back was touching in my bed, but I was too afraid to turn around. I could feel them move as they breathed in and out, haggard breaths. At first I had a moment of relief as I thought it was probably my dad, but my dad would never go into bed with me like that unless I had asked him and he was snoring loudly in his own bedroom. I didn't know what else to do but scream for my dad. He came rushing in and I sobbed when I saw him. Someone's in my bed, someone's in my bed, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I jumped onto the floor and looked at the bed, completely empty. My dad looked at me tired and confused. There's no one here, baby girl. Are you okay? You having a bad dream? I looked at him. He was as confused as I was shocked. I didn't know what else to do, but I asked if I could sleep in his room. He was completely taken aback, but it was late, so he reluctantly agreed. Morning came, and we talked about what happened the night before. My dad brushed it off as simple nightmare, but the memory of the cold I felt on my back and the deep, heavy breathing were stuck in my head. The rest of the day came and went as we cleaned and ran errands. Night came, and we were both exhausted after dinner, so my dad suggested we go to bed early for another rough day. My dad went into my bed. He had never done so before, and I know I was ten at the time, but it's still embarrassing to have him check for monsters in my room. He assured me that everything was clear and kissed my forehead, wishing me to have good dreams. I was so tired from everything we did that day that I almost instantly fell asleep. It was probably only a couple hours later when I awoke to the sound of that labored breathing beside me. It was a deep, almost gurgling inhale with a sickening crack as it exhaled. My back was touching what I think was a bare arm, and through my pajamas it felt like my skin was going to freeze off. I felt the bed shift as the unknown body turned towards me. The horrific breathing was a blast of icy air onto the nape of my neck. I wanted to scream for my dad so badly, but I was frozen with fear. I was so afraid that I just felt dizzy and disoriented. I kept telling myself in my mind that it was just a dream, that it was all just a horrible nightmare, until I felt a stiff, cold hand tightly squeeze my right shoulder. It was just so cold I felt my skin burn and I finally let out a blood-curdling scream. I bolted towards the door, my body slammed into the wall, and I darted towards my dad's bedroom. He awoke to find me sobbing at the foot of his bed. He pulled me into a tight hug and assured me that everything was okay. I didn't know what to do, but my dad especially was forced into that horrible circumstance. As an adult, I can't imagine how my dad must have felt. With the death of my mother and my freakouts at night, I don't know how my dad kept it together. These terrors came to me almost every night, and my dad tried so hard to get me help. He got me a counselor with what little money he had, and he stayed up late some nights to make sure I was okay. Thankfully, my bed frame was tall, so I eventually started to sleep underneath my bed. It didn't fix the issue, though. At night, I would still feel the mattress sink above me as I lay underneath the bed. The breathing was getting worse and worse. I had no idea what it was, and I was too afraid to confront it. I was losing so much sleep that when I finally went back to school, I would find any moment I could to be asleep. My dad got into a lot of trouble for me doing that, though. I cried every night to sleep, causing my dad so much heartache. But things eventually got worse as one day my dad told me that he had to start third shifts due to staffing. That meant, for at least a month or so, 
my nights would be spent alone at home. I was depressed. I dreaded the moment until the night finally came. My dad was so worried about leaving me home alone like that, but I showed a brave face for him. He left at 11 p.m., so I stayed up that night until he was gone and ran into his bedroom, locking the door behind me. Maybe if I wasn't in that bed, things would be better. Perhaps my nightmares would fade away like the dreams they were. I went to sleep in the comfort of my father's bed until I woke up a couple of hours later to the sound of banging coming from the door. No, no, please, please. I begged for the nightmare to go away, but the sound of its breathing and the banging answered my cries. I crawled underneath my dad's bed and curled myself into a ball, trying to make myself smaller and smaller. The banging eventually stopped, but the breathing remained. I held my breath as I hoped for the nightmare to just fade away, until I heard the click of the lock on the door. I couldn't believe this was happening. I slowly turned so I could see the door from my hiding spot. I finally saw something. A pair of sickly pale feet were shuffling towards my spot in the darkness. I put my hands over my mouth to prevent a scream from escaping. The feet slowly crept closer towards me. I just prayed that my dad would come back. The breathing was more horrific this time. It sounded so sick as it moved through the bedroom towards my hiding spot. It finally made it towards the end of the bed, and I heard the sound of something breaking. Its limbs cracked as it began to crouch onto its hands and knees. That's when its head began to peek underneath the bed, and I finally saw its face. It was my mom. Rather, it looked like my mom. All the features were there. Her medium-length blonde hair, her blue eyes, a button-like nose. We had shared all of these features, but what I saw in front of me was deformed. She was once tan and flush with color, but that was replaced with a deathly pale complexion. Her hair was ragged and thinning, her teeth blackened, and her eyes were scarlet and jutted out of their sockets. As she started to crawl underneath the bed, every joint was rigid and snapped as she moved. Her neck was bent, broken as I last remembered her. A couple of years before, my mother was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, a terminal disease that scars and thickens the lungs, making it harder and harder to breathe. My mother was bedridden, and while my dad was at work, she couldn't take the pain anymore. I was with her when she passed. I still remember it to this day. She looked at me with sorrowful tears filling her eyes, and she apologized. I'm so sorry, baby. I'm so, so sorry. Everything just hurt so much, my mom cried, but with every breath she struggled to get the words out. I promise I'll always be there for you, okay? Okay, baby? I nodded at her. I was still so young that I didn't know what was going on. I watched my mother as she used all of her strength to lift herself up, climb the chair she had grabbed from the dining room, and stuck her head through the little lasso she had made. She blew me a kiss as her body suddenly dropped. My dad had returned home to the horrific scene a few hours later. I'm sorry, the voice croaked as she began to crawl underneath my dad's bed to get to me. I screamed and pushed myself deeper and deeper into my hiding spot until my back hit the wall. Her hands were stretching towards me, her nails were broken and bloodied, and the joints of her fingers snapped as they moved. She finally made it to me and placed both cracking hands onto my face. The cold from her body was burning my face. She opened her lips to show a disgusting, toothy smile, and she began to choke as white foam poured out of her mouth. I cried. I cried and cried for my daddy to come home and save me. I prayed for what felt like hours until I finally heard my dad rush into the house. I blinked and of course my mother was gone. He came in and shouted my name desperately and I warily revealed myself. He saw the state that I was in. It must have looked the same as that day a couple of years before. He pulled me into a tight hug and tried his best to make it better. After that night there was some sort of shift. It was very inconsistent. 
She wasn't coming to me every night, but she still came. She would come to me randomly and fill my nights with horror, even to this day. Even to this day, I fight the urge to crawl underneath my bed at night looking for rescue. It still frightens me when she appears, but I don't want to call an exorcist or something to get rid of her. I don't know why she does this. Maybe to keep her promise of being there for me, perhaps? No one knows, but maybe, just maybe, I can ask her myself. I've been having issues breathing lately, so I decided to get it checked out. The diagnosis is pulmonary fibrosis, just like her. Just like my mom. I just wanted to pay my bills. I'm sure everyone here can agree with me that 2020 was a completely shit year. Before quarantine, I was barely scraping by as a waitress at a chain restaurant as it was, and now that we're all trying to get back to some kind of normalcy, we're hit with financial bullshit. I tried getting a job back at the restaurant, but they couldn't afford the staff. I'm a 24-year-old female who dropped out of college. I didn't have very many options in the job department. So when I heard I could make a bunch of money on a specific website taking certain pictures and videos of myself, I reluctantly hopped on the bandwagon. I don't exactly have the greatest self-esteem. I'm extremely short, underweight, average looks, no style, and zero sex appeal. But I have two little puppies, an apartment, and tons of credit card debt, so I had to at least try. I'm not going to lie. It kind of stroked my ego when I started getting a bunch of subscribers after I set my profile pic to me in just a bath towel. The money was trickling in, as I had no idea how to work out pricing and all of that stuff. A dollar a picture seemed pretty fair to me, so those were selling quickly. Eventually I became more bold and did short videos for five dollars. I was seeing other girls doing things for ten times as much, but who would want that from me? In a few days, I still managed to make much more than what I would have been as a waitress, and I was able to get my puppers some dog food. A week later, I had over a hundred subscribers, and my phone was blowing up every second with them messaging me. I'm going to be honest, most of these guys really creeped me out, but they seemed pretty harmless. One guy offered $20 for a pic of me winking at him. Easy. Another offered me $30 for a one-minute video of me complimenting his size. Weird, but okay. But another guy wanted me to pretend to be his little sister. Gross. No thanks. I'm incredibly shy, but I really care how other people think of me. Stupid me didn't exactly agree to do any of these weird requests, but I didn't exactly say no either. A few days later, my inbox was barraged with a bunch of guys that are upset about me not doing proper business with them, and they called me things like bitch, slut, stupid whore, etc. And that made me extremely upset. I really wanted to stop doing this, but I had bills piling up that needed to get paid. One morning I logged on, and I got a message from a user named Mr. Underscore Danger. That made me extremely nervous for some reason. It started off simple enough. We exchanged pleasantries, and he asked how the weather was where I was at. The conversation went on throughout the rest of the day. He wasn't blowing up my phone like the others. Rather, it was subtle. I let my guard down. This danger seemed pretty harmless. It was getting late, and I was getting ready to get to bed when he asked me if I had a cash app. I told him that I did, and he asked me for my username. I didn't see the harm in it, so I gave it to him, and an hour later I received a notification on my phone. Mr. Danger had sent me a hundred dollars. I was taken aback, and I quickly messaged him, saying that he had made a mistake, but he assured me that he didn't, and that he enjoyed talking to me today. I didn't know what else to say. I tried to see if he wanted me to do anything for him, but he just brushed it off and said that it was okay. The next day, he messaged me again, and we began talking again. It was never anything perverted or sexual. It was just normal conversation, like catching up with a friend. He asked me simple things, like what's my favorite food, where do I like to eat, 
and what's my go-to snack. He was very sweet to me, and I let my guard down, and that night he had sent me another hundred dollars. This went on for a couple more weeks, and I had no idea what to do. The stranger had given me so much money, and he didn't ask for anything in return. I felt so bad, but every time I said I'd give the money back, and that it was way too much for me, he would just say that I deserved it. The conversations were honestly really fun, and he made me feel so... special. I felt so naive for thinking that, but things were so hard, and this one stranger had helped me so much. I woke up early one morning, and I had messaged him instead. Hey, Mr. Danger. Oh, hello, darling. Up early, I see. To what do I owe the pleasure? I can't take it anymore. Why have you been sending all this money to a complete stranger? Don't you know how this works? Most guys ask for pervy things. Those things don't matter to me. I've enjoyed our conversations, and I just wish to see that you're taken care of, is all. I don't want to owe you anything. This shit gives me so much anxiety. There has to be a way for me to repay you somehow. Hmm, well, why don't we go on a date? You expect me to go on a date with a complete stranger? We've gotten to know each other a bit well, but how else would you get to know me without seeing each other in person? I was dumbfounded. I didn't really know what to say, but for some reason I knew he wasn't joking. I couldn't think of any other reason. Maybe I just lucked out and found a sugar daddy. But I seriously didn't think anything of it. I was so dumb at the time, and I felt like I had owed him for giving me hundreds of dollars, so I just said, Okay. The rest of the day we had made arrangements to meet up. He lived in another state, but he said money was no issue. Mr. Danger had set up plans to meet him for dinner, and that he would have everything situated, including someone to pick me up. I was elated. This man has been nothing but sweet to me, and honestly, the mystery in his identity just kept pulling me in. I just wasn't thinking about the repercussions. I had zero thought that this man would do me any harm. Especially when we finalized our plans, he had sent me $500. He told me to pick out a nice outfit, and like an idiot, I got myself a cute little red dress. I know you're probably asking me why I did what I did, and to be honest, I'm not sure why myself. I guess that's how little self-esteem I had. Or I was just blinded by the money. Blinded by how nice he treated me. By how fun our conversations were. A few days had passed, and he had stayed in touch, reminding me every day how amazing our date would be. The day finally came, and it was Saturday night. The plan was set, and I'd stupidly given him my address so a driver could come pick me up. It was around 7 p.m. when I heard a knock come from my apartment door. I pushed my dogs away to get to the entrance. When I had opened the door, I saw a large man in a suit and tie. He had asked me if I was ready to go. We made our way outside, and I was greeted with a sleek black limousine. The trip was a complete blur. I was too busy imagining what this man looked like and what he must do for a living. About 30 or so minutes later, we stopped in front of this huge house. It was gorgeous, like something out of a movie. I got out of the car, and the driver pointed towards the front door of the house. I made my way up the stone steps. Right before I was able to knock, the door flew open. There in the doorway stood a tall and slender man with an expensive two-piece suit with long, slicked, black-brown hair. He smiled at me with perfectly white teeth, and his skin showed no imperfection. He held his hand out, and I automatically gave him mine. He smirked at me and kissed my hand. You're a lot smaller in person, he spoke with a low and dulcet tone, and winked at me. Uh, you're very, uh, tall. Smooth one, girl. He laughed. Why, thank you. Oh, and you look absolutely stunning. Red suits you, my dear. I laughed nervously. I don't take compliments very well. Well, I hope you're hungry. I've had dinner all set and waiting for you. He guided me into the house and walked me through to a large dining area. May I take your bag? He offered. But I refused. I didn't feel comfortable not having my phone on hand. 
The dining room table was filled with an assortment of different types of foods, and there was platters upon platters. This was definitely overboard. I looked around and noticed that it was definitely just me and him. So why was there so much food? There's no way he actually expected us to eat all of this. Please have a seat, he pulled a chair out from the table, and I sat. Allow me to fix you a plate. So, uh, Mr. Danger, I said nervously. Please, let's go by my real name, Adam, he chuckled. Oh, right. I'm... Before I had a chance to tell him, he cut me off by saying my real name. I'm not sure why my brain finally started to kick in now, but now it was in overdrive. You see, my name is Maria, but my online name was Kendra. He had never asked me my real name, so he should only know me by Kendra. Alarm bells started to go off in my head, but stupid, stupid me allowed herself to be driven here. Adam began to prepare a large plate of food with different cuts of cooked meat onto it and handed it to me with a smile. I reluctantly grabbed the plate from him and looked at him. He continued to just stand there. I asked him if he was going to sit down and join me, but he said he was perfectly fine as he was. So if he wasn't eating, why the hell did he prepare so much food? Do we have anyone joining us tonight? I asked warily. None at all. It's just you and me, he said with a smile. But his tone didn't match his face. It seemed a bit sinister for a moment. This is all prepared for you. Um, you've got to be joking. There's no way I can eat all of this. This is easily enough to feed 20 people, I forced a chuckle. He slammed his hand onto the table so hard and fast that I jumped in my seat. He began to prepare another plate of food, this one with different types of appetizers. He placed the plate in front of me next to the other plate. He smiled at me and pushed my chair forwards towards the table, and he handed me a fork. Have you ever heard of mukbang, he said. Uh, yeah, I've heard of some people doing it online. I absolutely adore it. Something about watching someone eat like that really makes me happy, he said. I didn't like the way he said that. I'm not actually feeling very ha- huh? You will eat, he shouted. He straightened himself and looked at me with that smile. Excuse me, I just want to make sure you're full and happy. I didn't know what else to do. I absolutely screwed myself, so I was stuck with the only option I had to eat. I grabbed my fork and began going at the assorted appetizers such as deviled eggs, little crackers and cheese, and veggies. It tasted really good, but I'm pretty petite and I can't really eat that much. He continues to fix another plate of food for me. I spared no expense to assure that we have the best of best ingredients, he said excitedly. I've cooked everything myself. It's all so good, thank you. I'm just getting really full, I said timidly. He froze there. The look on his face turned from a bright, cheery smile to one of pure anger. The edges of his lips turned to a scowl, and the way he bared his teeth was like a dog going in for an attack. He didn't move his body, but his eyes turned to me, and I could see them strain and turn red. The plate he held in his left hand started to shake in his grip. He grabbed the food from the plate with his bare right hand and began to squeeze it. It was some kind of meat pie, its contents falling onto the polished white tile floor. He threw the plate down, and with his free left hand he pulled my hair. I yelped as he quickly yanked my hair down. Before I could let out a scream, he took the smashed food in his right hand and forced it into my mouth. I coughed and yelled while he continued to force the food into my mouth. After a few more seconds, he relented. Eat! Eat! He huffed. Tears began to roll down my face as I chewed and swallowed the meat pie. My stomach began to turn as I felt a strange texture hit my tongue and teeth. I turned my head and spat the food out, revealing several white crescents. Within the meat pie that he had forced into my mouth were dozens of nail clippings. 
I slowly turned to face him, and what I saw was the face of true madness. His face turned red, and you can see veins bulging on his neck. His eyes were completely bloodshot, and he was gritting his teeth. I pushed myself away from the table and tried to bolt towards the entrance. As I ran with all my might, my body flew forward as my head was yanked back by my hair. He pulled me down onto the floor by my hair and forced me onto my back. I kicked and screamed as he removed his jacket and used it to tie my hands together. "'You will eat what I've prepared, and you will eat it all, you greedy little pig,' he yelled. "'I've paid for you. You fucking owe me.' He stood up and began to drag my body with my tied hands. While we got to the table, he stared at me while he began to roll up the sleeves of his shirt. That's when he revealed his bloodied, bandaged arms. His bared teeth turned into a sinister, toothy smile as he grabbed one of the plates with a stainless steel cover. I really put my all into tonight's dinner, he said, as he removed the cover from the plate to reveal thin strips of cooked meat. It looked almost like bacon, but the smell was so rancid. He took one of the strips of meat and slowly put it towards my mouth. He was so fixated on my eating that I was able to grab the fork from the table and jab it into his stomach. He howled and stepped backwards in shock. I took that moment to run as fast as I could to the front door. I could hear him cry in pain behind me as I was able to escape. The car and driver were gone and I was in some unknown neighborhood. I didn't care. I ran and I ran. I didn't care where my feet took me, but I just ran. I didn't know how long I was running or how far I got away from that house. When I felt the coast was clear, I grabbed my phone and called the police. I looked around to see what kind of neighborhood I was in and if it had any significant landmarks. It was about 15 or so minutes later when the police came. They were shocked to see the state that I was in. A young woman that was bruised, hair messed up, red dress stained with food, and an expensive jacket at my feet. I told them what had happened, and they were as shocked and confused as I was. They made haste and took me back to the station for questioning, as they got some other officers to investigate the area. An hour later, after all the questions they asked, they had some officers return with more questions than answers. The neighborhood I was in was still in development, and most of the houses there were still empty. They ended up finding the house I described, and when they got inside, they found it was completely clean and empty. The police were confused. They believed me for the most part, but they had no answers to give me. I showed them the messages on my online account and all the money transactions on my cash app, but it led to nowhere. Fucking nowhere. A few hours later, I eventually went home. I refused to eat for days. Every time I thought about food, I felt like vomiting, all because of me being a fucking idiot. So take the story with a grain of salt. I know what I did was completely stupid, but really, I needed the money. I just wanted to pay my bills and take care of myself and my dogs. I've decided to quit it all, though, and go back to looking for a job. The money from it was pretty good, but it's just not for me anymore. It's been a couple of months since the events of that night. But ever since then, I couldn't do as much anymore. I needed to find something different. I got a message from another user the other day. The message came in from a user named Adam underscore Eve, and all it said was, It's been a while. Are you hungry? The Curse of the Pink Skull, Captain Delaney's Fate have you heard the tale of Jet Delaney and his fearsome pirate ship, the Black Sun? It is not a tale to tell with a light heart, for it is a tale of love, passion, desire, greed, betrayal, and an aged old death curse, which is still remembered by the ancestors of the unfortunate parties involved hundreds of years after the curse was cast. Indeed, there are even some unlucky souls who, it is said, have witnessed with their own eyes the doomed and deathly black sun, and have been driven to insanity because of it. Not much is known of the early years of Gabriel Jet Delaney. However, we can estimate, for the sake of our tale, 
At the time our adventure begins, in the year 1719, our dubious hero himself was five and thirty years. The rumor that had traveled throughout the land goes like this. He was the illegitimate only son of a handsome but reckless and disinherited French nobleman, and a beautiful, wild, free-spirited French gypsy woman. However, as Jet Delaney had both his father's pugilistic attitude and his mother's quick, hot temper, no one was ever brave or stupid enough to raise the circumstances of his parentage to his face. Now the legend of Captain Jet Delaney and the ferocious crew of the notorious Black Sun was well known by all good citizens of the land, and the sight of the ship's bright crimson flag with its bold black sun and two gold cutlasses crossed over it put the fear of God into anyone. The saga of the ill-fated crew was used as a cautionary tale to keep generations of children from seafaring families on the straight and narrow. If you're not careful, you'll end up like Jet Blackheart Delaney, mothers would say to their wayward sons. His ship sailed the seas until she came upon Abra Bay in the port of Bilbao, where there lived the beautiful and graceful Condessa Rosalina Casa del Mar, along with her husband, the handsome, noble, and very wealthy Conde Sebastian Casa del Mar. Captain Delaney caught the fair Condessa's eye, and she was very much taken with his sense of adventure, dashing charm, and elegance and aura of danger and soon after the pair embarked on a liaison as deep, wild, and torrid as the waters that had carried him to her. Another of Rosalina's passions was that of collecting rare and beautiful jewelry, and her most prized possession, and the oldest passed down from grandmother to granddaughter for generations upon generations, was La Calavera Rosa. The pink skull was an exquisite brooch fashioned from a pure piece of rose quartz native only to that area of Spain at the time. It was carved into a skull, and it was only off her breast when she retired to her bedchamber. On many stolen, not-so-secret moments of illicit love which they had both shared together, Captain Delaney had been drawn to its pure, simple beauty, illuminated further by the beauty of its wearer. And from the first time our jaded hero saw La Calavera Rosa, he had started to make plans to relieve his alluring, exotic lover of her burden. So he did. Like a thief in the night he came, stole kisses, love, along with the priceless pink skull, as well as the lady's impeccable reputation and virtue, and was off on the high seas again before you could even blink, leaving a noble union in tatters and the poor forsaken Condessa heartbroken and enraged, the fire of passion replaced with the desire for revenge. You could be forgiven for thinking that this is the end of the story. Captain Jet Delaney did, and he continued on his wicked way alongside his motley crew as he always had. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Captain Delaney had not known his lover as well as he thought. He could never have known about the ancestry of his pretty and vibrant Condessa, a long line of enchantresses and spellweavers and curse casters. So, on a stormy, wild night, Condessa Casa del Mar stood on the shore of Abra Bay, and raising her eyes towards the heavens, she spoke mysterious, taboo words to the ancients. Let the black sun sail the seas for all time, her crew doomed to an eternity of dark, lonely voyages, unable to sleep, unable to eat or drink, unable to die and the treacherous maggot Captain Jet Delaney will be damned to Hades. From that day forward, the Black Sun was a cursed ship, and the scourge of the healthy, wholesome, and good. The fair Condessa's terrible, vengeful curse resulted in transforming the entire crew of the Black Sun into diseased, flesh-eating ghouls who preyed upon any unfortunate human who happened their way. As for Captain Jet, Blackheart Delaney, he came off the worst from the curse, hardly surprisingly. His strong, fine figure and dashing good looks were corrupted immediately, and the once terror of the Mediterranean seas soon gave his nefarious title a whole new horrifying meaning, becoming a decaying, crumbling, walking cadaver with the stink of the grave upon him 
and pus-filled sores covering his whole poisoned body, spreading death and destruction in his wake. Nowhere that the black sun set down her anchor escaped its dreadful fate, and many ports and towns were wholly obliterated by the cursed ship's unwelcome visits. That is the fate of the Black Sun, her crew, and their infamous Captain Jet Delaney. Witch's Willow This is a fictional tale inspired by, but not about, my own family's beliefs and roots from generations back. Once upon a time, long ago, there lived a young woman in a small village the region of where exactly is long forgotten, but the name was Willow Way. Willow Way was the home of 150 souls and was a very proper, clean, tidy, upstanding little village whose people were wholesome, law-abiding citizens who went to church every Sunday and were always ready to help anyone. The young woman's name was Bessie Martin, and she was what the villagers called a child of nature. They were all very wary and suspicious of her, which surprised and quite upset Bessie, as she did not think there was anything outlandish or odd about her lifestyle or her habits. After all, she merely prepared and brewed natural remedies to treat and cure minor ailments using herbs, flowers, and plants, and baked bread and other baked goods to earn a modest, decent living, as her grandmother did before her. When Bessie was three, her mother died from a lung disease, so Bessie went to live with her grandmother, and as she got older, helped with her grandmother's tiny home bakery business. Bessie grew up to be a good, true, honest girl, who was as beautiful as she was kind, and by the time her grandmother passed away when Bessie was 21, she had quite a lot of admirers. The mayor of Willow Way had a handsome young son who, at the time of this story, was 25. His name was Roderick. He was very tall, strong, and with a group of his friends liked nothing more than to go out and about the area, spending their money, drinking and fighting with the local youths of the community. Nothing ever happened to Roderick or his friends. Money can pay off injuries and damages and buy freedom. Roderick had a long-term understanding he was betrothed to the village squire's lovely daughter May. She was pretty, 18, and educated in the ways of a lady of high status. Now, the story told is that one day, when Bessie Martin was by the stream, she had been spending a much-deserved morning off from baking to enjoy the warm spring sunshine, and after paddling her small, dainty feet in the cool, calming water, she decided to rest up against the big old willow tree. Suddenly, she saw Roderick, or Roderick saw her. Roderick was taken by her assured confidence, her wild yet gentle beauty, and her pure, kind soul, which was one thing that his betrothed May did not possess. For Bessie's part, she was intrigued by him, in his boisterous and wayward behavior, fascinated by his entire presence, and flattered by his attention to her femininity. What happened next does not need to be mentioned, it can be imagined. Needless to say, it began with, Hello, fair maiden. Promises spoken that could not be kept, not even by the most honorable of men, and we know Roderick was not at all honorable. It finished with a heavy, swollen belly and bitter tears of loneliness. Roderick and May were married in the autumn after Roderick's secret liaison with Bessie ended so bitterly and the heated longing he had once felt for his bonny wildflower soon cooled and faded altogether, to be replaced by the constant, adoring love for his fresh young bride. A year passed. Bessie had her child, a fair and delicate infant that she named Lily, in the same little cottage that she grew up in, and for many months Bessie and her baby lived a happy, peaceful, carefree life. Roderick's decaying, blue bloated body was discovered by the stream he first saw and started to woo Bessie Martin. The cause of his too early demise was unclear, but soon uncomfortable and ugly whispers began to ripple through the small, close-knit, highly religious community of Willow Way. 
The whispers suggested that Roderick's death was not a natural one, nor not quite murder either. The whispers, insidious and filled with untamed spite, spoke of taboo and unholy acts committed by godless and wanton creatures. One creature, in particular, was the subject of these unfounded suspicions. These suspicions were not new, merely old ones given more fuel by fresh and undeniable evidence of wrongdoing. The whispers were of Bessie Martin, and the source of the whispers, perhaps quite understandably, May. The first thing Bessie knew of the angry mob was when they used brute force to break down the little wooden door and drag Bessie out of her meager bed by her hair. Another member of the mob plucked the terrified babe, Lily, from the cozy warm cot and followed the leader out of the small dwelling, where he, the mayor of the good upstanding Willow Way, in turn put his lighted torch to the modest cottage. The kindling blazed throughout the deep dark night. The vengeful mob brought Bessie Martin to her beloved willow. They strung her up to the tree by her neck. They watched until the last flicker of life left her twitching, tortured body. When the corpse of Bessie Martin swung limply to and fro, the mayor of Willow Way coldly placed the fragile infant lily into the hollow of the willow, turned away, and commanded the mob to leave. Before she relinquished her precious life, to the pitiful wails of her cherished child. She looked over upon the still tranquil stream where her lost love had made so many breakable promises to her and in turn had paid for his indiscretions in a watery grave. Cold, steely hatred of everything and everyone who had ever forsaken her and her innocent Lily filled up her eyes, replacing the tears of sorrow, and with it came the hex. The hex was as dark as the night around her. It had formed as she had succumbed. Bessie Martin was 23 when she died. Lily Martin was eight months when she died. A month after the fateful night, a youth from a neighboring village came forward to confess that he was present on the day that Roderick died. They had fought, and Roderick lost his footing and fell, banging his head against a rock on the bank of the stream. Roderick had fallen into the water. The youth, fearful that he would be accused of murder, panicked and fled. However, his conscience laid heavy on him, and he soon felt obliged to come forward and tell his tale. Nothing happened. The angry mob had already exacted their gruesome and terrible revenge after acting as judge, jury, and executioner. A few weeks after the unfortunate youth's confession, The mayor of Willow Way was found dead near the willow. The village chirurgeon of the yet unknowingly damned little village found the death was caused by a bullet to the heart, probably a lethal hunting accident, although no other living person was found near the area, and the bullet indeed came from the mayor's own gun. A few months after the mayor's death, May, the newly bereft young widow of Roderick, was found by the housemaid face down in the stream. Talk was that she had been a shadow of her former self since her husband's untimely passing, and unable to fend off the dark, sinister shadow of grief, had chosen to join her groom. Others believed that a more ominous, supernatural hand had guided and overseen the two sad tragedies. They kept their notions to themselves. It is said that the small village of Willow Way and the immediate area around it was soon after abandoned to nature herself, and, left to its own devices, it became dilapidated and an odd sensation of dread and fear soon rose up all around it. The area soon evolved into a place of shadow and darkness, of boogeyman and childhood nightmares. All that is left of Willow Way now is the legend of the Witch's Willow. If you find yourself in the area, maybe you will wander upon Bessie Martin's cottage, or where it once stood. People say that it is still possible to see a circle of burnt, charred ground where she and her baby once lived in their humble little dwelling. Nothing grows there. No bright, colorful wildflowers, no plants or shrubs either, or sounds of beast or bird. The stream, which was once clear as glass, and flowed as free as Bessie Martin's own spirit, 
is now sluggish, still as the grave it was, dark, oily black and slimy with algae. Sometimes a cry of an infant has been heard around the looming ancient twisted willow, where an age ago a young, beautiful, carefree girl sat enjoying the warm spring sun, and where a year and a half later she and her baby girl lost their lives in the name of misdirected anger and prejudice. A person needs to take care to not go too close to the slippery bank and the long, tangled weeds that straggle up from the murky depth of the stagnant stream to lay listlessly against the bank, in case they miraculously entwine themselves around curious, exploring feet and drag them down beneath the surface of the cursed water. Green Hair This is an incident that happened to my family when we were young. We came from a family of healers and sensitives with Irish and Spanish heritage, so we have had paranormal and supernatural experiences all of our lives. This was just one more unexplained, slightly creepy event that I remember. The more interesting part, true or made up, is the old wife's tale behind the event. We were about eight or nine the day Mum took Elle and I over the heath. It was a hot and bright day in the middle of the summer holidays. We had been collecting natural materials to make a collage when we got home, and Mum's rucksack was full of stray feathers, wild grasses, leaves, and twigs, and we were on our way home where Gran was making a cheese flan and salad for dinner. As we were all very hot and slightly tired, Mum had decided that we would wade through the river instead of going back over the hills the way we had come. The thought of pushing my tiny wheelchair through the muddy-bottomed, weed-tangled river never seemed to faze my mom. She was a healthy, fit 26-year-old and knew the heath like the back of her hand. The river wasn't very deep at that part, so Mum tipped my wheelchair back, told Elle to hold onto the handle, and we went in. The water immediately soaked our clothes through, and Elle and I started to scream, giggle, and splash each other in sheer delight. Then we saw them. Weeds? Flowing with the current of the river, swaying back and forth like a woman's long, tangled, unkempt hair, and I got the distinct impression that what we saw could have been either thing. I glanced at Elle and instantly knew that she was having the same uncanny notion. The weeds started to curl around our legs and the wheels of my wheelchair, making our progress a little more laborious, and our previous screams of playful fun changed to moans and squeals of unease and disgust, as we felt the weeds gently tugging at our legs. At no point did Mom ever look anxious or faced by this experience. She just kept saying, It's only water weeds, you two. Come on, don't be silly. You've seen them loads of times. We finally reached the other side of the river, and as Mum dragged my wheelchair backwards up the riverbank, Elle climbed up it and sat down beside me. We both just stared silently at the river and the sea of green for what felt like the longest time, but in actual fact was only ten minutes, before walking the rest of the way home. That night, after a hot bubble bath and cheese flan salad, in our flannel pajamas and slipper socks around the fire drinking hot tea, we told Gran about our adventure. Our Gran took a sip of tea from her mug and told us the story of green hair. She had been a real person, though her real name had been forgotten by Gran, conveniently, Elle and I thought. Anyway, she had lived in the village around 1912, before the area was built up and modernized and developed into what it has become. She was young and kind, with a pretty face and beautiful long blonde hair, a daughter of a gentleman farmer, and was deeply in love with a handsome young soldier. They were to get married, but before they could, the Great War broke out and her young man was called up to fight. He was killed by a hand grenade on the front line, and when she found out that she was widowed before she'd even become a wife, she lost the will to live, and driven by grief-stricken insanity, she went to the same river that we waded through, and she threw herself in. The river was as wild as the land at that time, 
and by the time her body was discovered, it was blue, bloated, and half-eaten by fish. Her long, corn-colored hair had become interwoven with the slimy algae and long strands of evil-smelling river weeds, which clogged and choked the bed of the river. In fact, the pathologist who performed the post-mortem said that the body may have been found sooner if not for the dark green weeds that appeared to have curled around her limbs and torso, anchoring her corpse to the riverbed for days. From that time onwards, it was said that the river was haunted, cursed, or both. Anyway, an extremely bad place. People claimed to see the spirit of the young woman kneeling beside the river and weeping bitterly. More commonly, people often saw the body of the girl floating on top of the water, with long green hair slash weeds streaming out behind her, and so she was given the name of Green Hair. Elle and I asked Gran why we hadn't heard this story before. Gran just smiled and said because it was an age ago, even before she herself was born. The area was developed and built up, and the river was tidied up and reconstructed, and along with it, the tragic tale of green hair was lost in the stream of passing time. We didn't altogether believe Gran's morbid tale, but when Elle and I talked about it in bed that night, neither of us could dismiss the eerie feeling that we saw green hair flowing in the river that day. The Old Water House Over the heath, there was an ancient, crumbling water house where the entire estate's water system was managed. Believe me, we thought it was a miracle how anything that old and manky could keep and pump out any water, but it did. It was made with bricks, with a black slate roof and iron doors, although at the time of this incident it was just a shadow of its former self, and didn't have any doors. The windows were all smashed in by generations of kids throwing rocks and stones at them. It was there when my mama and her siblings were kids and played over the heath, and they all told us that it spooked them and their mates as it did us. It was a really hot day one summer in the school holidays. The older boys were at home for some reason, and all the younger cousins, me included, were being little brats, so the boys said they would take us all blackberry picking to keep us quiet. Mama agreed gratefully. The boys were really responsible and mature at 16, 17, and 18. They babysat us younger kids all the time, so we all knew the rules of staying close to them and doing what they told us to do. A half hour later, everyone had their fruit buckets and we were off. There were five younger kids. We were all really excited as blackberry picking was a great family favorite activity and our grand's blackberry pies were the best. Grant's house led directly onto the back of the heath. There was a fence with a gap at the end. One of the older cousins passed me through to the other and lifted my tiny wheelchair over the fence. The other kids were through in seconds and we were away again. On our way to our destination, the older boys told us spooky stories, as they always did, half because they liked scaring us and half because we all used to beg them to. There was nothing more terrifying than a story from my cousins H or B. They were masters and so believable, and we loved it. We all stopped talking when we came to the water house. Nobody ever dared to speak around or near the water house, not even the older boys. For something so mundane, it always looked, and still does, so eerie. There was a second fence to get through before we reached our beloved blackberry field. This time, as we squeezed through the gap of the fence, we were all more somber as we remembered the old wife's tale, or urban legend, that we all knew about the water house. The story goes, once in the early 1960s, there was a gang of bank robbers. They were local to the area and were really nasty pieces of work. Their expertise was terrorizing bank customers and staff alike before grabbing and shooting anything that moved. They did several jobs without getting caught, but they really messed up a particular job and a sweet 19-year-old trainee bank clerk was shot dead and five more people were seriously injured. One of the gang was also shot dead, 
along with the nastiest member of the gang being seriously wounded in the crossfire. It is said that the remaining gang members escaped with just a few hundred and made their way over to the heath and hid out in the waterhouse. It was newish at that time and was a perfect hideaway for the murderers. There was a lot of contention and stress between the remaining gang members, and although it was never proven how, the bodies of all three of the remaining gang members were discovered rotting away in the waterhouse six months later. A few years after, the weird stuff and creepy noises started occurring near and around the waterhouse. Mysterious, hairy figures were glimpsed moving stealthily among the pipes and wires. A dank, moldy, rotten smell like aging river weeds was always smelt around the area of the waterhouse, and eerie wails and menacing murmurs could be heard day and night. In the late 70s, there was a spate of mysterious deaths of homeless people who would shelter over the heath not far from the waterhouse. There was nothing to ever link the deaths to the waterhouse, but the locals soon started giving the waterhouse and surrounding area a wide berth because of the creepy history and dark reputation, and that left the water house abandoned and in disrepair. That's what we knew of the water house's dark history. That is why we were so wary and anxious to get away from it as quickly as possible. When we were all through the gap in the fence further away from the water house, us younger cousins built up enough courage to glance over at the building of ill repute before being rounded up by the older boys. A put me in my wheelchair again, and we set off to the blackberry field. We soon arrived at the field, where some other local kids we knew were already there, and we spent a nice afternoon picking and eating the juicy, sweet blackberries and splashing in the river. Soon the sun was getting low, and it was time for home. Our journey home was much like the one there. We were still bantering, laughing, and the older boys were still winding us up slightly, but being as it was getting later, we were feeling wearier and slightly subdued. When we reached the fence before the water house, the air felt slightly too close, like before a thunderstorm. The youngest of the three older boys got me out of my wheelchair so that B could lift it over the fence. The other kids were already on the other side of the fence with H and B. A suddenly said to his brother in a low, guarded voice, Something moved at the back of their bruv. B just looked at him sideways. Out of the boys, A was the most likely to pull a stunt or wind anyone up for a laugh. But A was straight-faced. A said, I'm going to have a look, passing me through to B and squeezing past us all. Having put me in my wheelchair, B had moved forward towards his brother. Suddenly, we all heard A shriek out in horror and disgust, and the two boys moved back quickly. H, having already taken me out of my wheelchair again, had told everyone to run, and we did. B, picking up my tiny wheelchair, folded it up while running. A, grabbing the other two kids' hands and following B and H, running with me on his shoulders, holding my other cousin's hand, we ran and ran. A kept saying, Don't look back! Don't look back! I did, but saw nothing. We didn't stop till we got to the fence which leads back to the road on the estate, and we could actually see civilization again. We were all completely exhausted, especially the older boys. Before we slipped through the fence to the road, B holding himself up by the railings asked, What did you see, eh? Ye yellow eyes, a hairy face. All us younger kids began to panic and scream, and H had to calm us all down. He said that we were safe and it would be all right, but we all wanted to get as far away from the water house as possible. When we got home, we all looked bedraggled and slightly nervy. Mama and my auntie noticed this and asked what the boys what was wrong. H just said that we got spooked by an old drunk man in the bushes looking for golf balls to sell. And as that was quite commonplace over the heath, Mama and my auntie just gave us kids a pep talk and hugged us. We never did tell my mama or my auntie the truth about the yellow eyes and the hairy face, or find out what it actually was, but us kids didn't go near the water house for a long time after. The Stuff of Which Dreams Are Made 
by Elizabeth Fenley. The morning after the dream, I went to see Sylvie. She was setting up her shop for the day, the kind that sells aromatherapy, crystals, dream catchers, ritual athames, stuff like that. She was behind the counter, rearranging displays with swoops of her flowing, gauzy purple sleeves, bangles on her wrists reverberating like wind chimes through the glass door. I could hear her humming to herself. Even though the sign said, We are currently closed. The universe will open for you when it is ready. I pressed my face to the glass, cupping my hands around it. Without looking up, Sylvie whisked the door open, then closed and relocked it behind me without moving from behind the counter. Good morning, Noreen, she said, still not looking up from the lower display case she was rearranging. Hi, Sylvie. Sorry to bother you before you open. No bother, Noreen, dear. I expected you. Her voice was dulcet, feather-like, sweeping across my skin. Of course you did. If I was like her, I would have seen that coming. Had another dream. It wasn't a question. She already knew that. Come through, she instructed, leading me through the curtain doorway to her private consultation space. I sat in my regular seat, clutching the drawing I had brought. Silently, she held out her hand for it before sliding gracefully into her chair. I always felt so clunky, so earthbound, so overly solid around her, practical, sensible, like orthopedic shoes. Sylvie studied the sketch briefly. A chimera, new is his name. You know his name? Of course she did. Stupid stuff always came tripping out of my mouth around her. It didn't seem to bother her. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen anything disturb Sylvie's serenity. I lacked the serenity and grace genes, I suppose. My little sister got them instead. I've always resented that. The crudely scribbled figure I had scratched out with the side edge of a dull pencil on the back of a bill had a grotesque grin, stretching its monkey's face out not unlike the Cheshire cat. Huge black, unblinking eyes, furry legs and paws striped like a tiger, some weird wavy pattern on its body, and a long, undulating, deadly-looking snake tail. New frequently appears in dreams. Why, I'm guessing it's not a good thing. He is a harbinger of sickness and misfortune. Pretty much nothing after harbinger is a good thing. Sylvie smiled gently, her silver-blue eyes bright, her skin uncreased by time. Harbingers just are. Judgment of what they bring is open to interpretation. Sickness and misfortune are open to interpretation? If they are not directed at you, what if they are intended for terrorists, or serial killers, or pedophiles? I considered that for a moment. Sure, but why give me the nightmare? Why not send it straight to the, you know, the target, the bad person? Why do I have to see these things? I don't want to see. I cannot tell you that, Noreen. You seem to be open to these messages. And you can't close me, right? She'd told me that before, but I had kept hoping. She shook her head. What did New show you? I closed my eyes and rubbed my hands over them, like I was trying to erase the images of the dream. If only it were that simple. It, he, opened a door to a room I'd never seen before. The only thing in the room was a bed, a huge bed, like filling up the whole wall. Sylvie nodded encouragingly. I swallowed hard and continued. There was a dead body on the bed, not like a skeleton, but rotting and maggots and skin peeled off. Looked like a man. All around him and on him and through him were dozens of snakes. They were weaving in and out between his ribs, in his mouth and out where his eyes should have been. What color were the snakes? Black mostly, some had red parts, maybe some gray or dull silver, but nothing pretty. What else? Around the edges of the snakes, like a picture frame or a fence that they all stayed inside, were white lilies. White lilies with perfect drops of blood on them, 
and I could smell them. I hate lilies. They have that sickly sweet smell that always gives me a headache. But the lilies and the rotting corpse, I could smell them together, all mixed. I threw up. That's how I woke up, leaning over the side of my bed, puking on the floor, on my slippers. I had to throw them away in the garbage can outside, from the smell. I shuddered at the memory and pressed my hand over my mouth, trying to keep myself from being sick again. My vomit smelled like the room. Lilies and death. How is that even possible? Sylvie shrugged slightly. It's possible because it happened, Noreen. It just is because it is. I sighed, breathing back the nausea. So this is the part where you tell me what this means. She laughed, a light, fluttery sound. I knew it couldn't just be that simple. I can do a reading for you, she pulled out the familiar, well-used tarot cards. She placed the cards on the table for me to cut. She flipped over the one on top where I had divided the deck. The Empress, the Five of Cups inverted, the Page of Rods inverted, the Four of Swords, and finally the Queen of Pentacles inverted. She studied them silently, her face neutral. What? It's bad, isn't it? Of course, it has to be bad. Oh, wait. You're going to say it just is, right? Sylvie smiled. They're your cards, Noreen. We have here the power of the Earth Force, its bounty and abundance, with a reunion spoiled by deception, and illness through neglect, perhaps even intentional. Oh God, I'm dying. It's a death dream. I knew it. She placed her soft, cool hand over mine. You were not on the bed. It was a man. The illness was his, the snakes and lilies and blood, all from the bounty of the earth. The reunion could have been yours with him, or you simply witnessing the aftermath of another's. You should not jump right into the personal, the worst outcome. New is not known for his kindness or helpfulness. It is likely he enjoyed showing you these things because they would upset you. Charming. What a nice guy. So what do I do now? What am I supposed to do now that I know? Now that I've seen... that... What did you feel like you were pulled to do after the dream? Throw up, brush my teeth a dozen times, and use half a bottle of mouthwash? Then come to see you. Sylvie raised her hands, palms up, above the table. There you are. You have done what the dream intended you to do. I sat, stunned, staring. So that's it? For now, come and see me again tomorrow morning. At the moment, I have someone at the door who needs me. She rose and disappeared through the curtains. Goodbye, Noreen. I will see you tomorrow, floating behind her as she went. Great. That helped zero percent, I sighed and rubbed my tired, stinging eyes as I left through the back. That night, sure enough, New came back. This time I knew his name, even in the dream. But I couldn't speak, which was too bad, because I really wanted to tell him off and teach him some colorful vocabulary words that freaky, dream, monkey, tiger, snake, harbingers don't know. He seemed to know, staring at me with his creepy, bottomless black eyes. He took me to an abandoned amusement park. Not one that I know, just your typical kind. Except that the banners and decorations were wet, ripped, falling, clown figures knocked over, the red noses rolled away somewhere. Cobwebs caught on my face and in my hair everywhere we walked. Then, inexplicably, in the middle of the park, was a huge, ornate grandfather clock with a fading sun face and a sleepy moon face, eyes closed, under delicate filigreed hands. New grinned and made a chittering sound like nails on an old-fashioned chalkboard as he touched the clock with a tiger-striped paw. The clock began to run, backwards. Then, one at a time, the rides started up, roller coasters traveling backward, the Ferris wheel spinning on its side, the rafts going up the steep waterless flume ride, huge animated clowns opening and closing their mouths above the funhouse of distorting mirrors where a silver disco ball began to spin, projecting hundreds of light-reflected eyes in the dark tunnel. 
The rumbling of the machinery began to vibrate deep within the concrete below my feet. A crack split open near my feet, pulled open into an oval, and helplessly I fell. Landing on the floor beside my bed, right where I had thrown up the night before. Good thing I had cleaned it up. Time, Sylvie told me simply. Time, that's it? No looking at the cards, no peering into the scrying bowl, no seeing? Just time, Noreen. Even the cobwebs are symbols of time. But everything was going backwards, starting with the clock. She nodded. Time is out of joint, O oh cursed spite, that ere I was born to set it right, she quoted. Great, Shakespeare, as inscrutable as new and backwards time. To distract myself, I went to my favorite consignment store, the Red Collection. It had antique furniture, paintings, clothes, toys, knickknacks, you name it. There was a different inventory on a constantly rotating basis. I tried to go every month. Sometimes I bought something, sometimes I just spent an hour wandering around, looking at things, at people, guessing why this person or the other was buying what they held. It was always a good distraction, like wandering through jumbled remnants of hundreds of other people's lives. Until it wasn't. In the corner behind the three-tiered shelves, the kind that you had to get someone to help you with, even though I could never find anyone to help me with anything, I saw it. I mean, I saw me. I saw a painting, a portrait. It looked just like me. I actually thought it was a mirror at first until I realized that it was wearing black Victorian dress with a high buttoned up neck and puffy sleeves, hair pulled back into a severe, unforgiving bun. It had no eyes. Not like someone had cut out the canvas to remove the eyes, just a face missing the eyes. Fused skin over where the eyes should have been. My eyebrows were there, in the exact shape I plucked them into. Then my face just sloped into cheekbone and nose, like that was the normal way a face should look. I actually pressed my fingers to my eyes to reassure myself that they were still there, blinked a lot, and felt really stupid because obviously I had eyes if I could see. After several people bumped into me without apologizing, I tore myself away from myself and hurried to my car. A nice warm shower would make me feel better, and my comfy sweatpants and an oversized t-shirt with an emoji winking and sticking its tongue out, which always made me smile. Dressed, feet in fluffy socks, I looked into the mirror so that I could see myself imitate the emoji and smile, even laugh. But I had no eyes. My reflection in the mirror had no eyes. I raised my hands to touch my eyes, run my fingers over my eyelashes. My reflection mimicked my motion, but its fingers found only skin. I could still feel my eyes. It had to be another nightmare. I looked around for New, but he wasn't there. Maybe I just didn't need him for this one. I must have just crashed on the couch when I got home, from the stress and sleeplessness following the nightmares. That made sense. Just another nightmare. My worst nightmare. But it would end and I would go back to see Sylvie. I sat down on my bed to wait for something to happen. New didn't appear. No other grotesque images appeared. I got up again and again to look in the mirror. Still no eyes. That's such a weird thing to have to think. I waited and waited. I checked the time on my phone my alarm clock, the microwave. Time had stopped. I'm not waking up, or I'm not asleep. This is my worst nightmare. There's Always a Cassandra by Elizabeth Fenley. He always apologizes, the Babadook whose name he told me is Enzos, for bringing me the dreams. I ask why he has to bring the dreams at all, and why bring them to me. He says solemnly, You are now the Cassandra. There must always be one. He stares at me with vacant eye sockets, his skeletal face stretched tight with thin-sheeted, rubbery pale skin. His black top hat, worn, crumpled, dusty though it is, gives him an air of dignity, 
of reserved poise, even grace. When his long, skinless, boned fingers stretch to remove the hat, the nightmare begins. I write them down when I wake up from them, sweating, panicked, in the middle of the night or by the screech of my unforgiving alarm clock. I've heard anyone with especially vivid dreams should keep a dream journal, and then you could look back at your dreams and decipher the symbolism found in them. Only my dreams aren't symbolic. They are foretellings. The people are real. The events are real. My neighbor's mother fell on the icy front steps of the house while I was having a snowball fight with my boyfriend. The ambulance took her away. Patrick couldn't understand why I was so upset. I pulled him inside, shaking off snow and ice. I showed him the entry in the journal from two nights before. It was identical. I remember the image. Watching it happen in real life was like deja vu. If I hadn't written it down, I would have shaken it off as a brain malfunction, short-term memory accidentally rerouted to long-term memory. Patrick read it, skimmed it really, and then looked up at me, shaking his head. It's just a coincidence. You knew there would be snow. You must have heard your neighbor telling your mom about the visit. No, I didn't. She didn't. This says she died in your dream. She didn't die, so it's nothing. Just your subconscious processing shit you haven't gotten around to. Nothing to worry about. Did I tell you about that time I dreamed? He told me about his weirdest dreams and a few nightmares from his childhood, mostly about monsters, snakes in his bed, getting trapped in a closet full of spiders, while we sat by the fire drinking hot chocolate. I listened, dropping little marshmallows in and stirring them around, watching them congeal and melt, sipping the froth off the top and then adding more. The next morning, my dad told me that Mrs. Matress's mother died before they got to the hospital. We all signed a card for the flowers my mother took over with a turkey tetrazzini. I texted Patrick when I heard, but he told me not to be all caught up in the dream. My own boyfriend wouldn't even try to believe me. I didn't tell anyone else. After the fifth dream about someone dying, I asked Enzos why all the dreams were about death. I am Babadook, bone built of grief. Death is my companion. I am her messenger. Do you take death nightmares to other people, or just me? He stood silently for a moment. He was always careful in developing his words. There is only one Cassandra for each time each plane of existence. Plane of existence? What are you? I have visited others for millennia. Now I bring you the sight. There have been many before, as there will be many after. After what? After I die? What happened to the last one? Empty bones somehow conveyed his sadness. The last dream I will bring you will be of your own death, when it is time. He removed his hat, placing it somberly across his chest as he faded, and the next nightmare began. A family of five killed in a car accident on an icy bridge driving home from Thanksgiving dinner. Again, I showed Patrick the dream journal entry from two days before Thanksgiving and the story on the news website to match. He accused me of writing the story down after it happened. You're calling me a liar? I'm telling you these horrible things I dream about, and then I walk around just waiting for them to happen. Can you imagine how that feels? To know someone's going to die, and you're the only one who knows, but there's nothing you can do about it? Why the hell would I make that up? God, dramatic much? You think I'm doing this for attention? For sympathy? Either that or you're killing them yourself, and this is some kind of insanity defense, he replied with a stupid grin on his face, one I almost slapped out of existence. Or maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe that's it. Listen, Alexandra, he reached out to grab my hand, but I flung his hand away. No, I won't listen to you. You don't believe me. My own boyfriend won't even fucking believe me. You know what? Fuck you, then. Patrick spread his hands as if to say, See? Get out. Now. He stood up, dropping my journal on my bed. Major drama queen. Whatever. Just leave. 
That night, Enzos brought me a dream of a school shooting. Sixteen students, four teachers, and the principal killed. Twenty others injured. When I woke up, I spent an hour throwing up. I didn't bother checking to see that it was true. December was full of fires from faulty Christmas lights and one about a candle from a menorah. The week before Christmas, armed robberies of shoppers putting newly purchased gifts in their cars and families killed in their homes for the presents under their trees. On Christmas Eve, a man who had just lost his job killed his entire family and then himself rather than face a joyless, giftless Christmas. Seven kids, his wife, and her elderly mother. After that, I stopped keeping the journal. When an unknown respiratory virus killed a dozen babies in the NICU, I burned it. I asked Enzos to stop apologizing, to just skip right into the dream. He did not speak, simply lowered his hat and his head. My parents took me to doctors and therapists when I stopped sleeping. I thought if I didn't dream, it wouldn't happen. After a few nights, I fell asleep on the couch, even though I'd used up every K-cup of coffee. The doctors found nothing wrong with me. Underweight, exhausted, stressed. They suggested melatonin, yoga, guided sleep meditation, and ironically, journaling. And they all referred me to a therapist. I didn't tell the therapists, of course, about Enzos or the dreams or the journal. I made things up, exaggerated about school stress and breaking up with Patrick. Otherwise, I would end up in some mental hospital on lithium and sleeping pills. I dropped out of college my junior year after I dreamt about a suicide on our campus. I worked as a waitress, took shifts in retail during holiday seasons. My parents were disappointed in my failure to reach my potential and wanted me to go back into therapy, but they couldn't make me. I avoided serious relationships, never spent the night. I had acquaintances at work, but no real friends. I couldn't go through the questions, and I wouldn't chance telling anyone again, not after Patrick. The night before I turned 30, Enzo spoke. This will be the last. I cried through the whole dream. Relief. It was someone else's turn to be Cassandra. Not a Dream Gift by Elizabeth Fenley The dream deities must be pissed off. If I had to guess, Morpheus is delivering his messages in record numbers. His brother, Phoebator, the son of darkness, is bringing more nightmares, and Mara is sitting on the chests of the sleeping to pour nightmares into sleep-cycling brains. They have to be the ones responsible, because the dreams are so palpable so tangible that they exude from people as they go about their normal days. I have the misfortune of reading everyone's dreams. I can't control it, and I certainly don't want it. It's like music from the car next to you at a stoplight, blasting stupid loud with the windows rolled down as if everyone wants to hear their music because they and their music are just so awesome. Personally, I believe there is an inverse proportion between music volume and intelligence, the louder the music, the dumber the person. This ability is doubly unpleasant because once the dream opens up, it brings the current thoughts as well, reading their thoughts about the dreams in addition to interpreting it. I wonder what I did a year ago to piss these dream gods and goddesses off enough to deserve this. It's been a long, alarming year, bombarded by so many dreams. The woman waiting for the crosswalk light to change dreams about her ex-husband, as if they were still married. Sometimes he is as horrible in the dreams as in real life, and sometimes he is just there, a ready-made stock character representing other things. She hates it, feels like she should take a shower in extra hot water and try to scrub out her brain with bleach. The teenager who drags my groceries out of Walmart to my car dreamed about holding a baby last night, and now she's worried that the dream meant she's pregnant. She plans to steal a pregnancy test at the end of her shift. That's a good idea. She is pregnant. I never wanted this. Ability, curse, whatever it is. I wanted desperately to get rid of it. 
but I don't know how or even if it's possible. It's always so loud, so crowded in my head. I spend as much time as possible alone in the remote cottage I bought when this started happening. I told my therapist right away. She, of course, interpreted my interpretation of what I experienced as other people's dreams and asked why I was suddenly having these thoughts. Not helpful. I didn't tell her or anyone else about it again. I'm afraid someone will interpret my claims as hallucinations and delusions of omniscience, even paranoia. I know that would land me in an inpatient hospital with drugs and cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy, who knows what else. I would be trapped with the dreams of the suicidal, the bipolar, the schizophrenic, and the addicts. I can't imagine what those would be like, and I don't want to. For the last year, I've just been trying to cope with it. Just cope. Just survive. But I'm tired, weary of knowing everyone else's problems. Laura, who works in the cubicle beside mine, dreams about being attacked by a dog, even though she loves dogs and grew up with them. It's the same dog every night. A familiar dog, but not her dog. She hasn't made the connection yet. She's afraid her boyfriend is cheating on her again. He is. The man in the break room pouring himself a cup of coffee, whose name I don't know, dreamt last night about being in a plane crash even though he hasn't been on a plane in years and has no upcoming travels planned. It means he's worried about projects, plans or decisions in his life, and the parts he can't control. My boss dreams that each time he opens his mouth, rotten teeth fall out. He has a vague sense that it has something to do with what he says at work, that he's an imposter and what he says is all bullshit. It is. Maybe he will have a dream that will make him stop talking bullshit. The pharmacist at the drive through window smokes a bowl every night before she goes to sleep and then has wild, psychedelic dreams that are just the drugs. They don't mean anything. They're just odd. She never remembers them. Ironically, I never remember my own dreams. I know I must have them because all the sleep science I have read says everyone dreams. I wake up the same way every morning, never feeling any emotional residue of dreams. Maybe it's because I have too many dreams in my head during the day from everyone else. I never stay the night with my girlfriend, at my house or hers. She doesn't understand, interprets it as a fear of intimacy. It isn't. I need to sleep without her dreams in my head. It's only a matter of time before she breaks up with me for my emotional unavailability. She tells me it's hard enough with parents who have been distantly disapproving of her lifestyle, as they put it, but she needs me to be a partner. Her straight friends and her co-workers don't quite rise to the level of bonding she needs. She doesn't spend as much time with her lesbian friends and ex-girlfriends now that we're Facebook status in a relationship. But I know that will change and I only have to remember the patterns of my past to know that. No dream interpretations required. I spend most of my free time reading, escaping into other people's lives, people who don't interpret dreams or read minds or predict the future, people who are completely unlike me. I secretly hope the seam of the book will rip open and pull me into it and never spit me back out. Just let me live in that world without who I am in this one. Nobody would miss me. Rachel would dismiss my physical lack of availability as an illustration of my emotional unavailability, assuming I had just bailed without saying goodbye, ghosting her. I wondered how long she would wait to change her online status. My boss would wait three days, documenting the calls, and then let HR do the paperwork for firing me. No family left to miss me, not even a pet to depend on me. Maybe there's another solution, aside from the big permanent solution, and I haven't found it yet. I will keep looking. Maybe there's a way to appease the dream deities enough to let me escape. When people cross into my dream radar field, I will keep trying not to look, listen, interpret, know. But I know it won't work. the tooth fairy. Jessica was a student in my class, and she was obsessed with the tooth fairy. 
I seen where the tooth fairy keeps them all, she said to Elijah. Elijah grabbed an eraser from the box and frowned. No, you haven't. No kids ever get to see the tooth fairy's castle, because only the tooth fairy gets to go to the castle. What castle? Jessica snapped. The castle. That's what the tooth fairy takes the teeth for, for making the castle. Nuh-uh. It's a big pile. As big as a big giant mountain, argued Jessica. By the end of the day, I dealt with several incidents, including, but not limited to, paint-covered clothes, biting, and the purposeful decapitation of a doll. Therefore, the tooth fairy conversation all but slipped my mind until the next day. The next morning, Jessica was sitting with Megan, and they were chatting animatedly. I was moving around the classroom to each table to check how they were getting on when I heard them. It's not a castle. Why does everybody say that? And the tooth fairy isn't a she. It's a boy, said Jessica. No, she's a girl, argued Megan. Boy. Girl. Boy. Girl. Boy. Wow, that's a beautiful picture, Megan. Do you think that you could tell me about it? I interrupted. This is Daddy, and this is Roger, and this is me, and we are all playing football. Look, that's the football. You all look so happy. I really like those big smiles. Do you think you could write your names underneath? She nodded happily and started scrawling Megan, Daddy, and Roja below the figures. And what about you, Jessica? Can you tell me a bit about your drawing? I drawed Mummy and Daddy and me in a tent, and we're all sleeping so close together. You gotta sleep close together in a tent, else you get too cold, see? You all look very warm and cozy in there, I replied. Jessica's parents were divorced, and there was something kind of heartbreaking about seeing her picture of the three of them together. Yeah, and there's no one else around, see? So Mummy and Daddy just play with me all the time, and we play all day and all night except to sleep and to eat. And where is it that you're camping? She paused for a moment. In the woods, I think. So I should draw some trees. Real big trees, as big as the sky. I smiled and moved to the next table. As soon as I moved, I heard from behind me. Girl. Boy. Girl. A week later, Simon lost a tooth in class. They were at the age where teeth were just starting to fall out, so it was quite an exciting moment. Two girls hugged him tight in comfort. One of the boys asked if they could touch it. Another asked if they could try to put it back in. Jessica wailed loudly, her hands clasping her face as she stared at Simon in horror. Simon was not perturbed by this in the slightest. He grinned proudly, his smile now gappier than before. He placed the wrapped-up tooth in his bag, excited to show his parents. I reassured Jessica and sat them all on the carpet to talk about what happened. Simon lost his tooth today. Simon, can you tell everyone what that felt like? For days and days it's been wobbling and wobbling, and Mam said that it should soon come out. She said I shouldn't play with it, so I only played with it a little bit. Just then, just right now, I was playing at the water table and felt it fall in my mouth, and I thought it might fall down into my belly, but I spitted it out first. Did it hurt? whispered Jessica. No, not even a little bit. Feels nice when I put my tongue in it. Look, he said. Then he opened his mouth awkwardly, his tongue stuck through the gap. Gross, cried out Megan. It's completely normal for children to lose their teeth. What you all have now are called milk teeth, or sometimes they're called baby teeth. Over the next few years, they'll fall out, but that doesn't mean anything is wrong. You'll start to get new teeth, and they will be your adult teeth, which you will keep forever. When they fall out, the tooth fairy takes them, and he only likes real white teeth, said Jessica. I smiled. As a teacher, it wasn't my place to confirm nor deny the existence of Santa, unicorns, fairies, or festive bunnies to my students. Well, it's very important to keep our teeth clean. We should brush our teeth twice a... I don't want to clean my teeth. I don't want the tooth fairy to have them, Jessica squealed. Then she burst into tears. Admittedly, I couldn't blame her. 
The tooth fairy thing had always struck me as odd. You tell your kid that when they're sleeping, a stranger comes into their room and starts rummaging around under their pillow, but it's all good because they give you some money. Yet very few parents seem to consider that it might be a bit frightening. I managed to calm things down, and we carried on with the day. At the end of the day, at pickup time, I explained to Jessica's mum what had happened, and she assured me that she would deal with it. I got a secret to tell you, Jessica said the next day. I got a secret, but you can't tell no one else, okay? Well, I can't promise to keep secrets, Jessica. Sometimes there are big secrets. They might involve you or someone else being hurt in some way. Then I have to tell those kinds of secrets. Well, the secret is that Daddy is the Tooth Fairy, she whispered. Now that you know that, does it make you feel less frightened? You seemed very worried yesterday, I said. She looked confused. I already know Daddy was the Tooth Fairy. I just didn't want to tell the other kids. But I still don't want Daddy to take my teeth. Maybe you could talk to Mummy and Daddy about it, and you could tell them what you would like to do with your teeth when they fall out. But I don't want Daddy to take my teeth. When he takes people's teeth, it really hurts, and they scream and cry and cry, she sobbed. The bell rang then for lunch, and I replayed the conversation over and over in my head, confused, as I grabbed my lunch and sat next to my colleague Sarah in the staff room. Jessica? I taught her brother last year. Their dad's a dentist, Sarah said. Oh, I said. That makes sense. Haven't met the dad yet. I only met him once all year. Usually Mum does the school stuff. He's quiet, but hot. I laughed. You're so bad. He is, and the Mum's not much of a looker. I wonder if that's why he left her. Sarah! What? It's true. Anyway, what are you going to do about Jessica? I'll talk to her this afternoon, and then maybe talk to her Mum again. Poor kid. She's under the impression that her dad is a tooth fairy who randomly yanks out people's teeth. Well, nobody likes the dentist, Sarah grinned. That afternoon, I sat with Jessica in the reading corner. Hi, Jessica. I'd like to speak with you about what happened earlier. It sounded like you were really frightened about losing your teeth. I wonder if maybe we could talk about it more? Okay, she said. Do you know much about your dad's job? He's a dentist, she said, and he's a tooth fairy. Do you know what dentists do? They take people's teeth, and it really hurts so much, but they take them anyways. Dentists care for people's teeth. They check they're healthy. Sometimes people might have problems with their teeth, so the dentists fix them. Sometimes, when a tooth is really bad, it can't be saved. Then a dentist might need to take it out. But usually, the bad tooth was very painful, and after it gets taken out, it starts to feel much better. We can look after our teeth to keep them healthy. But if you ever did need to have a tooth taken out, the dentist gives you some special medicine so that it doesn't hurt. Well, Daddy can't be that kind of dentist. He's a different kind. He takes good teeth. And it really hurts. I heard it. The lady screamed, and she even screamed louder than when I broke my arm on the swing, and that time I screamed so loud that Mommy said they probably heard me all the way to Africa. Can you tell me a bit more about what you mean? When did you hear that? Were you at your dad's work? No, he, he was downstairs in the room where it's not safe to go in. I'm not supposed to go there. But that time, I just standed on the stairs just for a little minute. But I didn't go inside, I promise. And that's when I heard it, and it was a lady's voice, and she screamed. Did you see anything that happened, Jessica? No, but I know he was taking her teeth, because he takes so many teeth. And no matter what anyone says, he isn't building a castle. He keeps them all in a jar in a big, big, big pile. And they're all really white. He's the tooth fairy, so he only likes clean teeth. What? But don't tell him I seen it. 
because I'm not supposed to go in his room, but I thought maybe he had my birthday present in there, and I just wanted to see what it was. I wanted to have a little look so I could know how excited I could be. That's when I seen the teeth. I put them back so he won't ever, ever know. Jessica did, and then yesterday in the car, Mummy said that people tell their kids there's a tooth fairy, but really it's just the mummies and daddies who gives the kids the money. And I already know that Daddy is the Tooth Fairy, but I couldn't tell her, else she would have known I'd done something bad. I don't want Daddy to be the Tooth Fairy and take my teeth. As she spoke, I felt the blood drain from me, all at once. As words tumbled out of the poor, confused girl, who was unable to stop when she started, my confusion turned to fear, which turned to complete and utter terror. When she finished, she looked up at me expectantly, her eyes searching mine desperately. Ignoring the pounding of my heart, I told her that she had done the right thing in telling me. I told her she wasn't going to get into trouble, and she hadn't done anything wrong. I told her that it was all going to be okay. 128 adult teeth were found at Jessica's house. They belonged to four women who had been reported missing over the last five years. The women were different ages, different races, different backgrounds. The only thing they had in common were their pearly white teeth. Jessica's father had kept the teeth of the women he had murdered as trophies. Even now, years later, I think of Jessica whenever one of my students thrusts one of their teeth excitedly in my face in class. And after Jessica, when I have children of my own, there will be no fairies, of the tooth variety or otherwise, in my house. Hamburger Lady Beyond the light of our cameras, we couldn't see much of anything but the shadowy ruins of Robertson Elementary School. The moon was thick and heavy, shining brightly on the ground and through the overground remnants of the playground equipment. Christina was much braver than I. She wanted to lead the way, and I didn't hesitate to let her. The way the pitch darkness of the building just seemed to be waiting on us to walk into it was unnerving to me. But to Christina, the desire to explore was freshly lit in her soft blue eyes. She was even more beautiful when she was brave. The whole town knew the story about Robertson Elementary School. It caught fire in 1976 burned upwards from the basement-level cafeteria, and eventually claimed the whole building. Luckily, the students were on recess when the inferno started, but one unfortunate cafeteria lady was unable to flee the destruction. She died in the back corner of the cooking space. Pictures of Maria Aria showed that she was beautiful. The fire was so hot, though, that she was completely unrecognizable when the responders discovered her. It was a tragic accident that still haunted the memories of our small town. Christina wanted to become viral. She heard the ghost story about Maria Aria, the hamburger lady, and thought she could become infamous for leading a live-streamed ghost hunt. She wanted me to be the cameraman, and I couldn't refuse turning my crush's whims away. Everything was going well until we got down to the cafeteria. The walls were still black, even after almost fifty years, and there was a stench of mold and abandonment that hung heavy in the air. Mice scattered everywhere when we got down there, and I don't know exactly how to describe it, but there was just this feeling that we were not supposed to be there. Christina admitted that she felt it too, but to her it was more of an invitation to keep pressing forward than to retreat. We made our way around the cafeteria, climbing over tables and broken chairs. When we reached the cooking space at the back of the room, we just paused and filmed. The air got cold. The silence was deafening. I couldn't stop my hand from shaking, and that's why the footage is so wobbly. Christina called out to the darkness, Maria, Maria Aria, are you with us? The camera flickered at that instant, and we heard this shuffling behind the remains of the serving counter. 
the figure of a dark-haired woman formed out of nowhere. Her skin was melted and charred. Her eyes were vacant, clothes hanging loosely in blackened strands. She let out this piercing wail, and we just ran. In the pitch darkness, Christina and I must have gotten separated. I got to the stairway leading up to the ground-level landing and waited for Christina to get me. She never did, and all I heard was this unnerving shuffling of feet in the blackness of the cafeteria. That's all I know about Christina's disappearance. I wish I could tell you more, but I can't. I don't know anything more. But in every dream that I have dreamt since that night, whether a nightmare or not, Christina is always in the background somewhere. She's screaming for help, arms reaching out wildly towards me. But that hideous figure, the hamburger lady, always appears behind her and steals her back into the darkness. The Dark Room I lie awake, the dream of sleep evading my grasp. Today, we laid to rest my father in the cold, damp earth. Our relationship was not one you'd call ideal, but being his only child, I was left everything. That included his photography studio and darkroom. My father and mother had split when I was born, him having no time to raise a child as he made his name in the art community. A birthday card every couple of years, always with the wrong age written in them, and that was all I saw of him. I didn't mind much, having my mother there was enough. But then he died, and I received everything. I wondered why he would leave his life's work to me, a daughter he never bothered to know. I'm sure he had friends, or fellow photographers, who would have greatly appreciated their own studio and fully operational darkroom. Maybe he really didn't have anyone and no one else to leave it to. I myself was a photographer, but more of a casual one. I took photos of my pets, friends, and family, the occasional scenery, nothing that was taken for others' admiration. It was for me to relive moments that made life worth living. The next day, I drove to the address listed on the scrap of paper my father's lawyer gave me. It was on the outskirts of town and seemed to be the only building out there. The building itself was that of a large warehouse. The metal paneling on its walls was rusted in spots and completely missing in others. Its few windows were smashed and boarded up with wooden planks from the inside. There was a large garage door that shuddered in the breeze. To the right of that door was a smaller door which also had a broken window. The place looked like a hollow monolith and I almost doubted that it was my father's studio. How could such a highly esteemed artist work out of such a dump? It was dull, falling apart, and devoid of any signs of life. The one thing that told me this disgusting place was indeed my father's was the painted camera lens on the garage door with my father's name written underneath. I gripped the little metal key in my hand and entered the decaying giant. The inside was more appealing than the out, but not by much. There was a long metal table in the center of the room, littered with cameras, photos, and lenses. For an artist who cared more about his work than his family, he really didn't take very good care of his equipment. A layer of dust coated everything, and most likely ruined everything on the table. Back behind the table, though, was the dark room. It was a large, handcrafted black box that had been erected in the back center part of the warehouse. A door that revolved was the only entrance, and made it so that no light could penetrate into its dark interior. I slowly walked along the table, trailing my fingers along the dust. The photos were all black and white, most likely developed in the dark room behind me. They were photos of buildings, animals, flowers, the normal things photographers photograph. I picked up an old Canon film camera and poured a pile of dust out from where the film reel would be installed. Disgusted, 
I tossed it back onto the table and turned to the looming black box. Everything on the table was now useless, and I was disappointed to see such a beautiful antique and I was disappointed to see such beautiful antique equipment left to deteriorate. The revolving door wouldn't budge at first, and I struggled to get it to turn. The metal railing along the bottom must have rusted. How long has it been since my father was last here? It was like this place hadn't seen a living soul in decades. With one hard shove, the door finally relented and spun to let me step in. The smell of mildew and old chemicals hit me like a brick wall. I covered my mouth with my hand to stifle a gag as I stepped into the door. I should have brought a ventilator or at least a mask. As I swung the revolving door around me, I was plunged into utter darkness. The smell was overpowering, and I tried to take as few breaths as possible. I could see the glow of the red light start to appear when the door jammed. I pushed, and the metal groaned in protest. I was trapped inside the door and could barely see anything around me. I held my breath and used the hand previously covering my mouth to try to pull the door open. A small ball of panic started to settle in my chest as I fought harder to release myself from my cylindrical prison. Just as I was about to gasp in that putrid air, the door gave and swung open. The red light of the bulbs barely illuminated the room, and I had to wait as my eyes adjusted to the dark. I held the collar of my shirt over my nose and mouth and coughed violently. The smell was now overpowering, and my head was beginning to spin. Just a quick look, just to see if anything was salvageable, then I could leave. Stepping into the room, I could see strings running across the room with photos pinned to them to dry. Empty containers of chemicals littered the floor, and the faucet in the sink was dripping. I knew how dark rooms and developing film worked, but had never actually stepped foot into one. I couldn't help it as a bit of excitement fluttered in my chest. I had always wanted to develop my own film and expose my own photos. I ran my hand over the edge of the metal sink and dreamed of making my very own dark room. My eyes drifted to the photos hanging from the string, and I squinted to try to see what they were of. My hand fell from my face as I stumbled back in alarm. That couldn't be what I thought it was, could it? In the first still photograph was a woman. She wasn't posed or smiling. Her lips were locked in an eternal scream, and I could see the glint of a knife embedded in her chest. The next photo was similar, but was a different woman, and the knife now protruded from her left eye. Photo after photo portrayed a gruesome scene. All held a young woman, trapped forever in their final moments of fear and despair. Their faces wore masks of horror, shock, and death. I could feel bile rising up my throat, and I backed away from the awful nightmare before me. I know now why my father left me his dark room. I know now why he left my mother and me. I now know the dark secrets behind my father's legacy, hidden away inside his dark room. The Last Man on Earth The Mustang roared to life. The body of the beast shook as he stepped on the accelerator, his manic laugh piercing the day. His laughter ceased as he sat for a moment, listening to the noise produced by the car. Having his fill of the exhaust system, Dan threw the gear knob up and to the left, first gear, and sped out of the dealership. The car was a display model, the red paint gleaming in the bright lights of the showroom. He crashed through the glass of the shop and onto the street, laughing like a naughty child who had gotten away with a misdeed. The scream of the car, the only noise in the desolate street. There wasn't many cars on the road, and Dan pushed the machine as hard as it could go, the speedometer needle climbing until it sat constant at the top speed it could get to. The drab buildings whizzed by as Dan clutched to the steering wheel, the brilliant sun smiling down on the bright red Mustang galloping down the empty streets. 
Slowing the car down, Dan switched the radio on. Static greeted him. Glancing around the streets, HVC was a welcome sight. Slowing his newly acquired vehicle to a complete stop, he opened the door and set towards the music store. The door was locked, naturally, and Dan made use of a trash can sitting on the sidewalk. He winced as it went through the window, nervously looking around. He laughed softly to himself. No one was around to see him. The lights in the store were non-functional, but thankfully the sun bearing down was bright enough to illuminate his shopping trip. He walked through the aisles, looking for something worth listening to. Eventually, Dan stumbled upon a CD of the top songs of the decade. Nothing special, but it would do. Picking up his selection, he climbed back out towards his car, using the makeshift entry he made. Sitting in the driver's seat with the door open, Dan opened the CD case and inserted the CD. Music blared out the speakers, the voice of Justin Timberlake serenading the lonely man. He sat, staring at the hole he created in the store window. He looked up and down the street, hoping someone would bound up to him to seek justice for the theft that had occurred. He was foolish to hope, but the hope remained. He'd go home now and do what he did every day, read comic books and drink himself unconscious. Leaving the music playing with the door open, Dan walked past the music shop and towards the bottle store he frequented. The door had been left open, and so he had not needed to improvise an entrance. He had a hankering for whiskey today, he decided. Walking over to the cabinet containing the good stuff, he accessed the expensive whiskey by kicking through the glass door. Open bottle in hand and already visibly depleted, Dan walked back slowly to his car to head home. He had changed homes a number of times this past year. Just as with the cars, appliances, and everything else, Dan had his pick of it all. He was, after all, the last man on earth. Everyone else had simply vanished. He remembered the day it started all too well. Leaving work early with a stomach bug, he took a nap once home and suitably drugged up on medicine. Waking up from the nap, everyone was just gone. No bodies, no mess, nothing. Just him, Dan, the 32-year-old marketing manager of a high-end retail company. Perplexed at first, it didn't take him long to unwind and make the best of the situation. No people meant no rules and no boundaries. Everything was his and that suited him just fine. He had no family apart from his mom and grandparents. These were the first places he went once he realized something had gone terribly wrong. At both houses, there was not a sign of any of them. Just as everyone else had, they had disappeared. Dan spent the first few nights in his childhood home, trying to make sense of all that had happened. Eventually, he gave up trying to understand it all and went back to his flat. Netflix still worked, and his PlayStation was operating fine. The days passed, and boredom set in. Call of Duty was not as fun with no one to challenge online. Dan ventured out of his house to explore and seek any other possible survivors of whatever had happened. Driving his 2002 Toyota Vitz, the realization set in that he could borrow any car he liked. He figured if he returned it before the people came back, no one would ever know. His first acquisition was a BMW M3 Coupe, a car he had dreamed of since he was a child. Hunting for the keys was difficult in the dealership, but once he found them, it was all worthwhile. Dan ventured to many a city, both near and far, in the hopes of finding someone. All his voyages were in vain, as each day he returned home dejected and with a sense of loneliness. Eventually, he stopped trying to find people, and decided to enjoy his life while he was still breathing. Cars were his main devices for enjoyment, but the bottle stores and houses he raided to find narcotics were equally as entertaining. Many a day was spent in a zombie-like state, with no one to reprimand him for operating high-performance vehicles under the influence. His mind was his own worst enemy. 
plagued by loneliness and fear of what had happened to the world. Many a night were sleepless. What was he going to do once the electricity switched off and the water was no longer running? Having no knowledge of the ways in which either worked, Dan was frightened of living in a powerless and waterless world. Food would inevitably run out, and he had no expertise in growing crops. These were the thoughts that haunted him, and when such hauntings occurred, sleep in a bottle was to his aid. Arriving home in his new Mustang, he parked it alongside the numerous cars he now owned. It had been many months, nearly a year, and his car collection had grown vast. He walked up the unkempt driveway and walked into the open house. He didn't bother locking anything, as no one was around to steal. Flipping through a Flash comic book, he drank the whiskey from the bottle. It burnt his lips and throat, but the pain kept him sane. That and the exhilaration from driving at breakneck speeds were the only sensations that reminded Dan he was still alive. Putting the comic down, he walked the halls of his new mansion. The antique paintings he stole from museums and art galleries hung side by side on the walls. In that other life, he would never have owned such a grand home. Now, however, the world really was his oyster. He was the king of everything, and all in the land belonged to him. Setting himself down after lighting a fire in the library fireplace, he returned to his bottle of fire. Sighing, he could but lament the passing of the world as he knew it. This was the world now. A world that, for some reason, he was condemned to walk alone. He missed his mother and his grandparents. Hell, he even missed his mean SOB of a boss. This was no life to live. He took another deep sip of whiskey and sat, staring into the roaring fire. Just as brightly as the fire burnt, so too could it be immediately snuffed out. The fragility of it was incredibly similar to people. We were a strong people, and yet somehow, the rest of the world now has disappeared. Standing up, Dan looked at his options he had been putting together over the weeks. The prescription bottle lay neatly next to the revolver he found in the upstairs bedroom. Deciding on the seemingly less painful approach, Dan emptied the contents of the pill bottle into his hand. Sitting down in the chair by the fire again, he gazed into the fire one last time, washing the pills down with the last of the whiskey. Dan closed his eyes as he prepared to take one last nap. The embers burnt gently in the fireplace. The fire had died down. Dan felt warmth on his chest. Struggling to sit up, he opened his eyes slowly. Had the tablets not worked? Why was he able to open his eyes? Maybe I'm in purgatory, Dan thought to himself. With a haze over his eyes, he looked down to establish what warmed his chest. Spread across his chest and running down to a puddle on his lap was vomit. A few tablets were visible in the sick, but majority seemed to have been absorbed. Shaking his head and trying to make sense of the sick, cosmic joke of surviving two deadly naps, Dan slowly looked around the dimly lit room. The haze began to fade, and the intense sensation of pain set in. The pain went from a sensation to be the only feeling Dan felt. He felt as though his lower body was on fire. Panic set in, and Dan looked around the room trying to make sense of the pain. A dark figure was hunched over the floor near the fireplace. Upon hearing his screams of agony, the figure stood. Cast in the glow of the embers, Dan could see what looked like a leg. Another leg was protruding from the embers. The figure bundled over to him, and Dan could immediately smell the coppery smell of blood. Hello there, the figure said. I got here just in time. Had I let you pass, your meat would have quickly expired. Now you have a good few days left. Dan began to sob. His strength left him, and he simply lay there, 
covered in his own vomit. The man spoke again. You would not believe how long it's been since I've had a good meal. I thought after the disappearances, I would go without it for the remainder of my life. What a treat. Dan was no longer going to be the last man on Earth. We only go out at night. The house was dark, like it always was, and lit by a few candles. From room to room, the shadows danced and played, casting dark images against the walls and corners. Victoria lounged on a love seat, clicking her long nails on her knee as she waited. The house was always boring at this time, and she would give anything to go out. She sighed, gazing over at the covered windows and dreamed of the world outside. The shadows tugged at her dress, and she shooed them away with a flick of her wrist. They chittered and retreated back to their homes on the walls. Victoria sighed again and twirled her fingers around the flame of a nearby candle. The heat danced between her fingers, and the smoke billowed in the palm of her hand. The others were so old school. The least they could do was get a TV so there was at least something to do while they waited. Victoria wasn't much of a sleeper, wasn't before, and wasn't now. So while the others slept, she sat and waited. It was mind-numbingly boring, and she hated every second of it. She lived for when they could leave, and she dreamed of escaping this place, running far away and building her own home, and maybe making her own family, without all the stupid rules. "'What are you still doing up, child? Why are you not sleeping like the others?' Madame Natalia said as she entered the room. She held a lit candelabra in one hand, her dress skirts in the other. Out of them all, Madame Natalia was the oldest. She wore a thick, velvet Victorian dress that wrapped around her body tightly. It had a high neckline and seemed to be strangling the poor woman, but she never seemed distressed or uncomfortable. Natalia set the candelabra down on the table and sat on the love seat across from Victoria. "'I can't sleep. Is it time to go soon?' Victoria asked eagerly, but not too eagerly. She didn't want to show weakness in front of the madam. Natalia looked across the room to the old grandfather clock, whose metal arms read 824. "'Yes, it is nearly time. But, child, you must start resting.' You'll grow weak and fragile if you don't. To emphasize this, Natalia ran her long fingernails over her dress, smoothing out the wrinkles. Her nails were almost as long as her fingers and very sharp. They glinted in the candlelight, and Victoria winced. She remembered when she first saw those nails, and exactly how sharp they really are. Absent-mindedly, she ran her fingers over her left side, "'envisioning the scars underneath her dress. "'I have trouble sleeping. I always have,' Victoria said, "'taking her eyes away from those dreadful nails. "'Natalia smiled kindly, but her eyes were dark. "'After all this time, and you still have trouble? "'Darling, what am I going to do with you?' she cooed. "'Victoria winced again and looked down. "'Maybe if I let you out early,' You can let out some of that energy, hmm? Natalia stood and started to head out of the room. Victoria jumped to her feet quickly and followed after, but not too close. Really? You mean it? I can go out? She said, wringing her hands in anticipation. Natalia nodded and placed her hand on the knob of the front door. She looked back at Victoria and smiled that sweet smile again. Just remember to be back before the sun rises. Happy hunting. With that, Natalia flew open the door. A cool autumn breeze greeted Victoria playfully, and the full moon cast a sickening glow. Victoria smiled widely, revealing a mouth full of sharp, jagged teeth. She took off quickly, not giving the older woman a chance to change her mind. As she ran, she unfurled her wings and started to lift into the air. The wind rushed past her and no clouds dotted the sky. The moon hung wide and bright, 
guiding her way through the night. She giggled as she went faster, the hunger starting to grow in her stomach. It was Halloween, the perfect night for a feast. And Victoria, well, she had quite the appetite. The Girl in the Goethe House I pass under the words, Goethe Family Estate, and grapple with a queer feeling of unease. The archway is flanked by faceless statues, their features worn smooth by wind and rain. The path to my right leads down the hill, past rows of uniform headstones, to the old convent. Ahead of me stands the Goethe Manor House. The convent was closed decades ago, and the Goethe House has been abandoned for over a century. The only building on the estate that is still occupied is half a mile away, the former Catholic girls' school, now converted to a nursing home for ailing and aging nuns. The breeze lifts the hair from the back of my neck. I hug my jacket tighter around me and walk straight. I cannot place the source of my discomfort. Graveyards hold no dread for me, and I have spent much time inside crumbling buildings. Perhaps it is the trees that grow alongside the path, brought from faraway places and replanted at the Goethe family's command. Perhaps I can sense they do not belong. The Goethe house looms larger as I approach. It is made of a yellow stucco that looks out of place in the gray light of the Pennsylvania autumn sun. It looks tired, with peeling paint and sinking edges. But strangely, all the windows are intact. I lean down to inspect a monarch drinking from a thistle that pushed its way up through a crack in the stone walkway. It is late in the season to see one, and the unexpected beauty makes me smile. I hear my grandmother's voice. Butterflies are pretty, but moths are special. They carry souls to the moon. But what happens when a moth gets trapped inside, I had asked her. Then the soul is trapped too. Why do you think so many houses are haunted? The insect flutters upwards and drifts past a second-story window. A pale face peers from it, watching me from a room I know is empty. I raise my hand to the girl in greeting, when bony fingers wrap around my wrist and whip me around. An ancient nun drags my face closer to hers. A few solitary teeth jut from her gums like crumbling gravestones in a forgotten cemetery, and her breath is sharp and sour. It consumed the sisters who walked without feet, she spits, her eyes boring into mine as if she could burrow her thoughts into my head by the force of her stare, her roomy eyes filled with tears. Don't let me die here, she weeps, as two women appear by her side to pry her clenched fingers from my arm. Not here. Not here. One of the nuns leads the old nun away, patting her back and murmuring in soothing tones. The taller one remains and fusses over my wrist. I'm awfully sorry about that. Did she hurt you? I'm fine, I assure her. I apologize if I did something to disturb her. No, no. Sister Agnes is... not well. She was pulling one of her weekly runners. She twists my wrist this way and that. If I may ask, who are the sisters who walk without feet? She shrugs. The babblings of dementia. The babblings of dementia. When she is satisfied my arm is still in working order, she steps back. I'm supposed to tell you not to be so close to the house... You can walk around the estate. It's pretty this time of year. It's just that house is not structurally safe. I nod in acquiescence, looking at the crack that runs from the base of the house all the way up three floors. The nurse shivers. This place gives me the willies, her voice drops to a whisper. Supposedly, before the convent was closed, two separate nuns tried to burn it down. The eastern wall bows out slightly. Someday it will split open like an overripe carcass. The nurse claps her hands together. The noise bounces off the house walls. Well, 
I better get back before I get in more trouble, she grimaces. Sister Agnes is old, but gosh, she's fast. I wave at her as she trudges across the field towards the nursing home. Before heading towards the old convent building, I look again at the second-story window. It's empty. It doesn't matter. I'll find her when I return tonight. This will not be my first ghost encounter, nor my hundredth. Yet that strange, foreboding feeling still clung to me as I hurried past the trees, their silhouettes made monstrous in the moonlight. It dogged me as I completed the pedestrian portion of communing with the spirits, the breaking and entering part. I successfully jimmied the lock to the heavy oak doors at the front of the Goethe house and slipped inside. I now find myself standing in the atrium, the yellow-green of the walls faintly visible in the moonlight. It reminds me of a summer sky before a tornado. The moon is bright tonight, and my nighttime vision has always been excellent. I creep deeper into the house. It has been gutted, all the furniture and paintings having been removed years ago. Dust blankets every surface like a layer of snow. The air is stale and dry. Hello, I say softly to the little girl at the top of the grand staircase. I'm here to set you free. I would estimate she is about seven. She is wearing a white dress, frothy with lace, and her blonde hair is the disagreeable kind that hangs limp and refuses to hold a curl. The room is dark, but she herself has a pulsating glow. She is pouting. Hello, I whispered again. I'm here to free you, if you can take me to your wings. I pick my way across the squeaking floorboards. I put my right foot down and the board underneath splits. My foot goes through the hole and I pitch forward. I land hard and grunt as the air is pushed from my body. I can feel the splintered edges rake against my ankle. I'm sure it has drawn blood. Wincing, I gingerly extract my foot from the hole. I turn on my flashlight and the girl vanishes. I turn it off and she is waiting at the top of the stairs. I sigh and continue towards the stairs in the dark. I prod each board thoroughly with my shoe before transferring my weight. I reach the banister and the moon better lights my way. Show me where your wings are, I say. The girl spins and rushes down the hallway. I follow. She reaches the third door on the left and passes through it. I catch up and twist the doorknob. The door swings inward and I enter. Aside from a brick fireplace, the room is empty. I limp to the window. I can see the spot in which I stood this afternoon. I turn on my flashlight and crawl around on the floor, but can find no dead moths. I search in the corners and under flaps of sagging wallpaper, but come up empty-handed. My hip clicks and my ankle is throbbing. I sit against a wall, massage my knees, then turn off my flashlight. Where are your wings? I call out. She appears next to the fireplace and extends a finger. I frown. I already looked at the fireplace, I tell her. She stamps a scrawny leg, making no sound and disturbing no dust. She jabs her finger insistently. I scoot towards the fireplace and follow the line of her arm to a black brick. Her otherworldly shine makes it easy for me to see that the brick is not mortared in place, but rather juts out. The brick is rough against my finger pads as I shimmy it back and forth until it is loose enough to remove. Behind the brick, I find a small box tied with twine. I look at the girl. She is across the room now, near the window, with her head cocked to one side. I take the box from the recess and blow off a thick layer of dust, then untie the twine. I unlatch the box and lift the lid. Inside is a dead, black moth. I can't imagine how it got here. Not caught, I think. Entombed. I think of that yellow-green sky. I lift the box towards the girl. These are your wings? She nods, her eyes big and mournful. I can easily imagine her sitting dejectedly in front of a mirror 
as her mother pulls at her wilted hair, trying to make it presentable. I wonder who she was and what happened to her. She's just a child, trapped alone in this comfortless house for a century. I have helped countless other like her. I offer her a smile. We'll take it outside and set you free. Her timid smile meets mine. I am about to close the box when I see the wings of the moth flutter. It is almost imperceptible, perhaps a mere trick of the light or my breath disturbing the paper light corpse. Then it shivers again. I had wiped dust from the box. It had been undisturbed for many, many years, and yet the moth had moved. My eyes slide sideways. I can see the girl on the edge of my vision. Her face... There is something about her face. Something trembly, like her skin is about to slip off. I snap my gaze to her. She looks normal, as normal as a ghost can look, still. These are your wings? My tone is soothing, loving. She nods emphatically and runs into the hallway, beckoning me to follow. I hesitate, then shine my flashlight on the box. The moth is grotesque and disfigured. It has eight legs when it should have six. Its wings are hard and shiny, its body too long. Is it even a moth? It consumed the sisters who walked without feet. The sisters who walked without feet. I had walked the grounds this afternoon, walked through the empty convent and the servants' quarters, stood outside the former girls' school, now a nursing home. I would expect a place this old, a place with this much history, to be teeming with tethered spirits. And yet, I found only one. A cold fist clenches around my heart. I turn off my flashlight. She stands in the center of the room. Did you eat them? I asked quietly. The others? She is trembling, struggling. Her face wobbles. Then she slumps. Her arms droop and the glow goes out. Dark spots bloom on her face, spreading, taking the place of her eyes and her mouth. They are made of black liquid, of smoke, of nothing. Her eyes are gaping wounds of darkness, her mouth a black maw. It's like she's bleeding shadows. She's still wearing that frilly white dress. It drifts towards me. My heart batters against my ribs. It's a ghost. It floated through a door. It couldn't move the brick. It can't touch me. It tugs on my hand. I feel its fingers. Flesh. It can touch. My leg feels warm. I realize I have wet myself. I smile at the creature and close the box. All right. Let us set you free. I make my way back down the hallway and begin my descent down the staircase, slowly, slowly. In one hand I hold the box with its soul, and in the other is my flashlight. I cannot set it free. I must give no indication that I want to flee. No indication. Fire. The nuns tried to burn the house down. It is beside me, in front of me, behind me. It appears and vanishes, circling me, assessing me. Tears leak from my eyes. I cannot tell if my heart is racing or if it has stopped altogether. Maybe, maybe I can set the house on fire. I can get outside, get outside without the moth. I can hear it fluttering inside the box. It wants to get out. I smile tenderly into the darkness. I know it is watching me, though it has no eyes. Let's set you free. I latch the box shut, retie the twine. I'll watch as flames devour the house, devour the thing inside. I'll laugh in the light of the hungry blaze. The girl is in front of me. It touches my hand. I blanch. It knows, it knows, it knows, it knows. I blind it with the flashlight, shining the brightness at its grotesque face. Nothing happens. It doesn't vanish. It's not frightened by the light. It was toying with me before, like a cat with a mouse. 
I scream and hurl the box into the depths of the dark house. I race towards the gap in the doors, towards the tendrils of moonlight peeking through, towards safety, and my foot hits the edge of the hole in the floor. My heel dangles over nothing. I almost regain my balance. Tiny, delicate fingers wrap around my ankle and yank. I hear a snap. I crumple. I try to pull my leg from the hole, but I nearly pass out from the pain. My leg feels wet, so wet, and I know I am bleeding profusely. I scream for help, scream as loudly as I can, but only my ears can hear it. I'm dizzy. I taste copper. I try to crawl towards the door, but the jagged pieces of wood trap my leg, trap me. My flashlight has rolled out of reach. The bulb flickers and flickers and goes out. In the darkness, I hear the fluttering of wings beating against a box. It stands over me, toying, waiting. It only eats the dead. No moth will carry my soul to the moon. Residuals An orange leaf drifted off the branch of a cottonwood tree, moved by the icy breath of an early October breeze. It flipped and twisted through an open window and fluttered like a monarch past the shoulder of the bass player in a thick white coat. Carried by the last fingers of the icy breeze and swept by the soft melodies of the band, the leaf landed at the foot of Clayton Martin, and he cast his dark brown eyes upon it. The top half of his face was covered by a narrow mask, but his trim figure was easily recognizable in his lightweight tuxedo. He bent down and picked up the orange leaf, held it loosely in his fingers. The lead singer, in a deep, Frank Sinatra-type tone of voice, began to sing the next song. It's a marvelous night for a moon dance, the words of the singer said, as some sort of strange breeze caught the leaf and flung it from Clayton's fingers towards a dazzling young woman in a sparkling black dress. A fantabulous night to make romance, neat the cover of October skies, the song said. The orange leaf drifted towards the woman, the glistening glow of her green eyes hidden behind half of the mask as well. Her long, dark hair hung loosely at the flanks of her narrow face, and she caught Clayton's gaze and smiled so warmly towards him as the leaf passed her by. And all the night's magic seems to whisper and hush, and all the soft moonlight seems to shine in your blush, the singer sang. There was a natural pull, like gravity, between them. Without a word, Clayton outstretched his arm and held his hand open towards her. Her red lips curved into a beautiful smile, and she seemed to glide across the room towards him. "'Can I just have one more moon dance with you, my love?' sang the singer, as the woman's slender hand fell into his, her glove so soft and gentle in his palm." Can I just make some more romance with you, my love? Swirling masses twirled around the brightly lit room, like innocent shadows struck by the pale beams of a harvest moon. And I know that the time is just right, and straight into my arms you will run, sang the singer in a low tone. Clayton and the woman moved across the floor, lost in a dazzling sensation of what could be love. Their young eyes were entranced by the unwavering gaze of one another. My heart will be waiting to make sure that you're never alone. There was a sudden roar that rose high above the melodies of the band, and both Clayton and the woman turned their heads to the roof above them. A snap and a crack of wooden beams, as loud as an explosion, shook the earth. Then there was nothing but horrified screams. Regan Lowe's young eyes stared at the charred and blackened remains of the Waverly Mansion. Its withering ruins were brightly illuminated by the light of a full October moon. It was a gas explosion that caused the roof to fall that night, Regan's grandfather said. Eighty-three people were killed. That was back in 1977, 
And ever since, folks been saying you can still hear people dancing in the remains of the ballroom on nights like tonight. An orange leaf, pushed by the icy breath of an early October breeze, drifted past Regan's nose like a monarch fluttering by. Have you ever seen a ghost in there, Grandpa? Regan's grandfather smiled. Don't reckon I have, kiddo, but every so often, I think I can still hear music drifting down from that old place. I think my cat belongs to the devil. It all started with a meow. It was just barely audible over the bustle of the street. The alley was narrow, with dumpsters and trash along its walls. The smell wafted past me, causing my nose to scrunch up in disgust. I was about to keep walking when I heard it again. It was soft and weak. Lifting my jacket to cover my nose, I disappeared down the alley. Stepping carefully to avoid the noxious gunk scattered on the ground, I peered around. The trash was piled high, and the dumpsters were overflowing with crap. There was no movement, and the honking from cars on the street made it harder to hear. I strained, trying to hear anything. A small movement caught my eye, and I turned to face a pile. Garbage bags and boxes were stacked against the dumpster, threatening to topple over at the slightest disturbance. There it was again, the softest cry for help. Holding my breath, I carefully removed the bags and boxes, one by one, being careful to avoid getting any unknown substances on my hands. There, hidden underneath an empty box of ramen, was a small orange kitten. It shivered and jumped at the sight of me, backing up against the garbage. I slowed my movements, carefully setting the box of ramen to the side. I knelt slowly and offered my hand. The little thing meowed again, sniffing the air. It was covered in fleas and greatly malnourished. My heart ached for the poor creature, but I stayed still, not wanting to scare it off. Softly, I said, It's all right, baby. I won't hurt you. Let me help. Its ears twitched and it took a hesitant step towards me. I smiled as it approached. It sniffed my hand before pushing its face against it. I could feel it purring, and I gently lifted it up. It had beautiful blue eyes and a little white spot in the middle of its forehead. I unzipped my jacket and tucked him inside, cradling him against my chest. It purred louder and nestled its way against my collarbone. With him safely stored, I made my way home. I decided to name him Teacup, as he always loved crawling into my mugs as I was about to make some tea. He was given a nice warm bath to rid him of the fleas and a small saucer of milk. The vet said that I had found him just in time, another day or two and he would have been a goner. His fleas and worms were treated, and I pampered him with all of the things a little kitty could desire. As he grew bigger, I noticed that the little spot on his forehead began to resemble an upside-down cross. He was always sweet and kind to me, but hated strangers. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who went near him was met by hissing and bristling of fur. Other than that, he was a perfectly behaved cat. Then, well, something very, very strange happened. It was last week. I had just gotten home from work and was greeted by Teacup at the front door. He meowed happily and extended his head out for pats. Just as I was about to pet him, a shove hit me hard from behind. I was sent sprawling into my apartment, knocking over a potted plant on my descent. When my head made contact with the floor, everything went black. I awoke with a start, feeling a stinging pain across my cheek. I groaned and tried to rub the sore spot. My hands and feet were bound, and it was then that I remembered. My eyes shot open, and I looked panickedly around the room. I had been tied to the bed and was now only wearing my bra and underwear. 
I whimpered and pulled at my restraints. Easy there, Missy. There's no way out of those, a voice said from the foot of my bed. I strained my eyes and could make out the silhouette of a man. He was dressed in all dark clothing and had some sort of mask on his face but I could see the bright, piercing green eyes glaring down at me. They were full of hunger and anticipation. Please, please don't hurt me, I choked out, feeling tears starting to well up in my eyes. He laughed at this and ran a finger around my left ankle. Oh, doll, that will come later. He started to crawl over the bed, over me. I screamed and cried pulling harder as I tried to get away. I felt his rough, wet tongue run across my stomach, and I screamed. Suddenly, the man was thrown off of me and against the bedroom wall. He landed in a pile and groaned. I stared wide-eyed, barely able to keep my breathing calm. A hand gently touched my shoulder, and I let out a squeal of fright. Standing to the side of my bed was another man, this one was finely dressed in a white suit with a red undershirt. His hair was black and slick. His eyes were a sparkling gray and stubble grew across his chiseled chin. He smiled softly at me and undid my restraint. Quickly, I pulled and started undoing my bonds, eyes bouncing back and forth between the two strangers in my bedroom. Teacup came running into the room, having wedged open the bedroom door. He made a beeline for the well-dressed stranger, and I found myself yelling, Teacup, stop! The little cat ignored me and started wrapping himself around the stranger's legs, purring louder than I've ever heard him before. The man bent over and ran his fingers delicately over the cat's head. But he doesn't like... The stranger cut me off, finishing my sentence. Strangers, yes, he never did like new people, the man chuckled and lifted up the cat. I heard a groan to my left and jumped at the sound. The other man was slowly getting to his feet, rubbing his head. The other hand reached into his pocket and pulled out a knife. I quickly darted from the bed but was met by the man in white. He gently placed teacup in my arms and gave the cat one more pet. Now, now, Reggie, I wasn't supposed to be seeing you for another year, but, he tisked, sucking in air as he wiggled his finger at the man, this fine lady is taking care of my little fluffykins, and I can't have you killing her. With inhuman speed, the man in white was across the room and lifting the attacker by the neck. He silenced a yelp as he squeezed harder. The knife clattered to the floor. I stood, wide-eyed, watching the scene. Without realizing it, I was stroking underneath Teacup's neck, who purred in agreement. My savior lifted up the man and gazed up at him. The attacker squirmed and beat at his arms, his face turning red and purple. The man who saved me looked back over his shoulder at me and gave me a dazzling smile. I'll be seeing you here again soon, and please... I would be very grateful if you removed that cross from your wall before then, or at the very least, turn it upside down. With that, they vanished. A burst of hot air blew past me, and I stumbled a bit. The room was now silent and empty. My knees buckled and I fell against the wall. Teacup looked up at me with his big blue eyes, and for a second, just one second, they seemed to glow red. A Demon in Disguise Bill and Nancy had a painful history of trying for a baby. The devastation from the miscarriages was taking its toll, and after the fifth, hope had all but died. A chance encounter at her job as a cleaner at the local hospital created a chance for the couple to foster a young girl named Cindy. The young girl came with a question mark. No one knew anything about her, apart from her name. She turned up at the hospital, alone, with burns on her hands and not saying a word. 
Bill was at home, waiting for Nancy to bring the mysterious girl home from the hospital. The struggling writer spent his days at home, trying to write the next great novel. Bill was still dreaming of success, a promise he had made to Nancy the night they fell in love. An awkward silence filled the car on the drive back from the hospital. The frightened girl seemed lost in her trauma. Her eyes darted back and forth as her fragile mind tried to make sense of her new surroundings. Nancy's eyes scanned every detail of the young girl's face as she watched from her rearview mirror. I hope you like your room, sweetie. Nancy waited for a response, but Cindy just stayed focused on her bandaged hands. Bill stood at the door as the car pulled into the driveway. The couple's dog, Prince, stood wagging its tail. Nancy couldn't wait to introduce the girl to her husband. You'll like Bill. He's just a big kid at heart. She jumped from the car and embraced her husband. How is she? Did you have a nice talk on the way here? asked Bill. She hasn't said much. She seems so fragile and lost. And I hate to think what could have happened to her. Cindy nervously climbed from the back seat of the car as the dog ran over to her. Prince yelped with excitement and began sniffing the girl. His excitement turned to nervous apprehension as his tail retreated between his legs. Bill and Nancy glanced at each other as the dog began growling and backing away from Cindy. "'That's strange,' whispered Bill." The couple's modest three-bedroom house was desperate to be filled with the sound of children. The quiet nights spent watching Telly alone when Bill was out or in his study only intensified Nancy's loneliness. Nancy tried showing Cindy around the house, but couldn't escape the feeling of disappointment towards her demeanor. It wasn't the fairy tale she had imagined for all those years, but she was determined to make it work. The aroma of garlic filled the house as Bill cooked his famous bolognese sauce. Cindy kept close to Nancy and would shadow her whenever Bill was in the room. Even though the frightened girl didn't talk, Nancy still felt a strange bond between them. Bill was busy setting the table when Nancy got a text on her phone. I need to head back to the hospital. Do you mind watching her? A look of contempt shot across Bill's face. Do I have to? I mean, is it a good idea to be leaving her alone with me? Don't be silly. It will give you two a chance to get to know each other. As Nancy grabbed her keys to leave, Cindy suddenly became terrified at the thought of being alone with Bill. She wrapped her arms around her waist, gripping it like a vice. A warm tingle crept up Nancy's back. She never felt needed like this before, not even by her husband. The tighter the girl squeezed, the harder she fell. She knelt and parted Cindy's long, blonde hair from her face. I promise I'll be right back. You are perfectly safe with Bill, and he makes a mean spaghetti, she said with a motherly glint in her eye. Don't forget about my garlic bread, laughed Bill. Cindy sat with her gaze fixated on the table and her face buried behind a mound of blonde hair. The awkward silence was palpable. Bill tried his best to break the ice, but Cindy didn't even look up from the empty plate. The warm smell of food permeated through the air as he set the table. We have one rule here in this house. You help yourself. Bill waited for a response, but Cindy didn't even flinch. You're a strange one, aren't you? Do you ever talk, or is this some edgy preteen stuff? Bill's gaze fixated on the girl as he continued to shuffle food into his mouth. Do you want to know a secret? I never wanted kids. To be honest, I don't even like kids. Cindy just sat there as if the words went over her head. Bill finished the last of his dinner and put his plate in the sink. When you're ready to eat, you know what to do. I'm going to my study to get some work done. Do you understand what I'm saying? he said with a condescending tone. The tranquility of Bill's study was a source of pride for him. The thought of kids coming in and ruining his zen palace 
was something that scared the life out of him. He went along with his wife's fantasy of having the American family for the sake of his own peace. He sat at his desk with the glow of the laptop screen lighting up the room. He typed monotonously with the click-clacking sound of his keyboard suddenly interrupted by the distressed yelping sound made by the dog. Bill bolted from his study and ran to the kitchen. Bill was struck with a sense of terror when he entered the kitchen to find blood smeared all over the floor. He frantically began searching the house for any signs of the dog. Cindy stood in the living room, silently staring at a picture of the happy couple. "'What did you do to my dog? I knew this was a big mistake. When Nancy gets back, you're gone, Missy.' Cindy didn't move and stood staring at the picture hanging on the wall. "'Why are you just standing there? Say something, you freak.' "'What the hell is going on here?' said a voice from the door of the living room. Bill turned to see Nancy shooting daggers in his direction. I, I think she hurt the dog. There's blood on the floor in the kitchen. I'm not making this up. Nancy disappeared, only to return with the blood on her hands. She looked at Bill before licking it from her fingers. It's the sauce, you idiot. Bill's face turned scarlet red. I, I heard the dog screaming, and now he's gone. How do you explain that? Nancy rolled her eyes. He'll turn up. You're overreacting. We'll talk about this later, shouted Bill as he stormed away. Nancy wasn't keen to talk or even argue with her husband. She saw a side of him she never saw before, and wasn't sure what to make of it. Bill paced their bedroom while badgering Nancy about the little girl. I'm not getting into this with you. Now drop it. I'm going to sleep, shouted Nancy. Nancy tossed and turned all night as terrifying visions of Cindy screaming as the house went up in flames invaded her dreams. Suddenly, she was jolted from her sleep as a blood-curdling scream filled the house. She roused Bill from his sleep. Bill, I need you to go and see if Cindy's all right. Bill jumped from the bed to go and investigate while Nancy nervously hid behind her blanket. What felt like hours passed before the sound of the screaming stopped. Suddenly, Bill shouted for his wife. Pictures of the couple that proudly hung on the walls now littered the floor. She followed the sound of her husband's voice to find him standing amongst the debris of his ransacked study. Look what she did to my study. Do you believe me now when I tell you she's broken? How do you know it was Cindy? Bill shot Nancy a look. Look around. The freak cut me out of all the pictures. Nancy ran to the bedroom Cindy was sleeping in to find her still in bed. She felt like she was going crazy and knew her husband was right about her. But as she watched the little girl sleep, she couldn't escape the need to protect her. Nancy woke to the sound of silence. Bill's side of the bed was cold and for the first time, she felt the cold sting of a loveless marriage. Nancy came down to the kitchen to find Cindy already sitting at the table. We need to talk about what happened last night. Cindy continued to sit there in silence. You gave us a real scare last night, sweet pea. A familiar feeling started to creep in. It was a feeling she only reserved for Bill when she got stuck at the hospital for a 12-hour shift. If this is going to work, you have to talk to me. The little girl brushed the long blonde hair from her face and smiled at Nancy. She was stunned as she watched the little girl stand up and walk out of the kitchen. The little girl led Nancy to Bill's locked study. We can't go in there. You already got me into a lot of trouble. Cindy wasn't taking no for an answer and stood there smiling. He keeps the door locked. What am I supposed to do? As the words left her mouth, the sound of twisting metal and a loud click echoed around the house. Nancy nervously turned the doorknob to the study. Her knees felt weak as she slowly opened the door. She stepped inside to find Bill had already cleaned the room. Everything was back in its place, apart from the pictures he dumped in the bin. Nancy's eyes scanned the room. 
A little voice in her head was telling her something was off. Suddenly, something caught her attention. Bill was always the worst at cleaning, she thought, as she spotted the corner of a brown envelope sticking out from under his desk. Nancy felt a lump in her throat. Why was a doctor sending Bill letters? She thought to herself. She suddenly felt the room get smaller as she read further down the letter. Anger built up inside every time she read the word, vasectomy. She fell to her knees. Tears streamed down her face. She struggled to get her breath as she finished the letter. He had lied to her for years, making her think she was the reason they couldn't have kids. Suddenly, her stomach felt barren from the thought of being denied something she craved for so long. She gathered what strength she could and picked herself off the ground. Nancy looked around the room to find Cindy gone. She ran throughout the house calling for her, but couldn't find any trace. Panic set in when she realized she was alone in the house. The warm, pleasant feeling from the girl's presence was gone and replaced by a dreadful chill. Nancy searched everywhere, and as the sun began to set, she started to fear the worst. Nancy heard the front door open, and for a moment she thought it was Cindy. Bill arrived back with flowers and chocolate, hoping to make it up with his wife. Are you all right? Where's the freak gone? Nancy couldn't hide her hatred for her husband. Don't you dare talk about her like that. A look of confusion shot across Bill's face. I'm not the one who trashed our house. Our house. This is my house. I pay for everything. You're nothing but a bad memory in this house. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Nancy took a deep breath as she pulled the brown envelope from her back pocket. Bill's face went blood red when he saw the letter. How is that even possible? I burnt that in a fire months ago. A feeling of betrayal washed over her and tears began flowing down her cheeks. I want you gone this second. There's nothing here for you. Get your shit and get out. Bill laughed into his wife's face. I ain't going nowhere. If you think I'm going to let you ruin what I built up here, you got another thing coming. Bill's face twisted with rage. Spit spewed from his mouth as he raved and ranted at his wife. Nancy had never seen the sight of him and was shockingly surprised at how fast his demeanor changed. He paced the room with his brain in overdrive as he planned his next move. You need to calm down. If you leave now, we can talk about this tomorrow. Bill looked at Nancy with a blank, soulless stare. I did love you, which will make what I do next all the bit harder. He grabbed Nancy by the hair and pulled her to the ground. He began to rain blows down on Nancy's head. She tried to fight back, but he was too strong for her. She screamed out for help as he dragged her around the living room. As Nancy struggled for her life, Cindy suddenly appeared in the doorway to the living room. I thought that freak left. Bill's attention focused on the little girl. Nancy saw a chance of escape and made a run for the kitchen. Nancy grabbed a kitchen knife that someone had conveniently left on the kitchen table. She tried to make a run for the front door, but found Bill blocking her way. She charged at him with the knife raised before plunging it into his shoulder knocking him to the ground. Come up here, Nancy. You'll be safe with us. Nancy followed the sweet sound of the little girl's voice. Bill picked himself up from the ground and armed himself with the knife he pulled from his shoulder. He ran up the stairs after his wife, blinded with rage. Nancy ran towards Cindy, who had her arms outstretched, waiting to embrace her. Bill made it to the top of the stairs, his eyes filled with murderous intent. As he made a go for Nancy, their dog Prince came bounding out of one of the bedrooms. He made a jump for Bill's throat and knocked him back down the stairs. Bill laid at the end of the stairs, dead, 
while Nancy embraced Cindy. A sense of peace washed over Nancy as she squeezed her tight, but by the time she opened her eyes, the little girl was gone. Months went by, and Nancy was starting to rebuild her life. Nobody believed her about the little girl, but Nancy could still smell her. She exhausted all avenues in her search. She was about to give up hope of finding her until she received a phone call from one of the officers looking into her case. Nancy was surprised by the officer's friendly tone. Hi, Nancy. I have to inform you that we couldn't locate the girl by that name. We did find someone who matched her description. The girl's name was Jade. Nancy's heart sank. What do you mean, was? See, that's the strange thing. The girl we found died in a house fire a few months ago. The investigators looking into it declared it a tragic accident, but there's one detail they couldn't get their heads around. When they found the girl's body, the only part of her that got burned was her hands. It would have made sense, only she was clutching a brown envelope that was in perfect condition. The Crushed Woman The falling of leaves, the crisp chill in the air, sweet apples and carving pumpkins. Fall is by far the best season. Sweaters are out and hot chocolate is brewed. There is nothing I don't like about autumn, other than the crushed woman. There is a legend in my town, started in the 70s or 80s, not really sure when. It all starts with a woman. She doesn't have a name, and I'm not sure she was ever given one. She's always gone by the crushed woman. She was in her 20s and was rumored to once be very beautiful. Her hair was like autumn leaves, changing from orange to brown to red in certain lighting. Her eyes were a honey brown and always held a sparkle. Her nose was perky and her lips were curved and delicate. She was stunning. Then she met a man, a stranger, someone who had never been seen around town before. His appearance changes from story to story, but there is always one thing that stays the same, his smile. His teeth were said to be such a glistening white that they would shine in the sun. And just that alone is enough to understand why the woman fell for him the way she did. They planned to elope, ditch town, and leave her overbearing parents behind. And so, one warm fall evening, the woman packed her bags and was never seen again. Or better said, she was never seen alive again. Her body was found buried under a pile of freshly fallen leaves. Her hair had been torn out in places, her eyelids were sliced off, and her lips were sewn together. Her limbs were bent in abnormal directions, her organs were strewn around her body, as if they had been squeezed out, escaping from any opening they could. She was naked, torn apart, and left to rot. Her lover was never found, and her parents buried her in a far corner of the cemetery, underneath a great oak tree, which every fall would shed its decaying leaves and cover the woman's headstone. It wouldn't be a legend, though, if something haunting didn't happen after her death. Every autumn since the woman was discovered and buried, it is said that her spirit awakens and roams the streets. Her ghostly form still appears like it did when she was found. Her limbs move in wrong directions, and her body jerks along while her bones snap with every step. Her hair is matted, with ripped leaves tangling throughout. Her lips are swollen and red, and they struggle against the wire that holds them shut. Her eyes, wide, bloody, and full of hate. She appears on chilly nights when the fallen leaves litter the ground underfoot. If you walk alone on nights like this, you can hear the clear crackling sound of the leaves crunching under your feet. But if you listen closely, you can hear the sounds of another set of feet. These steps hesitate and stomp upon the dead plant matter, crunching the leaves with every step. They jerk 
and get closer as you walk. No matter how fast you go, she will always catch up. And if she catches you, well, let's just say your corpse won't be a pretty sight. The only way to keep her from getting you is to stop and let her pass. She'll creep up slowly, and it'll feel like she is right behind you. She is. She'll stay behind you for what will feel like hours. Finally, she'll move around you and slowly make her way up the street. You cannot move until she is out of sight. If she hears you, she'll come back. And it's much harder to fool her twice. She follows the sound of crushed leaves, searching for the man who did this to her. If you stop, the only steps will now be hers. Silence is key, and you must wait for her to leave. She is forever walking, forever following, following the last sound she ever heard as she was left on that forest floor. She is broken. She is tattered. She is cursed. She is crushed, just like the autumn leaves. Living Nightmare this is a true story. I woke up, lying in a cold sense of bewilderment, staring at the flat white ceiling above me as the warm wind screeched at the window. All in the world seemed right, but there was most certainly something wrong. For a moment, I gathered my senses. Lying perfectly still, I began taking mental notes on my surroundings. The thin green blanket lay across my bare chest, the little red light of my TV beaming into my eyes, and my roommate snoring like a train in the opposite corner of the dorm. Something just wasn't right about tonight. My blue eyes rolled restlessly, cautiously, searching through shadows for something that they truly did not want to see. My eyes pulled towards the deeper portions of the room, all the inner voices of my body begged and screamed for them to stop, but they did not. The deeper portions of the dorm room were always thickly shrouded in the blackest of shadows. My roommate never closed the bathroom door unless he was in there using it, a habit that was greatly annoying because of the constant dripping of our showerhead and a strange fear of seeing a shadow peek out at me. As I stared at the bathroom opening, it dawned on me that shadow people were always like that weird character on the early Mortal Kombat games. I've yet to see one, though, where the apparitions called out, Toasty! when they looked towards the camera. The thought made me laugh, a subtle calm before all my nerves would explode in absolute terror. My wandering eyes continued on their meandering search of the darkest portions of our dorm room. The heavy doorway sat about an inch or two above the floor. The main hallway sat right on the opposite side. There was always the pale white glow of the lights slipping its fingers into our room through the narrow slit beneath the door. And that's exactly where it stood. I didn't recognize the form of a person right away. Matter of fact, it took me a second to really realize that anything was there at all. The white glow of the hall lights shined through the crack between the bottom of the door and the floor, but two dark legs blocked out the center portion of the light. Somehow, I knew that it, too, knew that I had seen it. I couldn't identify the shape of the body, but my voice crashed unwaveringly into the bottom of my throat. I couldn't utter a sound. In a flash, the dark mass dashed straight to the side of my bed. I hollered out for help, but my cries were only resounding in my own head. My roommate slept peacefully, about twenty feet from me, but I felt the heavy weight of a person climb on top of me. To this day, my lower throat still heaves in fear at remembering that night. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. The distinct feeling of two thumbs pressing down into my skin, but no one there at all still sends shudders through my body. This was it. Death had come. I fought it, but even though I'm as built as a gold miner, 
there was no escaping the paranormal murderer. Giving up and feeling my strength fading, I settled my nerves and did the only thing I could think of doing. I prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, was all the words that needed to be said. In a moment that was as brief as a lightning strike, everything went away. Such calm, such peace that I immediately fell back to sleep. In the morning, I woke up and looked around. There was nothing amiss, nothing that even indicated that I had almost been killed by a ghost, or something, just five hours before. I asked my roommate if he had heard anything, but he said that he had been so knocked out that a cannon shot wouldn't even have awakened him. I was so distraught by what had happened that I even called a recently ex-girlfriend just so that I could have someone to tell the story to. For years, I kept what happened to me that night stored away. I never understood it, and I can't rightly say that I believe my convictions of it today. Through faith, we are taught that there is good and evil. Through science, we are told there is only fear and the imagination. Sleep paralysis is what everyone says. It's more of a living nightmare to me. So, sleep sweet, my friends. I hope it doesn't happen to you. I drink to make the monster go away. A day, an anniversary, for which its significance I have completely let slip from my memory, stalks me every year. I can feel it creeping up my body as my fingers tremble and a relentless itch burns behind my eyes. I request time off from work when my hands start to shake so much that I can't even sign my own name. If I can't get those days off, I quit. I need time to prepare. I need time to recover. It's a day that I can't fight. I can only run as far as I can for as long as I can. It's a day that... Well, it's the day that I get completely hammered. I have to drink. I have to run. Drinking is the only thing that slows down the figure that follows me that entire day. That entire anniversary. I can feel its eyes tugging at me as soon as the leaves begin to change color. I often catch a fraction of its face, shyly peeking at me from around corners. Wide, horrified eyes pierce through me, as if it's staring at me in disbelief. It becomes braver as the day approaches. Graduating from hiding behind corners, it stares at me through dark windows, and eventually watches me sleep from the foot of my bed. I know it's the day when I wake up to the sound of my shower running. I get up to turn off the shower and see the distorted figure of my stalker through the opaque curtain. It's always curled up and sobbing. When I slide the curtain to the side, nothing is there but the rushing stream of ice-cold water from the shower. After I turn off the shower, I sift through my closet and grab the same suit I wear every year on this night. I keep $200 worth of 20s in my front right pocket and a large coin in my front left. I never look at the coin. Something deep inside of me prohibits it. Throughout the night, I caress one of the sides with my thumb, and I don't have to see it to know that the number one is embossed onto it. After I'm dressed, I fast for the remainder of the day. I need to get blasted as quickly as possible. I fill up a flask with cinnamon-flavored bourbon just in case I get too drunk to enter any bars. It almost caught me last year, and I need to be prepared. I would just drink at home, it definitely would be a lot cheaper. But I need to keep moving so it doesn't catch me. I start the night off at a country bar called the Moon Saloon because they serve dollar beers from 4 to 5 p.m. I know the old rhyme, beer before liquor, never been sicker, but I've found that when I've been fasting, I need to work my way up to liquor. I can drink about ten beers before my lanky pursuer shambles into the saloon. It dresses in a suit similar to mine, except I'm a bit embarrassed to say that the quality is much nicer. 
Throughout the night, its face gradually deforms and distorts. At this point, it usually has eyes that are swimming through its own flesh, circling around its head as if they were caught in orbit. The mouth is a gaping black hole and pulsing in size. That's my cue to move on to the next bar. I head to a pub called the Corner Tap, where I upgrade to mixed drinks. Tequila sunrises are my go-to, but I may throw a Long Island iced tea in there if I feel like I'm falling behind. I make sure I don't get distracted in conversation or by what's on TV. Instead, my eyes bounce between the entrance and the large window looking out to the patio. I can drink about five mixed drinks before I see it outside, skulking towards the front doors. This night in particular, however, I only made it to two. I was shocked to see it trudging through the entrance, like it was fighting for each step. While it was much slower than when I saw it at the saloon, it was much faster than it should be right now. Its body was gangly and had disproportionate limbs extending a foot out from the cuffs of its sleeves. The flesh of its face now swirled around its skull. The ears, eyes, nose, and mouth swirled with it as if they were caught in the current of a whirlpool. I dug into my pocket for cash and slapped down forty bucks. I squeezed the coin resting in my other pocket as the creature's long, spindly arms desperately reached out for me. I kept my eyes glued to the monster, backed away, and slowly circled around the pool table. It towered over everyone as it followed me. While my eyes were fixed on the stalker's swirling head and bony frame supporting it, I felt the collective stare of the entire pub as I walked backwards through the exit. Once outside, I jogged to the next bar on my list, the Admiral's Choice. I wear running shoes with my suit now. I learned last year that dress shoes are a liability if I need to run from that thing. Once I stopped jogging and got into line for the bar, my head began to spin. The booze was beginning to take hold of me. I felt like I needed to throw up, but I wouldn't let my body reject the alcohol. As soon as I felt the burn of stomach acid in my throat, I forced myself to swallow it back down. Once I approached the bouncer, I tried to act as sober as possible. He almost let me in, but my body retaliated, and I threw up at his feet. Out of sheer embarrassment, I covered my mouth and ran away from the now furious bouncer. I had to change my plans. I didn't feel like I was too drunk, but the jogging definitely upset my stomach. The next bar on my list was a dive simply named Good Times. I usually save this bar for last, since they don't have a bouncer, and never give me a hard time for being nearly blackout when I come in. The bartender knows me, and when I ask for a whiskey double, she usually pours me four fingers. By the time I was on my fifth whiskey double, all of my attention was directed at the bar's front entrance. I tightly held the coin in my pocket, anxious for when the creature strolls in. As time passed, and as my paranoia ballooned, I decided it was time to get back on the move. I pulled $80 out of my pocket and left it on the bar. However, once I stood up, I could feel the floor shift beneath my feet as if I was walking on a waterbed. Fuck. I fell. The world was swirling around me. I was fighting against gravity itself when I felt a hand clutch my arm. A hot flash of terror shot through me. I threw a bald fist at the face of whatever was grabbing me. Fuck. The bartender was in the arms of the other patrons. Her nose was bleeding. Fuck. I took off running before I was fully standing up, but somehow I managed to reclaim my balance and dash out of the bar. I could hear angry cries of fuck you and you're fucking dead echo behind me as I sprinted down the street. I ran about five blocks before I had the courage to check if anyone was chasing after me. I was in the clear. My chest cavity felt like a liquor-soaked bar mat was stuffed inside of it. I could feel myself wanting to vomit again, but I closed my eyes, leaned against a brick building, and fought the urge. Cold, needle-like rain began to lightly shower over me. I launched myself from the brick building with my forearms and stumbled backwards. A parked car caught me before I landed in the street, 
and immediately erupted in an explosion of flashing lights and a steady honking alarm. Vomit spewed from my mouth and nose, washing over the entire passenger side of the car. My hand slid through the throw-up on the window as I stabilized myself long enough to stand. The flashing headlights intermittently washed over a tall, wiry figure slowly walking towards me, as if it were underwater. I backed away from the creature. Its head was now vibrating, like it was a bowl of fleshy water sitting on top of a loudspeaker at a concert. Its limbs appeared to be boneless and curvy like a pool noodle. I reached back into my pocket and held my coin as tightly as I could. Hey, asshole, the fuck are you doing in my car? Fuck, fuck, fuck. You've got to be kidding me. Behind me was a large man fast walking to give me a first-rate ass-kicking. In front of me is the nightmare I've been running from for years. My feet moved before my brain had time to think. I tried dashing across the street, but a car intercepted my attempted escape. I rolled over the hood and felt the glass of the windshield crack beneath my back. The driver got out and asked, "'Oh my God, are you okay?' as I rolled off of the car to continue my sprint. I cut across the street and ran as fast as I could to the park. In mid-stride, I glanced over my shoulder at the scene I left behind me. The person who hit me was on the phone, the large man silenced his car alarm, and the creature was bending down in the middle of the street, picking something up. My veins burned with each heartbeat, my lungs felt like they were completely absent of air, I kept running. I kept running until the roar of the city faded and the still silence of the park embraced me. I poured myself into a park bench and focused on breathing. Minutes passed before the acidic burn in my chest subsided. I reached into my suit jacket and pulled out the flask of cinnamon-flavored whiskey I had prepared. I took three large, burning gulps and welcomed the warm numbness that washed over me. After patting my left pocket, I realized I had lost the mysterious coin after the car hit me. As I lamented the loss of the coin, a bright light beamed directly at me. I remember thinking that I must be dying. This was death. I wasn't scared, though. I took a few more sips from my flask as the light grew brighter and brighter. Had a few too many drinks tonight? A voice asked. I raised a hand up to shield my eyes from the light. I saw two dark figures that I wasn't able to identify until I heard voices chime through the static of a radio. No, ma'am, I lied. Thirty minutes and three failed sobriety tests later, I was handcuffed and placed in the back of their police unit. The officers stood outside of the vehicle, inaudibly speaking into their radios. I closed my eyes and leaned my head back against the headrest letting the world swirl around me. I nearly fell asleep until I heard a steady tapping at the window. When I opened my eyes to see what was tapping, I saw the creature, hunched over, peering into the back seat. I was eventually placed in the drunk tank. The smell of bleach and the bright, fluorescent light was overwhelming. It was as if the sober world was eagerly trying to seep in, but the alcohol refused. My eyes were heavy. The last thing I saw before sleep claimed me was the abstract, surreal creature slipping into my cell. I woke up hours later. The hangover was beginning its throbbing assault in my head. No one else was in the cell, aside from one man who was sitting next to me. His stare was relentless. I sat up and was beginning to scoot away when he placed a hand over my wrist, stopping me. He wore an expensive-looking watch and neatly polished shoes. It wasn't until I got a good look at his suit that I realized that this was the creature stalking me. My heart pounded. Fear burned through my veins and my skin chilled over. Hey, the creature gently said. Hey, I replied. My pursuer extended his open hand out to me. Resting on top of his palm was what I could only assume was the coin that I had dropped. Reluctantly, I looked into its eyes. 
I was expecting its eyes to be bestial, malicious, and evil. Instead, they were disappointed, sad, and familiar. The creature was me. Not me as I am right now, but a better me. The me that I could have been. It was a full manifestation of all the promise and potential that I had wasted, that I had drowned. It, he, was the embodiment of every kind thought, word, and belief my friends and family had for me. He was the future that I had so fondly dreamt of, but avoided through absent neglect. He was the me that I told myself I would be if I could just go one year sober. He was a reminder of why I hate myself, why I drink. He was a living I told you so. My hot, watery eyes returned to his hand. I plucked the coin from his palm with trembling fingers. It read, One year sober, with a large embossed one in the center. Tears streamed down my face as the bleach-soaked jail floors and the fluorescent lights seeped into my world. I had nothing to say. But the other me repeated one sentence for the remainder of my time in jail. I don't forgive you. I don't forgive you. I don't forgive you. I don't forgive you. Forgive me. The Cycle What we do in life echoes in eternity. Maximus I didn't expect that at all. The movies completely failed to even remotely depict what happens. I didn't feel at peace or like I was drifting between realms. There was definitely no bright white light or out-of-body experience. There was just the feeling of fear. Raw and intense fear. It was happening. There was no going back. And it was cold. I was alone, scared and cold. There were no angels leading the way, just darkness. Warmth finally washed over me when I lost control of my bodily functions and pissed myself, but I suppose that doesn't count. The coffee shop looked familiar, but it didn't at the same time. I felt I'd been here before, but couldn't remember coming. The old American-style booths with the red leather seats... The black-and-white checkered linoleum floor shone bright with wax. There was no one else in the shop. I was alone, but it felt crowded. It was warm, but there was also a lack of heat. There was a coffee mug in front of me. Black coffee. Steam rising from the mug. I don't like black coffee. The bell above the door rang out. I didn't look back, but I knew who had walked in. The streets outside looked equally as familiar as the coffee shop did, but I couldn't put a name on the street we were on, or the town we were in. No wind outside. The trees lining the desolate street were still. Rusty cars lined the sidewalk and not a soul moved. I could hear his footsteps as he walked towards me. None of the shops outside looked open, just empty. He had reached my booth. He sat opposite me. I knew who he was, but his name eluded me. Maybe I had known him as a kid growing up and never encountered him again. Whatever the case, he was a familiar face. Or maybe he just had that face that looks familiar. We sat in silence. He, too, had a coffee mug in front of him, steam rising, presumably from black coffee. I analyzed him. He seemed to be doing the same. Fairly good-looking guy, nothing special, medium-length brown hair, strong chin and jawline, almost non-existent lips. But his eyes, I couldn't read into them. They just seemed to be black pits of emptiness. I felt I was getting lost in them, an abyss. He finally broke the silence and said my name. Jake? Where do I know you from? I asked. You don't, was his reply. I don't understand what you mean. Where do you think you are? He asked. I'm, uh, I don't really know. The realization that I had no idea where I was hit me. He smiled at my confusion. His teeth were sharp. 
Only when he smiled did his eyes come to life. It seemed almost like a fire was kindled deep inside of him. The fire in his eyes scared me. I felt the fear deep in my bones, down to my very soul. Is this hell? I asked. <laughs> no, not at all, Jake. This is a fate much worse than hell. Let's go take a look. I was looking at me now. We weren't in the coffee shop. I wasn't okay. By me, I mean the me I was looking at. I could hear crying in the distance. It was a woman's sobs. It pained me to hear them. She seemed beyond console. Who is that? You'll see, was the reply. A familiar voice rang out. I could finally place the voice. It was my stepdad. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying. I could still only see the not-okay me. I looked more closely. I was lying in a pool of my own sick, and there was a seemingly large wet spot by my crotch. I asked the familiar stranger what was going on. The fate worse than hell, he said, is that you're fated to watch the devastation you've caused by your actions for eternity. The environment grew brighter, and I could make out that we were in my bedroom. I still lay in a puddle of vomit. My stepdad rushed to the vomit-soaked me and shook me desperately. My bed was unmade and the covers had piled up on the floor. My basketball medals and trophies glistened in the beautiful morning sun. The dead me was still being shaken by my stepdad. Finally, I came to see whose pained cries I heard earlier. My sickly old mother collapsed next to her husband and desperately tried to wake me. She has been sick, but now she looked as if she'd given up all hope. The few strands of hair she had were plastered to her tear-soaked face. The big, burly man she had left my real dad for was still shaking me. He had thrown the pill dispenser I had made use of to the other side of the room. The bottle seemed to gleam smugly at its victory over human life. Chunks of sick stuck to his shirt. Looking at myself, I knew they were clearly too late. I hope you enjoyed the show. The encore is forever, the strange man said. I looked back at myself, dead and soiled. Suddenly, it all went blank. Light slowly drifted back, and I saw, again, myself lying on the floor. I could hear the sobs and the familiar voice. It was happening all over again. Safety I'm safe here. They definitely wouldn't think to look for me here. I can't tell you where here is because they might get to you, and thereby get to me. But you're a part of me, so you basically know where here is. You're in my head, so if you delve deep enough and focus intently, you can see where I am. But there's no need for such. I'm safe, and so you are too. They're dangerous, and our safety is my top concern. I can't let them get us. I've seen what they're capable of, and it's not fun-looking. The blood streamed down the sidewalk. The exit site of the bullet looked like a small creature had crawled out of his head. It was a gaping hole with bits of brain and hair hanging by threads. Instant lights out. His brown hair matted to what was left of his skull by the scarlet mess. His scrawny arms lay motionless at his side, covered in dirt accumulated on the walkway, blood seeping into his t-shirt. A stain like that definitely won't come out. A small crowd had gathered and looked on, in a mixture of awe and disgust. It was such a grotesque horror, committed on such a beautiful day. Rather warm for autumn, but nonetheless still an overall great day. Besides for the man with his brain painting the sidewalk, it definitely wasn't a great day for him. The crowd spoke in low murmurs. No one was able to make sense of the atrocious act committed in the city center in broad daylight. Cars continued to drive by, each stopping briefly to try and catch a glimpse of the drama evidently unfolding on the sidewalk. The buildings enclosing the street on both sides seemed to blend into the background. There was no one to focus on but him. He must have known too much about them. This is what happens when you know too much. This is why I need to protect us. 
He was probably a father, computer technician, or something equally boring, and now look at him. The ambulance sirens caused everyone to divert their attention. Strange no police had shown up. I'm sure many a concerned civilian had called it in. Now only an ambulance. Curiosity killed the cat. This was my first encounter with their stronghold on the public. Crazy, hey? A fire in the building I lived in was another danger alert. The fire killed one of the guys I knew who stayed on the third floor. He was a pretty cool guy. We'd played a few pickup games of basketball together at the community center courts a few times. He, too, must have known too much about them. Incredible the lengths they'd go to to get rid of him, starting a fire in an apartment building where hundreds of people live. Strangely enough, he was the only death in the fire. The fire department issued a statement that a lit cigarette he fell asleep with was the cause of the fire. I was among the crowd outside the building being tended to by paramedics when they wheeled his charred corpse out the smoking remnants of our communal home. His once white skin was now a very reddish pink in most parts. The rest of him was crispy black. Blood seeped out through the cracks in the now hardened skin and gave color to the white sheet that did a poor job of concealing the abomination he had become. I may not be a smart man, but I know better to believe the nonsense story that the fire department gave about the cause of the fire. It wasn't a cigarette. It was them. The crispy man had known too much. And they dealt with him. The embers of the fire glowed dimly in the flashing lights of the fire truck, and shouts and cries of the now homeless people faded into the background. They had struck again. My third and final encounter with their destructive power was by far the worst. It was the boot up my ass I needed to get us to safety. It was all the confirmation I needed to know they posed a real threat to us. I didn't know the guy, but whoever he was, he didn't deserve to die the way he did. I was taking a walk through the park to clear my mind of all the negativity and stress I'd been inflicted with, when my thoughts were dragged instantly back to the park. I had stumbled and nearly tripped in the almost dark park. I looked down, annoyed, to see what had caused my stumble. There, in my path, was the abdomen of a man. His abdomen was dressed impeccably well, so it was fair to assume his grand night had come to an abrupt end. I was at a loss for words and didn't know what to do. My first thought was to locate the rest of his body. Leaving the abdomen donned in a tuxedo jacket, I walked slowly down the path, scanning left and right for parts of the man. Boy, did I find them. He had been completely ripped apart. Strewn on both sides of the path were his hands, the rest of his arms, his feet in what looked like expensive dress shoes, and the legs. The head, however, was nowhere to be found. Unperturbed, I continued my search. The path led me to the gate of the park where my search proved fruitful. Mounted on the spikes above the gate was the stranger's head. They had no respect for the dead. How could they violate the man like this? All because he knew too much. Leaving the head on the gate, I left in a hurry. No point summoning the police. They would not get involved with these people. Now do you see why I must do all I can to ensure our safety? These people know no bounds. They have no regard for the law or human life. All this death because of the knowledge people had acquired. Knowledge is power, but in this case, it is also grounds for death. Unfortunately for us, I am knowledgeable. As I'm sure you can guess, we are next on the hit list. I won't tell you exactly what it is I know. So if they get to me first, they might spare you for your ignorance. You must be wondering why I fear for you. Because as I said, you're a part of me. You know what I know. But upon my death, the bond might break. Therefore, you won't know it anymore, thus being spared. That, however, is worst-case scenario. I would rather just keep us both alive. Do you hear that? The buzzing? I think they've found me. We've been compromised. Sorry, old pal, but this is the end of the road. The door is opening now. Oh, God. How are they getting in? The door has no handles, so how? Oh, God. The door opened, and the nurses walked into the padded room. 
He sat on the floor, rocking back and forth, shouting, straitjacket sitting tightly around him. Every time he was scheduled to get his medicine, he did this, screaming and shouting about them and knowledge. Once sedated, the nurse put the clozapine in his mouth and gave him enough water to wash them down. Then they checked to make sure he swallowed the medication. Anthony had been admitted into the psychiatric ward of St. Bernard's Hospital over three years ago. He was found wandering the streets, covered in blood by police after an extensive manhunt was launched following the death of three unrelated individuals. Brutal deaths all found to be carried out by Anthony. He was sent to trial and proven extremely mentally unstable, earning him a lifetime stay in the padded room. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. Memoirs of a Would-Be Killer And now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. I can't say exactly what it is about death and murder that fascinates me, but it does. Everyone is worried about me, thinking I have an unhealthy obsession with taking another's life. I wouldn't call it unhealthy. Well, not for me at least. Life. We only have one. Most people don't live one worth living. So why not end their misery early and spare them the trouble of living? One often questions what it would be like to be God. He is viewed as the supreme being with the role of giving and taking life. So it's fair to say that it's almost like bestowing yourself as a form of God by taking it upon yourself to take lives, or not taking a life. You see, the decision you make to take the life or spare it is almost that of a higher being. There is also the thought of how it would feel to take a life, watching as the life before you slowly ebbs. The feel as you press the knife deeper and harder, feeling it penetrate the skin, and watching the glisten of the blade slowly become enveloped with the scarlet mess. The warmth of the blood as it covers your hands, the metallic smell that would engulf you, I can't help but think, what would it taste like? Lift one blood-covered hand and simply lick the warm life source. As the ancients believed, eating a warrior you killed in battle would give you their strength. So would it give me the traits and abilities of the individual I had killed? Or better yet, the feeling of your hands wrapping tighter and tighter around their neck, their trachea cracking under the immense pressure you're exerting, watching as their face grows puffy, the way they claw and clutch at you as they struggle ever more to draw breath, the choking sounds they make as they realize you have no intention of letting go, which in turn makes them panic more, thereby diminishing what little oxygen that they had before. Watching as their body grows limp, the light in their eyes snuffed out, death before you at your hand. I think about it a lot, more than I would like to admit. When I'm sitting and my mind drifts, murder, blood, death, agony. When I'm asleep, I often wake and recall a dream in which death was the central theme. Either by my hand or by my authority, I am always the cause of it. Even when I sit daydreaming consciously, I am imagining the sensations and ways in which I would take a life, how it would feel, look, and be. Glorious. Sitting having a cup of coffee, the barista pouring my drink, I imagine what it would be like to hold their face under the pressurized steam of boiling water, hearing their agonized screams as their skin is seared, or better yet, when they are washing the cups and dishes, the thought of holding their head under is appealing, more so if the water is again scalding hot. What would that feel like for them, the sensation of burning as well as drowning? <laughs> Fascinating. Sitting down to eat, I've ordered a steak. The waiter removes the blunt butter knife set beside my fork. 
He brings a much larger, sharper, and serrated steak knife. Would I drive it into his stomach, his chest? Would I merely plunge it in, or would I cut and rip it from one side to the other? Hmm. I could utilize all the eating utensils provided to me. The steak knife would also be perfect for slicing his throat. As one would do with a scoop of ice cream, it would be magnificent to scoop his eye out with the spoon set in front of me for dessert. The fork, of course, could be rammed into, say, his ear, for humor's sake. So many options. So many things to do, and to so many different people. But I don't. Why? Often, I ask myself. People indulge in a number of equally destructive habits. Drugs, alcohol, and even overeating. But I have a certain level of self-restraint. So I sit, observing, daydreaming, eating my steak, drinking my coffee, being normal, fantasizing about murder, the usual. Saving Mother Death That was the odor that occupied the room. The pungent smell of vomit and sweat was evident, but the stench of rotting dead flesh was predominant. David looked fearfully at his mother, lying helpless on the bed. He knew she was sick, but the sight of her disease-eaten flesh made him feel an array of emotions, with fear being the front-runner. He was scared for his mother. He did not want her to die. But the fear was also for his own well-being. The imminent fear that it could be contagious made him keep his distance. His father sat holding his mother's hand. The bits of the hand that remained, that is. The disease had stripped his caregiver of most of the muscle and flesh she had once used to nurture and care for him. All the money and power his father had was of no use against a disease such as this. World-renowned doctors and specialists had been called as soon as his mother had exhibited signs of the sickness. All to no avail. Disease does not discriminate. Janice was suffering just as the poor do, dying with no means of recovery. Necrotizing fasciitis was the name for what ailed his mother. He had heard it on the news a while before he saw it plague his mother, the flesh-eating disease, or if the stories he had heard around school before it closed were anything to go on, the zombie disease was a more applicable diagnosis. The fever and nausea were the first symptoms. Janice was unable to take her son to school, lying weak in her bed with her temperature climbing steadily. David's father, Jonathan, put it down to a bug of sorts and simply picked up the slack by doing the duties around the house his wife was unable to do. By the second week of sickness, Janice was completely unable to move, with her fingers and toes taking on a darkish hue. David had continued to go to school and had heard many of the kids talk about other people suffering from a similar-sounding sickness. But in all the stories he had heard, none of them ended well. Fearing for his mother's health, David repeated these stories to his father, only to be met with reassurance and comfort. That reassurance and comfort proved to be meaningless as he now sat looking at the disease-riddled body of his mother. Flesh eaten beyond comprehension, holes gaping in places unimaginable. Jonathan had tried his best by all means. As soon as he saw his wife's condition deteriorate, a number of doctors were called for consultation. They all came to the same prognosis, necrotizing fasciitis, the flesh-eating disease. According to the doctors looking after her, she was one of the first to be stricken by the disease, and just as the others had, her condition had progressed. Their only suggestion was to move her to the hospital wing they had designated to those afflicted with the disease. Before moving her, Jonathan thought to take David to see the hospital where they would care for his mother. They discussed the matter with her and decided to make the trip the next day. "'You've been avoiding me, baby,' Janice said once alone with David. "'I'm... 
I'm just scared, Mum. I don't want you to die, came David's reply. Laughing, Janice told David, That's not something you need to worry about, my son. What you do need to worry about is how comfy my room there is going to be. Joining in with his mother's laughter, David finally dropped his inhibitions and sat close to his mother. Resting his head on her bed, she stroked his head as he fell asleep. He had not slept long at the bedside of his mother, but his dreams were those of zombies and those they hunted. His father woke him to go to bed, and the disturbance of the dreams was a thorough welcome by David. Walking, half asleep towards the door, he couldn't help glancing back at his mother. He could feel the tears well up as the woman lying in the bed closely resembled those creatures that haunted his dream. The drive to the hospital the next day was excruciating. The silence seemed to drill deep into David's core as he sat next to his father. He could feel the sadness and pain emanating from the man he had always viewed as an absolute pillar of strength and wisdom. When the journey had finally ended and they sat in the car park of the hospital, David suddenly burst into tears. The stark reality of the possibility of losing his mother had hit him like a freight liner moving at remarkable speeds. His father hesitated for a second, unsure of what the appropriate response would be, given that he too felt so unable to do anything he wanted to cry too. He held his son, the two embraced tightly and said nothing. No words could have helped either feel better. The dark clouds drifting in the sky outside them closely resembled the way both of them felt inside, cold and lost. The bright lights in the hospital corridor beat down on them. They winced as they walked in, waiting for their eyes to adjust. Good morning. We're here to view and book a room in the CDC wing, please, Jonathan asked. Um, we're sorry to inform you there has been an incident in the CDC room, sir. We're not accepting any new patients at the moment. What? That's preposterous. What kind of incident? Jonathan shouted at the nurse. Before she could answer, the doors to the CDC wing burst open, and what looked like the remnants of a man ran through the doors, leaving footprints of blood behind him. He lunged at a woman, seated on the chairs outside the Center for Disease Control, and people were too shocked to respond. Pinning her down, Jonathan and David could see the sick man biting and clawing at the woman's face. Blood and flesh flew everywhere. He had more holes in him than flesh. Bits of bone could be seen through the loose hanging hospital gown that covered the eaten man. The disease had all but devoured his body, and it was a miracle he was able to move. Does that answer your question, sir? The nurse screeched as she made a beeline for the exit. Dragging David, Jonathan followed the panicked crowds through the door and towards the car park. The only people left in the hospital were zombie-looking individual and his victim. Well, what was left of her after he had eaten his fill and pulled all of her intestines out through the hole he had chewed in her stomach. Rushing to get in the car, David and Jonathan said nothing as they ran and pushed through the crowds to get where they were going. Locking themselves in their car, they merely sat where they were, not moving and not saying anything. Bursting into tears once again, David was the one to finally break the silence. We have to get home to Mom, Dad. As they pulled into the driveway, Jonathan had already begun giving David instructions. As soon as we get in, you need to go up to your room and pack a bag. We're going to go straight to the airport and get on a plane to India. Your Uncle Kiron mentioned something about doctors working on stuff like this there. We'll take your mother and this will be all sorted out. Come straight to the room when you've packed. As soon as the car was stationary, David leapt out of the car and ran up the driveway and into the house. Jonathan was close behind. As Jonathan made his way into his bedroom, he could hear his son cursing and banging his cupboard doors. He, too, would pack a bag for him and his wife 
and they would leave to a safer place. Having finished packing some clothes into a bag, David closed it and ran out of his room. The tears had begun to dry and a smile crept over his face at the thought of the three of them flying to India to make Mum better. Who knows, maybe Uncle Kiran will be waiting for them at the airport. Bursting through the door of his parents' room, the smile that had recently formed once again dissolved to tears. There would be no trip to the airport, let alone India. Straddling her husband on their bed, David could see his mother. Her head was buried in her husband's chest as she feasted. Jonathan's hand dangled off the bed, drenched in his own blood. The only thing David could hear over his loud breaths was the grotesque sound of his mother chewing and slurping the bits of flesh and blood she was stuffing her face with. Standing there frozen, David saw his mother turn to face him. What now looked him in the eye was not his mother. Blood dripping from its chin, dead eyes staring, it stood up, leaving Jonathan lying on the bed, with holes chewed in his body. David felt his legs give out. Mom, he said weakly, tears streaming down his cheeks, hoping something inside of the creature would hear and recognize her son, and perhaps grant him mercy. The ground seemed to shake as it took a step towards him. What are friends for? The scratches were deep. Blood had been drawn. The fact that they were self-inflicted were testimony that something was undoubtedly not right with James. The restraints creaked with every sharp, rigid movement he made. The sound he let loose made all of their blood run cold. It started very low, almost animalistic. The sound gained in volume and pitch until their ears felt as though some psychopath had embedded a fork into each of them and was scraping inside with the utmost vigor. Jeff and Marco looked at each other as they stood above the bed that contained the body of what had once been James. Fear. Fear was so evident in them, it seemed to be written on their foreheads in luminous font. It had just been a silly game. Nothing more and nothing less. The goal of the game was to talk to a spirit and see what it knew about them or what was in store for their future. Because according to the stories, spirits could tell you that sort of stuff. What they had brought into our realm was far from the idealistic spirit they had imagined. They were under the illusion it would have been friendly and cooperative. How wrong they had been. James's skin had taken on a yellowish tone. His breathing was fast and shallow. From time to time he twitched, like a dog does when it is in the throes of a dream it cannot wake from. They didn't know what to do. Jeff shook him. All that accomplished was to show them the whites of his eyes as they rolled back in their sockets. He stopped and they just stared at the ghastly sight of their friend before them. The bed rattled and shook as James started seizing. What do I do? Jeff shouted in a panic. Open his mouth and hold his tongue so he doesn't bite it off, came Marco's reply. In a flash, Jeff gripped James's jaw and pulled it open, while immediately inserting two fingers to place on his tongue. The shaking and convulsing persisted until again James let loose the blood-curdling sound he had made earlier, and with that looked directly at Jeff. What Jeff saw in the eyes of James was not human. Their gaze was broken when suddenly Jeff felt the most excruciating pain he had ever felt course through his body. He looked down and let out a scream as he saw James covered in blood, with two badly removed stumps where his fingers had been. James laughed eerily, but not before he chewed the fingers he had unorthodoxly removed and spat them onto the floor to his side. Jeff screamed until his throat was raw, all the while holding his maimed hand. His fingers lay on the floor in front of him, chewed in such a manner they no longer really looked like fingers. In shock, 
Jeff reached down with his good hand and picked up his lost appendages, cradling them close to his chest and crying. James's laughter continued while Marcus stood there, unable to move or say anything. The game had gone well at first, or so it seemed. They set up the board, darkened the room, and lit the candles as the instructions had dictated. They joined hands, said the incantation, and proceeded to all lay hands on the small bit of glass that would guide them to the letters and phrases that were spread out on the board and that the spirit would use to communicate with them. They asked the room if anyone was present from the spirit world, and it was not until a good few minutes later that they all felt a gentle tug on the glass that led them to the block on the board marked Yes. They looked at each other in excited disbelief and went on to ask their spirit friend a number of other questions. Little did they know they had invited something that was interested in more than playing a game with a few young adults. "'What do we do now?' Marco screamed at Jeff, who now sat on the floor cradling his disfigured fingers. Jeff was no help, and James continued laughing, although the pitch and tone of it changed drastically. It sounded as though he was laughing in a cave and it was echoing all around him. Marco looked around the cabin room for some sort of guidance. It was a very minimalistic room, a single table in the center of the room, board games still atop. Their sleeping bags littered the corner of the room. The section that contained the kitchen, messy as a toddler's room, littered with empty beer cans and alcohol bottles. The wind blew gently outside, gently rocking the door on its hinges. Marco, being the only one of sane mind, entered the kitchen. He tried his cell phone again, but due to their location being in the woods, he could not make any calls. He considered getting James and Jeff into the car, but instantly thought of when the drama had started and James had been spitting and babbling like a crazy person, while all the while clawing at his own skin. He thought of how he felt when the spirit they had been talking to informed them they would all perish together, and that it would make one of them its own. James had apparently been the chosen one. Getting him to the car was now out of the question. They had to deal with the situation here. His thoughts were interrupted by the desperate shouts of Jeff, and upon turning back to them, saw James had broken the restraints of one hand and had wrapped his hand around the neck of the fragile-looking Jeff. He thought quickly, opened the kitchen drawer, and drew a knife. He knew not what he was doing, but ran to the bed and began stabbing. The knife penetrated James' chest over and over, each time opening a wound from which blood and a foul stench poured forth. He stabbed and stabbed until his arms gave up on him, and he could stab no more. He collapsed onto the floor, turning his neck to see Jeff cowering in the far corner of the room, dismembered fingers left lying forgotten on the floor. The smell became too much and Marco began retching. The vomit projected from his mouth covering the floor, creating a disgusting mess of blood and vomit. He vomited until he was throwing up bile, the knife he had used lying covered in blood at the edge of the bed, untouched by the vomit at least. The cloth they had used as restraints hung from the bedpost. Marco rose to his feet and walked tentatively to the bed. Eyes open and chest gaping with knife wounds, the smiling face of James still seemed animated. Looking at the body, Marco felt nothing. What lay dead before him was no longer the man he had known since he was a child. What lay before him was something else. Gathering himself, Marco walked out to the shed and proceeded to dig a hole right behind the cabin. He dug and dug, oblivious to the rain that had begun to fall to the earth, cleaning the earth and washing away all that is wrong in the world. He finished the hole and went back into the cabin. He dragged the body of it off the bed, through the vomit and blood mixture and out of the cabin. The wounds poured blood onto the floor trailing it all the way out. The rain did its job and washed every speck of it away with the dirt. 
He dropped the body into the hole and covered it with dirt. Walking back into the cabin, he put Jeff's arm around him and hoisted him up. They left the cabin without collecting any of their belongings. Marco loaded Jeff into the passenger seat of the car and got into the driver's seat. Without even a look back, he drove like the devil was behind him. He did not stop until he had reached his house 60 kilometers away. Still wearing clothes, he opened his shower and pulled Jeff in with him to wash the blood and dirt off. The bleeding had stopped, but he would need medical attention. It was late at night now, the rain still pounding away. He would give Jeff some painkillers to knock him out, and would take him to the hospital first thing in the morning. He put Jeff in the guest bedroom, after having sedated and dressed his friend in some of his bedclothes. He, Marco, was still in shock. His mind had not yet comprehended all that had happened, let alone that he had killed his friend. He got into his bed and pulled the covers up to his chin. God, it felt good to be in a comfortable bed. He was exhausted. He had survived an ordeal. His eyes fluttered and he drifted off to sleep. Not long after he fell asleep, he was woken by the same pungent smell that had been let loose when he killed James. He opened his eyes and immediately felt his heart in his throat. James sat on the edge of his bed, blood and mud still covering him. The stab wounds evident in the weak glow of light coming from the conjoined bathroom. The voice that came from James's mouth was not his. It sounded as though at least five people were speaking in unison. Hey, buddy. I'm back. All for one and one for all. Where I go, you go. Them. The pills were supposed to make them go away. Seeing them had driven him to the point of thinking of suicide. They repulsed and scared him. So far, none of them had touched him. As far as he could tell, they were incapable of physical contact with him, but for all he knew, that could soon change. And once they could touch him, what would they do to him? They varied in the way they looked. Mainly two types stalked him throughout his daily life and made each day a living hell. The pills helped at first, but now they were back, and they appeared to have grown in numbers. He had tried prayer, but God seemed unable to help him in this particular predicament he was in. He was alone with the devil's advocates, no God to help him. Rosaries and the holy water he had stolen from the church had no effect on them. Just as they could not touch him, his religious paraphernalia had no impact on them either. He had given up on God a good while ago, and clearly that had come back to bite him in the ass. He was alone with them, he and the others. He had no name for them, they were simply them, or the others. One group of them had wings, looking almost as gargoyles look, and stalked him from the skies as he would walk the streets. He could not see them clearly, but God, they scared him. The shadow they cast as they flew in a swarm covering that of his. He was forever in their shadow. The second bunch of Hell's minions were much more willing to be seen. They stalked him around his house and in the shops and offices he went to. He had quit his job because of them. He was an accountant but could not focus on the numbers when they constantly lurked on all sides of him, distracting, taunting. What did they want? Did they want to take him to their kingdom? Were they sent to just torment him for the wrong he had committed throughout his life? Punishment for his lack of faith? Now he sat in his house, curtains drawn so the flying ones were unable to be seen. He could see the other ones skulking around the room he had decided was the safest, the library. Full of literary works, he did his best to distract himself from the creatures that shared his sanctuary with him, he took the pills often, increasing the dosage ever so steadily to get rid of the sight of them. When he took the little blue pills, they almost evaporated into the air. But once the pills wore out, 
They miraculously appeared in all corners of the room. At first, it scared him. Now he had reached the end of the tether. It had just become part of life. Take the pills, enjoy normality for a while, and then succumb to the guests that very soon reappeared. The funny thing is, it was the pills that had started all of this, and now pills seemed the only way to subdue those demons. He had met the guy in an alley. Cliché as it may sound, that's where he met his dealer. He would walk to the shops and on the way back, pass through the alley behind his house, and pass a wad of cash to the guy and get a bag in return. There was always a cocktail in the bag he received. Oxycontin, Xanax, Vicodin, all painkillers and antidepressants. He liked to feel numb. They distanced him from the cold reality of the world. He hated the world, and the drugs seemed to help. Everywhere he looked, there was nothing worth living for. Turn on the television and nothing but rape, murder, and robbery. What kind of world are we living in? But on his last exchange with this guy, there was a few pills in it he had never seen. He saw them at home, so could not very well call his dealer to ask exactly what new drug he had been given. It should be good, so what the hell. Handful of pills and a bottle of scotch, new pill included, down the hatchet. The bottle of scotch was empty when he awoke, the bottle empty and the room full. Full of them. Boils on face, some type of goo dripping from the lacerations on their twisted and deformed human-looking bodies. Long nails, talon-like almost. Teeth, like he had never seen before. Not only were they sharp, but they were jagged and varied in length. The smell they gave off was putrid, and some of them were missing appendages and flesh. He closed his eyes thinking it was a dream, but upon opening them, they still milled around his room, looking with hungry intent at him. In a drug and alcohol induced haze, he stumbled up and barreled through the door towards the alley in hope of seeing the dealer for answers. He was there, black hoodie pulled up, covering his eyes. He had never actually seen his face. Their transaction was always quick and without much interaction. What the hell is going on? He asked, terrified. Here, this will make it better. Those weren't meant for you, the dealer said as he walked away into the darkness after handing over yet another bag, this one transparent and containing blue pills. He took one immediately, and they disappeared. But that was then. Now the pills weren't helping at all, and he was down to his last few. The encounter with the dealer was months ago, and after quitting his job, he had not left his home since. For some reason, the flying creatures scared him more, as he had a grueling fear they would fly down and snatch him from the ground. The biggest problem was only he could see them. The pills were running out, and he was growing desperate. He had to go back to the dealer. Donning a baggy sweatshirt and shades, though at night, he left his house in a run and headed to the alley. No one there but them. He accepted his fate. He returned home to find his sacred place in shambles. They had destroyed his possessions and clawed and damaged everything in sight. They were now tangible. Upon this realization, he took the last few pills he had and swallowed them dry. The effects would wear off soon. They wouldn't buy him much time. Swallowing them was painful, but sure enough, they disappeared. How much time would the last pills grant him of peace and sanity? His death was in the news. Evidently, they were able to inflict damage on more than just his mere possessions. When the neighbors complained of the smell wafting from his home and the police were summoned, veteran officers could not hold their lunch. The library was covered in blood. Body parts lay spread out in the room, bitten into and partly devoured. His heart had been nibbled on and an eyeball sat atop a book on the mantelpiece. His arm lay bent in the chair. 
All his organs lay strewn out on the floor and coat rack. They had a sense of humor. The police ruled it as a ritualistic cult killing. However, we know different. Old Wounds Opening This is something that happened to me ten years ago. Now, take this as you will, but what you're about to hear is something I can barely explain myself. Nonetheless, it's something I wish to be told, so bear with me. Just some backstory, my name is Ray, and I was, and still am, a freelance photographer. I was in my thirties, and I was living in New York around that time, when I got a call from a Mr. Peters, who said that he was the executor of my father's will. I wanted to hang up right then and there, but this man was just doing his job despite the fact that it was for my father. My father was the darkest part of my life. In fact, my biggest regret was that I waited until I was 18 to finally escape him. Growing up, I only saw him as someone full of anger and liquor who couldn't keep his fists to himself. My mother had left us when I was around six years old, and of course, that made everything much worse. I would go to school, trying my best to hide the cuts and bruises from the night before, and I'd go home for it to happen again. He was as meticulous as he was terrifying. No one would ever know what he did to me, and I was too afraid to do anything about it. As I got older, I became more resilient as he got weaker. Years of cigarettes and alcohol had caught up with him, so he switched to more emotional abuse, saying that it was my fault that my mom had left. I tried my best not to let his words faze me, but it did. It hurt to hear something like that from my own father, and the doubt and depression he had planted into me. I'd rather have him hit me. Despite his abuse, I tried my hardest in my studies, and when I was finally old enough, I went off to college. I took care of everything myself, and I never looked back. My father had passed away, and as previously stated, Mr. Peters was distributing his assets. He didn't have much, but he had left me a cabin that had been in our family for decades. I was quite taken aback. I hadn't talked to him in over twelve years. I absolutely refused to go to his funeral, but hearing that he actually put me in his will, I was surprised he thought of me despite everything that had happened. I thought about it for a moment, but eventually agreed to take it. Worst case scenario, I could sell it, and that would be the last part of him I could get rid of. The cabin was deep in the forests of Pennsylvania. I had packed enough for a week and went about it as a mission. I would go to the cabin to check the state that it was in and decide what to do with it, maybe get a few nature shots while I was at it. If I decided to sell it, great. If by some chance I wanted to keep it, I guess it wouldn't be that bad. It was a few hours drive from where I was at, and on the way over my arms and legs began to ache as I thought about my father. He hadn't been on my mind for so long, but as I drove in silence on that long stretch of empty road, memories of him began to flood in. I wish I could say I was happy when I heard the news of his passing. I wish I could say that I felt absolutely nothing at all. But when I heard that he had finally passed, well... I'd be lying if I said my heart didn't ache a bit. He wasn't always horrible. There were blue moon moments when he was sober and kind, but that doesn't excuse what he had done. I shook the thoughts of him from my mind and continued the next couple hours of the drive. When I finally reached the forest, I followed a worn and winding path towards my father's cabin. The skies were filled with dark gray clouds, making the scenery around me look foreboding. My father used to take me and my mother up here every now and then when he had time off work. He insisted that the fresh air would help my mom, 
and being out in nature would help me man up. It was early in the afternoon when I finally pulled up to the cabin. It was almost exactly as I remembered it, though a bit more weathered and aged. As I got out of my car and walked towards the front porch, an antique rocking chair creaked back and forth, while the chill of the autumn air made me shiver. I had to push a shoulder into the door as I opened it. The old wood door swung open with more force than intended, and I stumbled inside. I was absolutely awestruck as I stood at the entryway, looking around the interior of the old cabin I noticed that it was completely unchanged, as if the last time I was here, time had paused until I returned. The sofa, the decorations, the television, everything was where I remembered it. I walked to the dining table next to the kitchen and brushed my hand over its smooth surface, not a speck of dust. Did my father come up here recently? He was never the type of person who would clean up after himself. His home was filled with empty bottles and cigarette butts. I didn't think anything of it. I was thankful I didn't have much to clean up. I slumped into the old floral sofa. My body sank into the cushions. I thought about what I was doing there. I'm not sure why, but I felt a want, no, a need to come back to this place. This cabin held a lot of memories. It contained history that long surpassed me. My father was so proud to tell us that his great-great-grandfather had built this place with his own two hands. Every head of the house would come and fix it up and whatnot throughout the years. I scoffed as I thought about his damn smirk, the same that's placed on my own face. I closed my eyes. The drive must have taken more out of me than I thought. I tilted my head back and began to drift into short rest. I tried to relax as I took a deep breath of cold, fresh air. I exhaled. Or rather, I tried to exhale. I couldn't let the air out no matter how hard I tried. I felt my throat begin to constrict as if someone was pressing their hands onto them. I tried to move and thrash to try to get up, but my body wouldn't budge. My heart raced as I suffocated, and as suddenly as it came, I shot up from the couch and gasped in oxygen. I placed a hand onto my throat and felt nothing out of the ordinary. Did I just have a nightmare mixed with some kind of sleep paralysis? I glanced at my watch. A few hours had passed since I got here. I sat back onto the couch and wiped some sweat from my brow. That nightmare really shook me to my core. I looked down and saw my hands were trembling. I gripped them tightly to stop the shaking. I rushed towards the bathroom in the hallway and turned on the hot water at the sink. I watched the steam rise from the water and splashed a handful onto my face. I caught my reflection in the mirror and saw that my eyes were pink and I looked at my neck to see deep purple bruises. Five small oval bruises were on my neck, one on my right side and four on my left. I lifted my neck to further inspect them, and sure enough, it looked like fingertips were gripped onto my throat. I turned the faucet off and rushed out of the bathroom. I leaned onto the nearest wall to steady myself as a wave of anxiety fell upon me. Memories of my father flashed into my mind, images of him hitting me and choking me as a child. I took deep breaths while holding my throat, completely afraid of something other than me grasping it. A few minutes had passed until I was fully able to catch my breath. I looked at the bathroom mirror again, and the bruises were still there. Where did they come from? I was sure I was the only one here. Of course I was the only one here. I was going to be here for a few days. I couldn't allow myself to be spooked over... something. I felt sick to my stomach, so I didn't want to eat anything. I walked around through the hallway towards the bedrooms. The cabin was small with only two beds and one bathroom, 
but it was cozy enough. Past the bathroom was the door to the right. I opened it to reveal a small boy's room. There were no decorations, just a twin bed, a dresser, and a desk. A loud thud emanated from the other bedroom, my parents' bedroom. I quickly stepped to it and opened the door to reveal a room with two separate beds and a large dresser. It was as bare as mine. I looked around to find what made the noise, but couldn't find a trace of anything. The room felt so cold, goosebumps began to cover my arms. My breath visible as I exhaled and I saw that a window was wide open. I crept towards the window and placed my hands on it to close it when I noticed something deep within the woods. The figure was peeking from behind a tree. Its neck was completely bent over to an L shape, and it had long, wild hair that hung down. I kept my eyes focused on it and held a scream. It wasn't moving. It just hung its neck in that bent position as its hair swayed in the wind. Were they lost and needed help? Surely they could see me looking out at them. I gathered some courage and called out to them. Hello? Uh, are you lost or something? I yelled. They didn't respond, but before I could ask them anything else, they slowly sank behind the tree. I'd be lying if I said that didn't unsettle me, but I just locked the windows and double-checked all the doors. I just pushed it into a corner of my mind, thinking it was someone being a creep. I was getting tired, the time had flown by, and night fell upon me and the cabin. I slipped into my old childhood bedroom. The sofa and my parents' bedroom were out of the question. I lied on the lumpy twin bed and looked out the window. There was no light whatsoever and it was quiet. I closed my eyes tightly, trying to drift to sleep, but I felt so uncomfortable. That's when I heard something making a clicking sound. I looked towards the direction of my window and I heard it slowly opening. The sound of wood scraping pierced the silence of the night and I jolted up. Who's there? I called out into the darkness, and I heard a low, cracked inhale from beyond the window. Whatever was outside exhaled, and as it did, I could hear something breaking like someone cracking a bundle of twigs. I didn't know what else to do. The only options I had were to run or to fight. So I jumped off the bed and ran towards the front door. I had left the keys on the dining room table so I could do everything in one swift motion. I had ran right out of the room and made a direct shot towards the keys, but they were gone. I got onto my heels for a sudden stop and looked frantically for my keys. I heard something thudding from behind me, and I saw the figure again. I turned to see the figure peering at me, with its bent head from behind the entryway of my bedroom, its hair slumped down, it was close enough that despite being consumed by shadow, I could make out its thin, womanly figure. Its hand slowly came around from the doorway, and it clutched onto the wooden walls of the cabin. Its arms were long and had multiple joints in them that popped as it reached towards me. Its hands had long fingertips that ended with broken pieces of fingernails. I fell backwards onto my ass as the figure's hand swiped at me. I shuffled backwards while keeping my eyes fixed on it. My body began to ache, and I looked at my arms as welts, cuts, and bruises began to form all around them. The welts swelled to burst, blood beginning to pour from them. I gave out a scream as the injuries began to spread from my arms to my torso and to my legs. I felt some bones within me bend and break as I lie crippled on the floor. Flashes of my father's face appeared in my vision, and I began to convulse. Blood flooded the inside of my mouth, and I began to choke. I tried my best to spit out the blood, 
but more and more began to drown me from the inside out. The figure was on the floor now. It used its long arms and fingernails to scratch the wooden floor and creep its way towards me. That was when I finally noticed her face. I could finally see her hair part from her bent neck as it dragged onto the floor. Her face was swollen, bruised, and bloodied. I could see imprints of a hand on her neck, and I could finally see the face of my mother that I hadn't seen in so long. She had one eye that was visible. It was completely bloodshot, but it wasn't staring at me. I slowly tilted my head upwards to see a large and shadowy figure that loomed over me. It had its grip on my neck, and it felt angry and malicious. I pushed through the pain on my body, the pain within me as well, as I thrashed about. I looked towards my mother, and she reached a broken hand towards me. I picked myself up, but slumped onto my knees. The shadowy figure was still over me. I didn't know what else to do, but yell, Leave us alone, you fucking monster! And I heard it fucking laugh. It sounded so inhuman, but at the same time it was familiar. It was my father's laugh. So I knelt there and shouted at it. I let it know how much of a monster it was. I told him how fucked up he was for doing what he did, all while spit and blood splattered from my mouth. I was never really over him, and I could never erase him. But he stood still in front of me, while I stood between him and my mother. I shouted and cried until morning finally came, and when the sunlight crept through the windows, I realized that they were both gone. I finally let everything go, and I crashed into the floor again. I fell unconscious into a deep sleep, and when I awoke, there was still a bit of light creeping through. I picked up the pieces of myself that were left, I was beaten and bloodied, but I had another urge. Something was calling me. I decided to grab my camera and step outside to take some pictures of the scenery. Whenever I take pictures, it always puts me in the present. I'm able to forget about everything and focus on the here and now. I stepped outside and got my digital camera ready. The sound of the leaves crunching underneath me filled me with nostalgia. As a kid, I would rush into the woods and pretend I was an explorer. That's when I remembered something from when I was a kid. I looked around the trees to find a specific one. It was close to the cabin, and I'm sure it was still there. It took a minute to remember where it was from my memory, but I eventually found a tree with Ray sloppily carved into it. I lifted my camera to focus a shot and snapped a photo. I looked at the small screen and almost dropped my camera. Thankfully, it was around my neck. The photo showed the small, thin tree with the carving, and on the sides were gray-blue fingertips gripped onto the wood. I shot my attention to the tree. I even walked around it, but nothing I went to the base of the tree, and with my bare and bloodied hands, I began to dig. It took hours and night came again, but I was in a trance. I didn't want to stop digging. I was sure I'd broken some fingers, but I finally felt something smooth deep within the dirt. I took my phone and flashed the light upon a skull. I uncovered the rest and sobbed deeply. I sobbed because I was right, and my mother didn't leave me. I called the police, and they came with an ambulance. They were shocked to see the state I was in, but I just wanted some medical attention. I didn't return to that cabin for a month, and when I did, I came back with a priest who said he would bless the old place. The cabin had a lot of history, and a dark history but afterwards, it felt a bit lighter. Now to the present day, it's been years later and I have a son of my own. 
One day, I'll take him up to the family cabin and fill it with happiness, giving that dark history a bright future. I saw hell in the hospital hallway. Sorry in advance for the long story. I'll be calling myself Sarah, and I work at a hospital in upstate New York as a nurse. I was originally from Pennsylvania, but just recently moved to the Big Apple for a change of pace and scenery. I love doing my job, because I genuinely love helping people. But some things started happening here recently that has made me rethink my plans of staying here. There are tons of stories at the hospital I work at, there's one story of a man who was admitted one evening because he collapsed at his construction job. When a doctor came to examine him, he told the man that he would have to stay a while to run some tests. Well, time passed, and he had gotten much worse. He could barely breathe, and he was in immense pain. When the results finally came back, they told the man that he had asbestosis a condition that scars the lungs from breathing in asbestos fibers from his work. Unfortunately, that was not uncommon back then. Well, the man didn't take the news very well. He was in pain, and he didn't want to allow the disease to eat away at him any longer. It was later that night when he walked towards his door and looked to see if the hallways were empty. There was an eerie silence around him, and no other signs of life in his vicinity. The man proceeded to get on his knees and place his neck on the doorframe. Using all of his strength, the man proceeded to slam the wooden door onto his neck over and over and over. It was an instant, and the man was in a crazed stupor as he continuously slammed the door onto his neck. Blood splattered everywhere as the sound of flesh tearing and bones breaking filled the hallways. His labored breaths began to gurgle as his throat began to fill with crimson. A short time later, some nurses had found his mess of a body, and their screams carried into the night. Apparently that floor isn't used anymore, and you can still hear the door slam. I've been there and done that. I get it. It's fun to scare the newbies when they arrive, especially the ones on night shift. I'm sure this place has some history, but I doubted the existence of the supernatural wandering the hospital. At first, when they told me about the ghosts, I chuckled and brushed it off. But when my CNO, Chief Nursing Officer insisted for me to be careful my first night, I thought I'd pretend to take it a bit more seriously. I ended up going weeks without experiencing a single thing, aside from the normal crazy of just working in a hospital, especially during COVID. With the massive influx of patients following the pandemic, we had to clean up and open every room that we had, even the previously mentioned unused floor. It was one night I was going through the halls and I had to investigate a noise. It was a weekend during the absolute craziness of the pandemic, and we were all being spread thin. We all had to go to areas where we usually wouldn't go, but it was okay. We were all focused on getting these patients situated. I was taking care of an area that didn't have any COVID patients. This was the floor we recently opened up. We had a patient who I'll call Jack, an older gentleman who was brought in because he had some chest pains. I came into Jack's room one night, and he asked me if I could give him anything to help him sleep. When he first came in a few days ago, he was extremely bright and chipper, despite his condition. But tonight, he was pale and shaking. That concerned me, and I asked him if his chest pains were keeping him up at night. And he just looked at me, with small tears forming in the corners of his eyes. He shuddered as he told me that someone keeps coming into his room at night. This was my first time hearing about anything like this, so I asked if he could tell me more. Jack downcast his eyes, 
as he began to rub his shaking hands together. He told me that late at night, he would hear his door open and slam shut. He would wake up and see a dark figure crawling towards him. Now, I asked if it was another nurse that we had, but Jack was sure it wasn't them. Jack described the figure as a large man with short white hair. His mouth was open, and he said that blood was slowly trickling out of it. He began to shiver a bit as he continued to describe what he saw. Jack continued by telling me that the man was in an old hospital gown, but it was worn with splatters of blood on it. He began to close his eyes as he told me the man's neck was crooked and broken. The flesh on the neck was torn open to reveal shattered bone. I felt sorry for the man. I assumed that he had more issues than just chest pains, so I assured him that I would get something that would help him. I had to make my rounds to check on other patients, but I told him I would check on him again soon. As I closed the door to his room, I could hear him quickly shuffle back onto his bed. I made my way around the hall towards the other patients. They all complained about losing sleep, not from a man visiting them at night, but the sound of a door slamming in the hallway. I talked to some other nurses about it and their faces were in absolute shock. They didn't want to listen to any more and told me I shouldn't be trying to scare them. I didn't know what else to do, but maybe it was just a coincidence. After forcing down a can of Red Bull and a cup of coffee, I looked at my watch. It was around 3 a.m., so I wanted to go and check on the patients. I walked towards the elevator and pressed the button to go up towards the old floor. I forced a laugh as I remembered Jack's account of the man he saw, one of the old stories about the man who killed himself, and a few other tales the other nurses had told me. I didn't want to scare myself, but the description of the figure and the fear I saw in Jack's eyes, that very fear began to slowly sink into me. The elevator doors slowly creaked open, and I was met with a dimly lit hallway. We had to save on power, so late at night we wouldn't have all the lights on. As I walked towards the hall, the lights began to flicker. The fluorescent lamps began to buzz as my footsteps slowly echoed through the hallway. I saw something at the end of the hall from one of the rooms. Jack's room. Someone... Something was peering at me from the bottom of the doorway. Only the top of their head was visible, but I was able to make out a thin tuft of white hair atop a man's head. As the lights flickered, the flashes of light hit their face, and I could see their eyes glow white. I could hear my breath begin to shudder as I stared towards the head, and I could hear another breath. It sounded as if someone was taking short breaths while submerged in water. The quick inhales were low, and I could hear something snap with each labored breath. I jumped as a sudden slam erupted from their direction, and suddenly another, and another, and another. The sound of a door slamming began to echo throughout the hallway, and each time it slammed, I could hear something squish, something snap, Something tear. I wanted to let out a scream, but nothing would come out. Was I having some kind of waking nightmare? Hallucination? Has my mind conjured some sort of phantom from all of those damn stories? Before I was able to let out my own, a yell could be heard down the hall from Jack's room. His cry of terror made my blood run cold as ice. Then another scream and another scream all coming from the other patients' rooms. The sound came rushing towards me, a dark symphony of horrified cries resonating into my skull. My legs shook and I fell onto my knees, trying desperately to mute the sound by covering my ears. My head was ringing, and I felt blood running from my nostrils. Tears began to flood my eyes, and when I screamed I couldn't hear anything at all. I was completely drowned in screams. I looked forward, and I saw the head 
slowly move out of the doorway. When it fully emerged from Jack's room, I could see that it was indeed in an old hospital gown, and it was on the floor, propping itself up on its legs and arms. Each limb was bending in an inhuman way, like the legs of a spider, the way the joints shot up and bent downwards. The figure's head was bent, broken, and it swayed back and forth as its eyes flashed white from the flickering of the lights. Each time its neck swayed, it splattered dark red blood onto the walls. It was looking towards me, with its mouth slack-jawed. Despite being surrounded by screams, I could faintly hear its blood-soaked inhales. It just stared at me, and I began to slowly shuffle backwards towards the elevator doors. That's when it began to step towards me, and each time it got closer, the dimming lights behind it would pop and shatter. It crept towards me, slowly, while the darkness followed behind it. I was sure I was in hell at this point as the screams got louder, the figure creeping closer, and the darkness covering the hallway. It was only a few feet away from me now, its limbs groaned and cracked, as it moved closer and closer. I'll never forget how its white eyes stayed fixed on me as its broken neck swayed back and forth, back and forth, with its jaw hanging down to reveal a small flow of blood. My back was completely on the elevator door, and it was so close to me. It began to scramble over me. Its bent, spider-like arms were on either side of me, and it pushed its face closer to mine. All I could see were its rotten, pale face, and behind it, a dark abyss. I couldn't hear anything anymore. The screams must have deafened me. But I pushed my head into the elevator door and closed my eyes tightly. As it got even closer, I could feel a cold breath brush my cheeks. I suddenly fell backwards and my head fell onto the floor of the elevator. I looked up to see another nurse, May, looking down at me, confused. She saw that I was white as a sheet and quickly got down to examine me. Blood was trickling out of my nose and ears and tears were gushing out of my eyes. I could barely speak. All that came out were cries. I looked towards the hallway and it was dimly lit with all of the doors closed. May rushed me out of there, and I had a doctor go out of his way to look at me. I had to take a week off of work. I was a complete mess, and when I finally recovered, I vowed to not speak of it ever again. Out of sight, out of mind, I never saw that figure again. There's whispers, of course, from the staff, saying that I saw a ghost... I'm just too afraid to admit to what I saw. What scares me the most is that it was just one story. There are many, many more that are echoing through this hospital, and I'm terrified to see the worst of them. Do you love Dolly? I will be changing the names of the people involved with this story, to avoid any further scrutiny. My family has already been through enough. I'm posting here to seek advice, help, anyone who would listen to my story to at least make me feel that I'm not going crazy. My wife and I live in an average single-family home, both bringing in an average salary, living our average lives while raising our beautiful little girl, Alice. We had lived so peacefully up until a few months ago, on the day of my daughter's fifth birthday party. That day, Alice was so excited to be turning five that she woke us up at 5 a.m. She jumped into our bed and screamed, Happy Birthday, at the top of her lungs. I groggily looked at her. Her long, curly brown hair, her cute button nose, and her beautiful brown eyes. She was the spitting image of her mother, Rose who was pretending to snore beside me. Rose cracked an eye open and whispered, Please, five more minutes. 
I rolled my eyes at her but cracked a smile as I lifted Alice up and carried her to the kitchen. So, birthday girl, what do you want for breakfast? I asked. She scrunched her face like she was thinking extremely hard. Hmm. Pancakes, she exclaimed. Blueberries? She gave me the biggest smile and eagerly nodded her head yes. So you're excited for today? Yeah, she said gleefully. Oh, Grandma and Grandpa are coming too, so make sure you give them lots of love. Mm-hmm. Breakfast was easy, but my head throbbed as I thought of all the things we had to do that day. Kids' birthday parties are always like that. Something so simple, like just having people over and opening presents, turns into the most stressful day of a parent's life. Alice insisted that her fifth birthday party should be at five, so until that evening we had to prepare the food, drinks, and decorations. When Rose eventually woke up, we had breakfast and began our day. I spent the majority of the day picking up the balloons, grabbing the birthday cake, getting last-minute decorations, and calling in delivery for pizza. When all was said and done, we finished right before the party started. The last thing I had to do was tie some balloons to the mailbox to make sure people knew which house. Once 5 p.m. crept around, family and friends made their way over. So far, so good. The only thing we needed was the pizza, which came by a little after the party started. As I opened the door to get the food, I noticed a box at my doorstep. It was a pretty decent-sized box, a little bit bigger than a shoebox, wrapped in black paper with a pink bow on top. I grabbed it along with the pizza and put it with the pile of other presents. A few hours later, and the party was going pretty smoothly. No one got hurt, so that was a plus. After passing out the cake, Alice was eager to open her presents. The living room was completely covered with different colored wrapping paper. My mother walked up to Alice and handed her that black and pink box. Don't forget this, she said with a smile. Alice gave her grandmother a tight hug and gratefully took the box from her. Her eyes gleamed with excitement as she thoroughly looked at every corner of the present. She carefully removed the pink bow and slowly unwrapped the black paper, putting on a show for the elderly woman. Inside was a small brown box. Alice shrieked with excitement as she revealed a doll. It was a small doll in a green flannel dress with long, curly red hair. Its eyes were glassy with a piercing pale blue, and its skin was so pale. It was eerily lifelike. She hugged it with all of her might and thanked my mother over and over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, she screamed gleefully. What are you going to call her? my mother asked. Alice pressed the doll's face to her ear and closed her eyes tight. She says her name is Dolly. The rest of the night went by in a blur. Kids ran around, we cleaned up. Alice didn't let go of that doll. It was around 9 p.m. when all of the guests had left. Rose took Alice and her new friend to her bedroom to settle down for the night. I was washing up some dishes when my mother offered to help. Hey, don't worry about it, Mom. I got this, I insisted. Go relax. I know you and Dad have a long drive home. It's nothing. Your father has had plenty of coffee, and we only live an hour away, my mother assured me. <laughs> right. Oh, and thanks for getting Alice the doll. It hasn't left her side all night, I laughed. My mother looked at me with a puzzled look on her face. I didn't get her that doll. Sure, sure, Mom, I winked at her. You know she's been asking for a new doll for a while. She set some dishes onto the drying rack. I'm serious. I have no idea who got her that doll. I thought you did. Rose tiptoed into the kitchen. What's going on? I glanced over to Rose and asked, Hey, did your parents get Alice that doll? I know they couldn't make it tonight, but did they ship anything? Rose took a moment to think about it. Uh, no, 
Their gift came in yesterday, the canvas. I thought long and hard about who could have gotten her the doll, then I remembered. Actually, it was left out in front of the door. I grabbed it a little while after the party started. Well, it'll come to us eventually. She absolutely loves that thing. She made me tuck it in and everything, Rose laughed. My dad popped in, signaling their cue to go, so we walked them to their car and saw them off. We stretched and yawned. It was a long day, so we were so ready to get into bed. I glanced over at the window that went into Alice's room and saw the blinds close shut. She must have wanted to see her grandparents leave before going to sleep. I'll see you in bed, Rose whispered in my ear before she walked into the hallway. I went to lock the front door when I heard a loud scream come from our bedroom. I rushed in to see Rose sitting on the floor at the end of the bed, laughing. I asked her what was going on, and she pointed at the bed. I looked over and saw Dolly lying on our bed. Rose laughed as she explained that when she lifted the blankets, the doll was lying underneath. She looked towards Alice's room and brushed it off as a prank. That brat, Rose chuckled. My wife is such a scaredy cat, so it's not uncommon for me and Alice to try to prank her. We laughed at Alice's little surprise as I picked up the doll and walked to return it to her room. Alice's room was just down the hall. On my way, I felt a bit uneasy as I heard whispering coming from the living room. It was faint, but it was definitely whispering. Alice whispering. I crept around the corner and I saw her sitting in the middle of the living room in the dark. I love Dolly so much. Thank you, she whispered excitedly. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty good trick. Alice whispered while sitting cross-legged in the middle of the floor. She tilted her head. Oh, I don't think they would mind at all. Alice stretched her hands forward as if she was grasping something. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Alice, who are you speaking to, sweetie? I turned the corner and asked. She turned to me and smiled. No one. Alice lifted herself up and ran towards the hand that held Dolly, grabbing her into a tight hug. She looked up at me and asked, Daddy, do you love Dolly? I laughed. Well, of course, sweetie. If you love her, I love her too. Good. Dolly and her friend said they love you too, Daddy, she said. Dolly and her friend? I was going to ask her who her friend was, but she ran off into her bedroom. Who was she talking to? She never had an imaginary friend before. I thought she was getting too old for that. But I didn't think anything of it. She's five, so I doubt she understands proper pronouns and sentence structures. I brushed off her whispering as some kid stuff. The following morning, I woke up earlier than normal. I had had difficulty sleeping that night. Even though I was fully dressed in pajamas and had a blanket over me, it felt like I was freezing last night. I asked my wife about it, but she said she slept soundly. I thought I was coming down with something, so I checked my temperature just in case, but everything was normal. It was a Sunday, so my wife and I were free. We had asked Alice what she wanted to do that day, but she simply told us she was busy playing with her new friends. When Rose asked who she was talking about, she simply answered, Dolly and her friends, then rushed to the backyard with the doll tightly in her grip. Friends? I thought to myself. Was she conjuring more imaginary friends? I brought it up with Rose, but she shuddered at the thought. Don't tell me that. The doll is creepy enough as it is. I don't need imaginary friends to add fuel to the fire. Don't be such a baby, I teased. You didn't have an imaginary friend growing up? My loving wife ignored me and continued to scroll through her phone. I looked out the window to the backyard and saw Alice standing with her hands covering her eyes and yelling out, One! I looked around the backyard. 
I assumed she was playing hide-and-seek. Two. I wondered how many friends were hiding. Three. Maybe I should sneak back there and hide, too. Four. I saw Dolly sitting against a tree we had. Five. Dolly wasn't by herself. Six. There was something behind the tree where the doll was. It was tall and naked. Seven. Alice began to giggle. It peeked out from behind the tree, a long, slender shape with gray, bruised skin. Eight. She laughed. I can hear you. Where its eyes were supposed to be, there were two dark voids that poured a black ooze. Nine. It looked towards Alice and smiled a disgusting, toothless smile. Blood began to pour out its gums and it began to walk towards her. It didn't move right. It moved like something imitating a person walking. It was exaggerated and clumsy. Ten... Alice! I shouted as I rushed into the backyard. She jumped in shock and removed her hands from her eyes. She began to tear up as if she was in trouble, and I scooped her into my arms. I looked towards the tree where that thing was, and just saw that doll sitting there. Rose rushed out and asked what was going on, but I didn't know either. Alice sobbed in my arms, and her mother quickly grabbed her away from me and brought her into the house. Daddy didn't mean to scare you, I heard her say as she walked away. I looked over at the tree, and there was really nothing there. I picked up Dolly, and I stared at her. I brushed some grass that got onto her face, and I felt sick. The skin felt so real. The next few days went, and we kept having these small incidents. It started off with small things being misplaced. Sure, I'd lose my keys, but one day they ended up in the coffee pot. I yelled at Alice, but she said it wasn't her. Rose began to feel really uncomfortable around the house, too. She insisted that we all leave the house together. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me that the other day she had heard something whispering from Alice's closet. I can't help it, but I was always skeptical about paranormal things. I even brushed off the hide-and-seek thing as seeing things from lack of sleep. But when my wife told me she started hearing things, I didn't think she was crazy, so I looked around her closet. Rose and Alice went out one afternoon to grab some dinner, and I was inside Alice's room, just staring at her closet. Alice's closet was really small. If I were to stand in there, no one else would be able to get inside. I thought I was going crazy when I heard not one, not two, but a cacophony of whispers coming from behind that door. Whispers of different tones, some old and some young, women, men, fucking animals. So many different vocal tones were just whispering away. That moment was when I realized that, yeah, there was something wrong. There is something here that cannot be explained away with science. I stood there, right outside, and I was fucking terrified. Eventually, the whispers started to speak in unison. They started to say my name. John. 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 My hands trembled as I reached towards the door handle, and I opened it. Silence, pure silence, and the closet was empty. Well, it was filled with Alice's clothes, but sitting there, on the floor, was that damn doll. I was irrational, maybe hysterical, so I grabbed the doll and threw it right into the trash bin outside. I covered it in more trash, Hell, I just started throwing things away just to bury it. When I finished the deed, Alice and Rose returned home with the food. 
I was so relieved to see them. When we got back into the house, the space felt so much lighter. After dinner, Alice ran into her room to play. I told Rose what had happened, and she grabbed my hand. She was so thankful. Mommy, do we have any more blankets? Alice shouted from her room. We were confused. Rose responded, Maybe? Why? Dolly brought some more of her friends, and they want to stay in my room, she laughed. I dashed into her room, and sure enough, in her hands was Dolly. Uh, Dolly seems to have a lot of friends, I said nervously. She giggled. Dolly has tons and tons of friends. Her best friend wants to make sure she has all the friends in the world. What do you mean? I asked. Her best friend. He makes sure that we all love Dolly with all of our hearts. If not, something bad will happen. She turned her head to me slowly. Do you love Dolly? Uh, <laughs> of course I do, silly girl, I said. My voice was shaking. Weeks had gone by, and things just got worse. I even called a priest, but they didn't want to even step foot into our home. Some help. Alice seemed to be absolutely fine. She didn't notice anything wrong. But us, Rose and I, we started to hear them, see them, feel them. Dolly's friends. One night, we both woke up looking at each other. It was absolutely freezing that night. We couldn't move an inch, but we were able to look at each other. There was something rustling underneath our blanket between us, and it was breathing heavily. It sounded wet and garbled as it breathed in and out. It started to creep its way towards our faces, and we saw a disfigured gray face of a child. It looked at Rose and then at me. It emerged from the blanket and it began to climb onto our headboard. A long, dried umbilical cord slithered past our faces. All we could do was just stare at each other. I tried to look over at it from the corner of my eye, and my heart, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Hanging from the ceiling were dozens and dozens of disfigured children. All of them peered down onto us with dark eyeless sockets. Another figure was moving underneath our blanket between us. It felt cold as its body brushed against me and its head peeked out of the blanket. Dolly. We closed our eyes. We shut them tight with all of our strength as we were surrounded by whispers. John. They whispered to us all night until we heard Alice ask, Do you love Dolly? So we lay there in silence, nodding our heads yes in agreement. We feel like we are running out of options. I've tried burning the thing, throwing it out of a moving car, breaking it, cutting it, fucking burying it. But, but, it always comes back. And every fucking time she comes back, she brings more and more friends.